Good afternoon, everybody, or should I say good morning, because we are still before noon. <laughs> we were on track at 8 o'clock this morning here at Watkins Glen International. The pit walk very well attended uh, in the pit lane right opposite our Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Thanks if you've been listening in to our Michelin Countdown to Green. We'll recap the Porsche keys to the race for you in a little while. It's John Hindorf and Jeremy Shaw with you for the next six hours and a bit. Michelin Porsche race tech to wrap things up at the end of the day it's joe bradley and shay adam working the pit lane for us in fantastic weather now if you were sunbathing and having drinks with little umbrellas in them it is 26 in the air 34 celsius on the track or if you prefer 79 fahrenheit and 93 on the track we have got a brilliant lineup of cars and drivers for the seal and six hours of watkins glen the first time that we've had all five of the imsa weathertech sports car championship classes together for quite some time and the challenge today well the age-old challenge is the clock itself and six hours uh, is there and the circuit well what a challenge that is too back in the late 40s and 1950s when road racing was still the major part of uh, motorsport around the world the roads around here were used for four years but it was soon realized here and across europe too that that was far too dangerous and in 1955 carved out of this beautiful green area in upstate state new york 11 corners, 3.4 miles. We're on the Grand Prix track at the moment. Action areas at turn one into the inner loop, over the brow into turn eight, a passing position as well. And it has, well, down through that last, well, more than 60 years, has provided a challenge for some of the best cars, drivers and riders of any in the world. Subject to some uh, upgrades and repaving a few years ago, that's really smoothed it off. Some drivers will tell you they like the old surface because it had some nuances, particularly when it was wet and there was bumps that you had to avoid. But undoubtedly what has happened is the speeds have gone up, the lap times have come down and the commitment required from all of these drivers, whether they're in GTD, GTD Pro, LMP3, 2 or the top class DPIs is extraordinary. And six hours in this heat, Jeremy Shaw, is going to be a challenge We've used that word many times, but it is going to be a challenge for everyone concerned. Yeah, immense. Uh, yeah, not so much as it, not so bad as it used to be, because as Conor Di Filippo was saying, most of these cars are, have air conditioning systems now, which they never used to have in the old days. But there's a lot more paraphernalia in there as well. The cockpits are even hotter than they used to be as well. So yeah, it's a workout, but mentally it's taxing as well, particularly as we've just been talking about with the traffic here. You've got to be on your toes the entire time. Interesting that some teams choose to go with two drivers in this race, some with three. That's in the pro classes only. In the pro-am classes, which is LMP2, LMP3 and GTD, you don't have a choice. You have to have three drivers during this race. Shea Adam is on the pit lane. First of good news, Shea, everybody has left you. Everybody made it off. We thought there would be maybe one car down after last night's incident, but no, both teams managing to rebuild. That would be the Gradient Racing Acura and the Hardpoint Porsche. So every single car rolling off on the grid, which means we have four 48 race cars out on the track, split start. A lot of people are happy about that. A lot of race fans are happy mostly because they get to watch two separate starts for today's race. And speaking of starting today's race, 53 rookies in the field as far as they have never taken the green flag of this six hour race. Well, they're about to lose that title. And we've got a rookie of our own in terms of Watkins Glen, a lifetime ambition fulfilled for Joe Bradley, who's at WGI for the first time, and it's lived up and exceeded expectations, Joe. It absolutely has. It's lived up to everything I expected. It's uh, the only word that I can describe for Watkins Glen International is majestic. It's it's got such a rich history. It's a circuit that is on a bucket list. I've ticked it off my bucket list for sure. Sirius 207 around the world on RS2 IMSA Radio via IMSAradio.com. If you're outside the US in a territory that doesn't have network TV, hit the live video button and we've got sound and vision together. Coming to the line, it'll be Tom Blomqvist for Bayer Shank Racing in the number 60 pink Acura with the blue and black Acura of Connick Minolk and Philippe Albuquerque alongside him. 60 and 10 on the front row from the two Chip Ganassi Cadillacs, 01 and 02, Bordet and Earl Bamba behind them. 
them, Oli Plant, Tristan Fortier, Ben Keating's on P2, Paul, Nico Vanoni, Fast MD on LMP3, Paul, and that is the first group of cars that comes to the green flag, which is in the air. Six hours on the clock starts right now. And immediately, Matt Shank Racing controls the first corner to the right-hand side. Tom Blomfist up the climbing S's, tracked by Philippe Albuquerque. I do wonder if the two Acura teams had discussed that because there wasn't too much of a battle. Oh, I see that, and Albuquerque comes straight out the right-hand side. No quarter Rasta given earlier on this side by side, going in the breaking area for the infield loop, and through goes Albuquerque. I wonder if that was the extra chocolate croissant that he had this morning. I was next to him in the queue, and he said, I need some long, uh, long delivery carbs for energy today. Tried one of the chocolate croissants, really enjoyed it, immediately snagged another one. And he's gone straight into the lead. Here comes the GT field, headed up by the GT pros, of course. BMW, Conor de Philippe with Ross Gunn, Harper Racing, Aston Martin alongside him. Then the GT arms, the GTDs themselves. David Regon, Ben Barnicut, Mathieu Jaminet, Jordan Taylor, Cooper McNeil at the front of the field. Then the full GT D cars, which is Stephen McAleer, first pole positioned for Team Courtoff and Stephen in the Mercedes. Richard Highstand, Robbie Forley, Russell Ward for Winwood Racing, and that's a good clean start from them as well. I do like this split start, Jeremy. That uh, ensures that we get to see both starts and no one's tripping over each other early. And should there be a problem at the front of the field, it doesn't delay the GTDs or get them involved. GTD Pro is the works cars with full pro lineups for the most part. The GT Daytonas, you are not allowed to have a platinum driver in there. Corvette picking their way through at the moment. That's Jordan Taylor who's starting that car side by side with the number 39. That is the Lamborghini. Uh, that of the car bomb with Peregrine, Robert McGuinness, and into the pit lane early for one of the LMP3s. That's the Andretti Autosport car, and that looks to be a drive-through penalty. Well, that hasn't come up on my race control channel, so not sure. That may have been assessed for something Changed their starting tyres after qualifying. Just come up on the screen now and share Adam reports it in my ear. Faf with the driveway Porsche, the plaid Porsche going down the inside of the Ferrari into turn number 11. This is the battle in the GT category. And Faf down from Canada doing their usual great job. Mathieu Jaminet being named as one of the Porsche 963 GTP drivers for next year for Penske, for Team Penske Porsche. Um, picking his way through. He got uh, right up the inside, and there was a little touch, in fact, on the Risi Competizione Ferrari. Great to see the 62 car park, David Rigon, starting that car. But a little hip and shoulder from Mathieu Jaminet. Jam Jam to his friends. That's the nickname that his teammates gave him, actually, in the Porsche squad. Through the outer loop for the leading GT cars. And it is still the BMW at the head of the field. Meantime, at the front of the pack, Philippe Albuquerque has set sail. And he is eight tenths of a second to the good and leads for Koninka Minolta Acura in the DPI. Second place, Paul Sitter, Tom Blomqvist. Porsche keys the race, Jeremy. The tyres will take a beating here. Relatively cool on the track at the moment at only 97 Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius. We had it up to 50 Celsius and 120 plus on the Fahrenheit scale. But these early laps, so important for the drivers who are on the actual tyres on which they qualified. Key point. Exactly true, and uh, in lap three, we're already in traffic here for the leaders. Uh, that was, it was rather more of a gap between the, uh, the the split start than I would have anticipated there. But uh, uh, you know, it, it was nice and clean. They're all the cars are all settled down now, but and we're going to be battling all the way through. That was a great opportunity this passed by uh, Philip Albuquerque on that fast lap. I mean, just shows I think the importance of track position here. So far as Albuquerque and that Colin Kamenolt team is concerned, they wanted to get out front early on, had to push the envelope a, a bit to do so.
that's what they did. LMP2, same thing. Uh, Stephen Thomas having lost out by thousands of a second to his, uh, co his compatriot uh, number 52 in qualifying, uh, Ben Keating. Stephen Thomas has taken the lead in LMP2. And just a, a quick note about traffic on the traffic here. The, the first flying lap, uh, which was just about clean for Albuquerque, was a 132.9. That's the fastest lap of the race. This next time around was a 135.5, so two and a half seconds slower because he's already negotiating that GTD traffic. Yeah, everybody will have to pick their way through it, of course. Tom Blancfist around the outside of the GTDs. Sir feet of power and grip over the GTD cars, and he's able to pick his line through. It's a bit like a video game at the moment, where you set a target of how many cars you've got to pass in two laps of the track. 3.4 miles, 11 corners. Classic, classic road racing here at Watkins Glen International. Just coming down to six minutes of the six hours completed. And in the classes, it's still Stephen McAleer who leads for AMG. And for Gilbert Kortov, then Robbie Forley from the number 96 Turner Motorsport team. They are basking in the glory of yesterday. In LMP2, it is Stephen Thomas for Oregon. Ben Keating has lost the lead that he had from the ball position. Stephen Thomas, the last person to beat Ben Keating to a pull. And it was here just on a year ago for this race. Remember last year we had a sprint race afterwards. Ben Keating was on pole for that, and he's never not been on pole since this time last year. An exceptional run of eight pole positions for Ben Keating. Surely one of the best bronze, bronze drivers in the business at the moment, Jeremy. Yeah, but uh, he, he was, uh, as he acknowledged this morning, uh, Stephen Thomas get, did a better lap than him on the next lap in qualifying, but unfortunately was held up by a, a DPI car that was uh, coming into the pits, which is really unfortunate for him. But uh, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting pass there. Kobayashi making up two positions on that lap. He kind of a 48, got past both Tristan Voce and Olivier Pla. So number 31 car that won here last year in the uh, sprint race at Watkins Glen, back to seventh position in DPI in the early stages. Nico Veron holds on to the lead in LMP3. He was the Paul sitter there ahead of Josh Sharshier for MLT Motorsports. He's been having a great weekend, so that's 40 from 30 from, uh, sorry, uh, 40 from 58 from 30. Dan Goldberg for performance tech is in third position, but there's nothing really to call between that lot as you might expect at the front of the field Philippe Albuquerque with clear track ahead of him for the moment and it was the pass going out of the uphill S's for the first time Blomqvist defending to the middle of the track down the back straight really making it very difficult but the run that Albuquerque had coming up the S's was just not going to be denied he was already alongside halfway down the back straight squeezes ahead and even though he was on the outside of the right-handed part of the inner loop the bus stop chicane he went through slightly later braking from the blue and black car started in second and halfway around the first lap well actually about a third of the way around the first First lap, he's already in the lead, and he's pulled away now by about eight tenths of a second. In GTD Pro, welcome back to Reese. We've mentioned them, but at the front of the field, the single car entry from RLL BMW M team. Half the squad over at Dallara in Italy. They're building the new GTP car, which we'll see later on in the year and racing next year. And they're going to lose the lead here because that was a great run by Harter Racing. No, fabulous late braking by Connor de Filippi has kept him in the lead. The Aston Martin of Ross Gunn and Heart of Racing look to have got that move done and dusted, but hasn't managed to turn that into the lead of the race. Traffic coming through now with the LMP2 runners lapping the GTD pros. Out of turn six, through the laces of the boot, effectively, to the toe of the boot now. The uphill right-hander, so easy to get on the throttle too early and spin the back wheels. Can't be doing that at this stage of the game. Our Porsche keys to the race. Remember, there are interim points for Michelin Endurance Challenge at three hours. That is still 
two hours and 50 minutes away, but that may be some tricky strategy that we'll have to keep an eye on. Track limits have been pretty staunchly policed this weekend. There'll be a little more latitude in the race than we had in practice and qualifying, but when race control run out of patience, there may be some drive-through penalties. Keep an eye on that. And the weather, the heat in the early part of the race with a potential of some weather blowing in that could include rain later on this afternoon and if we have the kind of rain that we had early on in the week then that is going to be a factor everyone with the radar turned on on the pit stalls at the moment and then the tires it was over 125 degrees on the track yesterday 53 celsius and that is at the very extreme for any racing tyre. Tony Menard telling us in the Michelin countdown to green that the extreme heat and drivers driving off the track and coming back on was causing problems. The outsides of the kerbs, very sharp here. And the inside shoulders of the tyres, vulnerable when you come back onto the track. And after all of that, the other Porsche key to the race that you have to remember is traffic. There'll be traffic for everyone. Passing and being passed is a skill that must be learned, and you've got to keep your concentration. Just a few moments ago, at turn one, side by side, and exactly what we were talking about, the number 21 EF Corsa Ferrari, the red car with the trickle or eight getting a little bit of a hip and shoulder from one of the GT, excuse me, LMP3 cars. Both of them have come out of that unscathed. At the front of the field, Philippe Albuquerque just holding on to that eight tenths or so lead from Tom Blomqvist, about the same, back to Sebastian Bordet for Cadillac. So the two Cadillacs, Jeremy, have switched over. Bordet now ahead of Earl Bamba. Uh, yeah, he started ahead of Bemba. Uh, the um, uh, Bordet just actually set the fastest lap of the race. Uh, 31, first into the 31, 31 9 that time for Bordet. Uh, that time for the uh, leader was a 32.8. Uh, so, new fastest lap there for the Cadillac. And uh, you know, things have settled down now. And Bordet just edged away a little bit from Bamba on that last lap. In GTD, no real changes down there. It's in the pro class, it's still Conor Di Filippi ahead of Ross Gunn, but really under pressure. Uh, and that, uh, that Aston Martin we saw had a really good run here, of course, last season, don't forget. And Stephen McAleer holding right with those two in third place, leading the GTD category. This is kind of a home race now for Stephen McAleer. Of course, he's based uh, at uh, not too far away from Watkins Glen here. Uh, uh, made his home, here, his home here for many years. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, up high, looking down on the front straight. Good crowd in the grandstand, enjoying the temperate weather at the moment. How much hotter will it get? That's one of the questions. Good to have your company. If you are here at the track or further afield, remember if you're outside the US or your territory doesn't have a network TV deal, we've got the world TV field for you. IMSAradio.com and hit the live video tab at the top left hand side of the page. Listen live on the top right hand of the page, goes everywhere. And if you're in North America, it's serious. 207 for you and hello to our safety teams who I know are tuned in around the circuit with the best possible wishes I hope we don't see you today and you have a nice easy afternoon sitting in your EMR IMSA safety vehicles with the air conditioning on listening to the race unfold thanks for all your work ladies and gents indeed all of our volunteer workers giving up their most precious time to make sure we can go motor racing, whether they're on the flag stands, track services, just uh, pointing us to the right car park. We've uh, already made a firm friend of Linda on the front gate, as she's always been on in the early mornings when we've been coming in with the IMSA radio team, and nice to have a little chat with one of the Watkins Glen's regular volunteers. Thank you for your help, Linda, and for all your colleagues as well this weekend. Quarter of an hour gone. Let's take a VP Racing Fuel in race update. Philippe Albuquerque leading by just on nine tenths of a second. The two Acuras, 10 from 60. Tom Blomqvist in second for Meyer Shank Racing. 
Then the two Cadillac racing Chip Ganassi cars. 0-1 Bordet from Earl Bamba in the 0-2. There's about 2.6 seconds between those two. Stephen Thomas got ahead of Ben Keating earlier on. That's the two PR1 Matheson Motorsports Oricas. 11 from 52 by about three seconds. Dennis Anderson has dropped 20 seconds further back. And into the pits, Ben Keating just before a full course yellow. And that is because we have the number one uh, the uh, turn one incident and according to the race control he was in by one second and it's car seven that is off the circuit Anthony Mantella for 47 motorsports damage to the left front of that car he was sixth the doors open Anthony I think he's all right so coming down into turn one looks like there may have been Oh, no, he's just lost it on his own. Ah, no, he didn't lose it. Somebody lost it in front of him. That was the number... 74. 74, the Riley car. Now, was there a clip then on the second-place car? It was very, very close if they didn't. And it also looks as though the Riley car, the number 74, actually got away with it. That was the catalyst because it was spinning in avoidance, I think, Jeremy, for Anthony Mandela. As he came through, yeah, he just <laughs> got over the curve. How close was Tom Blomqvist to getting caught up in someone else's accident? I mean, I was impressed by his pole lap yesterday for Tom Blomqvist getting that pole position. I think I'm even more impressed by this because uh, he, yeah, I don't think there was any contact. Man, that was a heck of an avoidance by Tom Blomqvist. Uh, Mantella had the leader going by him as he went in there. And I think that, as well as the spinning car ahead, may have just taken his attention a little bit. Well, amazingly enough, it may just be bodywork damage uh, on that car. It looks a bit like a dirt track racer without the front left wheel arch, the fender on it, as it's heading up. It hasn't even punctured the tire. So the clip on the barrier has taken off only part of the front bodywork. And Anthony Mantella is moving again. I don't think he's even dropped a lap. And he is already moving in that car. He'll come back. Joe Bradley watched the pit stop for Ben Keating. Did he go straight through or did he get take service, Joe? He took some fuel. Yeah. Just fuel. Really, really going to be... That's going to come and pay him some advantage later. Well, he's not one for just doing the time that he needs to, Ben Keating. Very accomplished bronze driver. And he was in just before the full course yellow was called by race control. So a very good call by his team. We'll make sure that uh, that is a clean entry but on the race control channel full course yellow was called at 55 minutes and 10 seconds past the hour and ben keating entered the pit lane at 55 minutes and nine which means he would have been committed before that and there is a bit of leeway given because of course if you're already in the commit area race control don't want you popping back out again onto essentially a live racetrack as the track goes yellow so, just over 18 minutes gone. Jeremy Shaw. I mean, what's amazing about that is uh, he, he was far enough, far enough ahead of the next uh, cars that he was to make that pit stop and lose only one position. Twen they were 20 seconds. The first two yeah. were 20 seconds That's ahead right, they were, yeah. uh, of Eight, Dennis Anderson. 18.9 on the previous lap was the gap from, uh, from Keating to, to Anderson. Uh, and it, it's about 25 seconds here to do to come down the pits and... And, uh, and then rejoin, and, and, uh, and, the, and the third place, the, the next car after Dennis Anderson, he was another six seconds behind him. That was uh, number eight car, John Ferrano, and he's able to make that pit stop and get out ahead of Ferrano. That was a brilliant call there uh, by, the, by the team. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Orgel's uh, group there to bring uh, Ben in, and Ben was obviously on the case here, because unfortunately for Stephen Thomas, he was already committed, he'd already gone past the uh, start-finish line by the time that uh, caution had been called. 
The 7 is in for 47 Motorsports. They are doing emergency service to this car. The left front A-arm is broken off. It's actually sheared off, so that is going to be a bit more work. There's no steering input whatsoever from the left-hand side of this car. They have a new nose ready to go on. Prepared to do that as emergency service only, but now they've realized that there's a bit more extensive work that does need to go on to this car. They're going to have to take the existing left front wheel off, and it will be here for more than just a new nose. Thank you, Shea. Uh, explain emergency service, Jeremy Shaw, because effectively he's, he has, uh, he's entered a closed pit there, hasn't he? Yeah, sorry, who, who was that? I, I the, was... the 47 car has effectively entered a closed pit, but it's emergency service. Uh, and what, what, and what, explain the concept of emergency, emergency service. Emergency service, yeah. Uh, so if, if you need to come in for, for a reason, if you've got a flat tire or you're running out of fuel, you can come in, but that wouldn't, you wouldn't have been running out of fuel. Did it have a puncture? No, no that was, it was the, the bodywork damage that they're doing. Okay, fine. Uh, so, yeah, if, if, you, if you need to come into the pits, you can, uh, but you, you, you have to come in again after the caution period is, is, has ended and drove, serve a drive-through penalty. Uh, so emergency service, that's what it is. If, you, if the pits are closed for whatever reason and you have to come in, you can, but do, you have to serve a drive-through penalty afterward. It's a broken steering and rack if, for the number can, seven. When you do come in, all you can do is just whatever it takes to get the car back on the track. You can't fully refuel the car. You can only put uh, just a few, a few, uh, few liters in, uh, and or change a tire, and or pull the bodywork off a wheel or whatever it is. But you can't do any major service. And like I say, you have to come in again and serve a drive through penalty after. It is indeed a broken steering rack for the 47 Motorsports number 7 LMP3 machine. It is being pushed back behind the wall. Four mechanics are allowed to push the car back. One is dedicated entirely to trying to shove the left front wheel into the right direction so that it will be able to make the hard right turn back to the garage. Thank you, Shit. Uh, hello to Rory Digital. Uh, nice to know that you're tuned into us to Jesse Young tuning into the first IMSA race in a while since Sebring. Uh, also to Gareth Evans, who's in the workshop tonight. Uh, he's getting ready to do his 112th Mazda 787B. Uh, that I can't wait to see that. Gareth does very good models. I can't wait to see it and hear that car next weekend at Le Mans Classic. Uh, we'll have some uh, coverage of that for you. Busy weekend indeed as well with more IMSA action from CTMP with Edomitsu Mazda from uh, Road America. So we'll be splitting our resources across the weekend, next weekend. Hopefully bringing you up to date with everything there. Hello to Dave Olcock as well, who's tuned in. Uh, and for, for new fans here also that are not familiar with the regulations here, we see you, you might see a few uh, cars overtaking the safety car and then pulling away from the, the pack of cars. Those are cars that have been picked up by the uh, safety car are and are between the safety car and the class leader. So they have not been lapped by the... the the leader of the class in which they are running, they are enabled to, to go past the safety car, run around to, back, to the back of the pack, and just pick up the positions which they were in any case, so as not to be inconvenienced by the timing of the safety car. So there were three LMP3 uh, cars that have just done that, number six, number 33, and number 36, so they'll be able to run around to the back of the pack. Everybody else who's behind them, uh, has, uh, all, which is all the GTD cars, pros and non-pros, they'd already been lapped in any case by the race leaders, so they will uh, take up position behind them, and there's no, there were no other cars that weren't on the lead lap in GTD or GT Pro, GTD Pro, so it's just those uh, three LMP3 cars. At IMSA Radio, if you would like to get in touch with us, uh, pits are open, uh, and... No, have the pits open because well, we're it was about the... 15 minutes when the the caution yes. came out. If, if it was well, they're doing the class splits. So I'm not sure the pits have opened yet. Shit, Adam, you might be able to see. I, I can't see from where I am. The pits open or closed. That's because the lights are on the inside of the Correct. wall at this race, so you wouldn't be able to see them uh, still flashing away. But yes, they are still on, so pits are still closed. And I've only seen one team up on the wall, down on my end of the pit lane, ready to receive a car for service. That's the LMP3 leader, the number 40, Fast MD. Everybody else is still sitting pretty leisurely. Okay, Shea, thank you. And what a job by that team uh, in, in qualifying. The, the young Argentinian... Uh, uh, Nico Veroni 
uh, did a fabulous job. He's, uh, he, he's a youngster, originally from Argentina, makes his home now in, in Barcelona, in Spain. He's racing in the... Uh, in Europe, he actually won the opening round of the L he's doing the ELMS. He won the opening mm. round with uh, Memo Gidley, uh, who's back into the race this season in the GTE Am category, and uh, he uh, is j just a delightful young guy. And he he is loving his first opportunity to come over here and race in North America in the IMSA Weather Sports Car Championship. And he's certainly seriously considering coming back here and doing some more. But uh, a really uh, interesting young man. He's just 21 years of age. Uh, he seems a, he's a lot more mature than that. He, well, 21 year olds these age are pretty mature, aren't they? Uh, in general, if they're, particularly if they're Probably involved in motor racing. racing. since they were eight. Well, exactly right. But uh, really, really interesting young guy. And uh, he, he's loving this opportunity to join this Fast MD team, which is not a full-time team, just doing uh, the the Michelin Endurance Cup this season. Uh, it's a very ambitious team, however, and they want to be running two cars for next season. And it showed already uh, yesterday, this weekend how competitive they can be, qualifying on the pole position, running up front and pulling away in the early stages of this race. Nico had pulled out seven or eight seconds over the rest of the field before this full course caution. So really nice job from that fast MD team. So given that they've split... Uh, done the, the GS, but the uh, DPI split and brought all the DPIs back to the front of the field. I'm not sure we're going to see the pits open this time around. I think we're going back to green. So it might have been close enough to the 15 minutes that race control uh, decided that effectively it is what's termed a short yellow, which I always incorrectly call a quickie yellow, but that is the same idea. So they'll bring the faster cars back to the front of the field, but because it was within 15 minutes of the last green flag, and this will occur again during the, during the race if it happens again, at the discretion of race control, they can call a short yellow. Uh, and in that case, their pits do not open. So let's see what happens this time around to the lights on the safety car, which I notice has uh, morphed from earlier uh, in the weekend from a Corvette C8 to a very bright blue Cadillac. Let's see as they come through, they're in the tour of the boot right now, and if the lights are going to go out, they should go off uh, between eight and nine. And the lights are off between seven and eight. So, yeah, we're going back to green. That uh, Cadillac then pacing the field. And behind it, a uh, blue and black Cadillac. Almost, uh, a blue and black Acura. Almost exactly the same blue on the Conington Minolta car. Five and a half hours still to go. And fraught, full speed, fast and furious action in the first 27 minutes. So now the field effectively under the control of Philippe Albuquerque. Took a while for Philippe to take up the cudgels on social media. But when it was suggested to him that uh, his Twitter handle should be Albuquerque, he was on there <laughs> like a flash. And that's how you can follow Philippe. Oh, and he goes early. A little bit of weaving left and right and into turn 10. He's gone and he's followed by Tom Blomqvist and they have nailed it. Everyone else from Sebastian Bourdais caught napping there and there'll be 10 or 12 cars lengths across the line between the two Acuras. One second between the two Acuras and the rest of the field as Bourdais was not expecting them to go so early. Down to turn one. Through on a perfect racing line. Now climbing through the S's. Bordier pulled away just a wee bit. I think everyone was caught napping there. That was a really early going for it for Philippe Albuquerque coming into turn 10. Was, wasn't it? And uh, a great restart there. Uh, and uh, in LMP2, oh, Stephen hang on. Thomas. Ollie Clark going round the outside. That's a position made up on Tristan Fortier. The car bouncing, oscillating down that back straight. That You could hear the car hitting the ground. They're running the car super low this weekend. And those bumps are really flinging the cars around. Sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that in LMP2, I think Ben Keating made a move on Dennis Hansen down into turn one at that restart. So I think number 52 car back into second place in LMP2. He was certainly looking to make that pass down on the inside at turn one. And remember, Ben Keating has made a pit stop. So 
bit of action further back down the field on the restart between the Pro Lexus and past the Gilbert. Clear. Was that the uh, Gilbert Corp off car? Yes, it was yes. the number 32 machine off the track through turn number one for the number 14 and up the inside into the middle of the S's. Respectful driving from both cars now and now the number 14 Lexus is hunting down Stephen McAleer. Not in the same class. McAleer third in the GTs, first of the GTDs, and hassling Ross Gunn and Conor De Filippi, who are a couple of GTD Pro cars ahead of him. Also in there as well is Robbie Foley, I think. He's got past Magalia. So Robbie Foley has had a fantastic restart. He started down in 29th, and I reckon he's up to 26th or 25th at the moment. So the blue and yellow BMW uh, M4 GT3 of Turner Motorsport made the best restart of anybody. And uh, is climbing up now. He's looking at the back of Ben Barnicut. Three GTD Pro cars now at the head of the GT classes. Conor De Filippi from Paul still leads by about half a second from the Harder Racing Team Aston with Ross Gunn behind the wheel. Then Ben Barnicut for the first of the Lexus RCF GT3s. That's the black and yellow car, the Bumblebee style machine. Then Robbie Foley for Turner Motorsport. And. As I say, he made a very, very good restart indeed. Stephen McAleer trying to tough it out with him as they were heading through the tour of the boot, turn seven, and up the hill. But that BMW looks very well dialed in indeed and was able to drive around the outside, then switch to the inside. My goodness, that's forceful driving from both Stephen McAleer in the silver and black Mercedes and... Uh, that uh, brightly coloured Turner BMW, the yellow and blue car. Also making uh, up positions, the number nine, Machia Jamine, Faf Motorsports. That's the driveway, Motul sponsored car, right on the tailpipes at the moment of the number 12, Richard Highstand, driven Vasa Sullivan. That is the GTD version. Remember, the cars are the same. It's the driver lineups in the two GT category that make them different. But potential in terms of performance of these GT Daytonas exactly the same. Only the driver and the lineups of the driver with their ratings de determine whether those cars go into GTD Pro or standard GT Daytona. So just over half an hour gone, here's how it stands in GTD Pro. It's Conor De Filippi who leads on our VP Racing Fuel in-race update in the number 25 BMW from Roskun in the 23 Aston and the 14 of Ben Barnegat is the Lexus of Vasa Sullivan. In GTD, Robbie Forley for Turner Motorsport from Stephen McAleer uh, in the number 32 team court of Mercedes-AMG GT3 and Richard Highstand has the number 12 Lexus in third position. In the prototype classes, Nico Veron led from the green flag for Fast MD Racing. He's got three seconds on Dan Goldberg for Performance Tech. 40 from 38 from 58. The MLT Motorsports Ligier in third for Josh uh, Sarche. Should mention, of course, that Nico Veron is driving the one of just two, uh, three, sorry, to Keynes uh, in the race. Stephen Thomas leads an LMP2 from his PR1 Matheson Motorsport. Ben Keating, who did get back into second place ahead of Dennis Anderson. 5, 11 and 52. Uh, and uh, excuse me 11.52 and 20 in LMP2 and Ben Keating has topped off the fuel on that uh, wins number 52 car Philippe Albuquerque by just over a second uh, from his uh, from the second Acura the Mershank racing car so Cunningham and Alton number 10 the black and blue car from the pink and white of Tom Blomqvist in second place Sebastian Bordier is the best of the Cadillacs for the Zebra One. That's the white and black Cadillac. The dark red and black Cadillac is Earl Bamba. That's the Zero Two. He's another two seconds further back. Then it's Kamui Kobayashi for the Ally Cadillac number 48. Oli Pla in the red and white number 31 Cadillac is the further 1.3 seconds further back. And Tristan Vortier for JDC Miller in the dark grey and gold number five Cadillac is in seventh position. Under review for the restart. Well, that's interesting. Line of stern restart, so was somebody out of position? You can pass as soon as the green is called. So 
it, that might just be having a quick look. Unless uh, someone was in the wrong position. We'll wait for race control just along the top of the grandstand here to our left. And for a moment, there's a little bit of cloud cover. Temperatures on the track, 39 Celsius, just dropped down from 41. Uh, and 28 Celsius in the air. And if you prefer that in the Fahrenheit scale, that's 102 Fahrenheit on the track for the Michelin tyres, 82 in the air for the crew sitting on the pit lane. John Hindhoff and Jeremy Shaw with you. That's your VP in race update with still five hours and 26 minutes to go from the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, live from trackside at Watkins Glen International. This is the Sealand Six Hours of the Glen 2022. So, Jeremy, a, a little cessation of hostilities, but only a very short one there for that first full-course caution. And at the front of the field, Philippe Albuquerque has been able, on the, both the start and the restart, to pull out eight tenths to a second lead and just hold that over Tom Blomqvist and they're about another second ahead of the chasing Cadillacs. Yeah, but they're all, they're all out there. They're kind of in cruise mode at the moment. No one's pushing hard at this stage in a race. Long, long, long way to go. So no point in uh, showing your hand at this stage. Uh, you want to try and save as much fuel as you can. Wait until the first pit stop. I would expect the first pit stop. I would have expected the first pit stop around about lap 24 or so. Uh, maybe a bit before that. So with that caution, probably five, 25 or 6. Uh, but any time now, uh, they can start to think about making their first pit stops today for the, for the DPI cars. Uh, it'll be a long time before the, the, uh, the uh, GT cars need to come onto pit lane. So just for kind of opening skirmishes right now, once again, in LMP2, those two PR1 cars pulling away from the rest uh, at a prodigious rate. Also, Nico Verona, Nico Veroni in the uh, fast MD, Duquesne, uh, edging out once again. He's got five seconds already over uh, over Dan Goldberg and then a, a long train of cars behind him. So uh, interesting at this stage, but uh, nothing too dramatic. But uh, a couple of laps ago, Sebastian Bourdais once again did set the fastest lap of the race, which is now uh, a 131.685 for the Frenchman. Yeah. Uh, and in the classes, it is uh, Stephen Thomas with a 35.358 for PR1 Matheson Motorsport in LMP2. In LMP3, Nico Varone uh, for Fast MD with a 41.8. And in GTs, last time around, actually, Conor de Filippi just uh, set a 47.2. One minute 47.269 for the pedants among you for BMW M Team RLL. And 147.4, just two tenths away, Stephen McAuley of a team caught off motorsport, just underlining what I said about the machinery being the same, just the drivers being the differences. One, two, three, four across the track as they go past us, and that is the two Cadillacs. And down the inside, it's Earl Bamba, who's just gone through and taken second position from his teammate, that all happening in traffic, sitting in behind them, not too far away, is Kamui Kobayashi in the number 48. It's the Ally Cadillac as well, and he's right with Sebastian Bourdais. Little bit of, oh now, a little bit of smoke on the overrun from Bourdais' car on the left-hand side. Or was that just a lock-up from the left front Michelin as he braked for the inner loop? They're through the outer loop now, go, go now, going past the Paul Miller Racing Stars and Stripes livery BMW. Looks superb this weekend. And again, Bourdais doesn't get the best of the traffic. One either side of the... Risi Competizione Ferrari. And here comes Kamui Kobayashi down the inside of the driveway. Faf Porsche. And it looks to me as though Sebastian Bordet struggling with rear end grip on that 0-1 car. The car snaking around on acceleration and braking. And that's all the invitation that Kamui Kobayashi really needs. Past the court of... Uh, B, uh, court of BMG, excuse me. Now the turn of BMW, the number 96 car, and Kobayashi is staring at the rear end of Sebastian Bordet's Cadillac through turn 10 into the right hander at 11. Set the car up for the front straight. Lexus RCF ahead of them, so they can't quite use all of the road, at least Bordet couldn't. Interesting to see how they drop in behind the 
GT cars just to get a little more draft down the front straight. Harder racing. Now the BMW of Conor de Filippi goes under the hammer from Kambi Kobayashi up through the S's. Absolutely flat through there. Not a scintilla of a lift on the right hand pedal. Kobayashi just starting to get the aerodynamic draft. He's not going to be close enough into the inner loop. But that car is hitting the ground. You can hear it. That was through the kerb, so that's not so much of the worry for the team. Through the outer loop. Jimmy Johnson sitting down in the pit lane watching his teammate and the onboard. It's the head through turn six. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. James Vance, part of Fast MD, a driver, but also part of this team management. So I'm going to give you a little bit of credit. Where in the world did you find Nico Verone? I can't take the credit for that, but uh, when we were out, out over in uh, France testing a Paul Ricard, when we initially took delivery of our beautiful Duquesne D08, we ran into Nico and uh, great kid, super calm and great head on his shoulders, wise beyond his years, super quick, gives really great clear feedback and uh, we couldn't be happier to have him on board this weekend. It's a good combination with you and Max Hanratty. What's the plan for the race? I told you that, I mean, be giving the playbook away, but ultimately we know we got a good car underneath us. All of us have got really good long run pace, whether it be old tires, new tires, heavy fuel. So, I mean, we're just going to stick to our plan, stick to our own race, not let anyone get us flustered, and we'll see where we end up. It's, you know, we got five hours and 19 minutes to go. So, yeah, we got like five sprint races to go still. So, I think we're, we're going to have some fun and just stick to our plan, and hopefully we'll have some smiles on some faces that everyone here at Fast Indy Racing honestly, truly deserves. It's been a tough year and a half for us, but um, I, it feels good to, to be here because it feels right. Can't be that far away from seeing the first pit stops of the DPIs down to the number 10 Conic and Minolta pit. The tyres are being pressured, the tyre boys are putting their gloves on. So it's gotta be it's gotta be not far away. And further up the pit lane, the number one is in the pits. That is the Paul Miller Racing BMW, and that's early, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. No need to make a pit stop at this place, but they are, uh, they are. This team is concentrating on the Michelin Endurance Cup. They missed the first round of the season at Daytona. Their primary focus is the Michelin Endurance Cup, which they lead. Uh, which, excuse me. Which. No, which Start, let me start again. Their focus is the main championship, uh, but they, they want to get back into the into the mix. They missed the first race of the season. Number 27 car is in as well. They just, they just, they don't need to, and I don't think it was a problem. They're just getting themselves off strategy with everybody else at this stage. Well, let's check that out and make sure that there aren't any issues. Uh, Porsche keys to the race, uh, the heat uh, and the humidity. As in comes the first of the TPIs. Joe Bradley, an update from you, first of all. Yeah, from what I can see, the Aston just took on fuel and tyres. Drivers stayed put, and I think the same was at the uh, the same case at Paul Miller. Change of driver at Paul Miller, I'm being told. Uh, yes, let me just check. I think that is the case, Joe. Uh, I'll... Uh, it was Eric Johansson has got into that car as the Wheel of Engineering number 31 car comes in. Ollie Pla behind the wheel of that one. Joe Bradley. Yeah, no sign of Ollie Pla getting out, though. I think he's had some sort of drinks bottle replenished inside the cockpit. The tyres are already on. The fueling, the last thing to be done. Still going on, still going on. Just feel like an edge in there. And Ollie Platt, first of the DPIs to roll the dice and come into the pits for first of what will be many. And is that about on time, Jeremy, for a, a DPI? Or again, is that a tad early, seeing as though we had a wee bit of, uh, of safety car? Yeah, it's certainly a bit early than, than uh, what one would have expected. I, I would think in the next four or five laps, uh, the, the cars could certainly stay out if they, if they want to. So maybe just getting off strategy. Yeah, and I think you'll probably get a new set of tires onto the change tires, did you see? Uh, but uh, if, if you're getting uh, something yes, clear air, try and turn some quick laps and maybe leapfrog, undercut effectively the other, the other pit callers when they come in in a few laps' time. The, even at this stage, the fueling is uh, long enough that you can do the tyres whilst it's going in. That is, that is not the same as you saw a few weeks ago at Le Mans, where when you're fueling, you can't do anything else. In IMSA, 
we continue here with the ability to do both things at the same time. So there is no time penalty for putting a new set of tyres on it. Jeremy. Yeah, brilliant. Love it. Lo love these pit stops. They're really cool to watch. And uh, change of position there for fourth position. Number 48, Cadillac. Up a position, a spin, but between the number 36 car and number 33 down in turn one. Both pointed the wrong way. Two more LMP3 cars. That's Gerard not, Andretti and Lance Wilsey got not, together. Not been a great weekend for the Andretti car. They've fought through, through a few problems. The Sean Creech Motorsport at red, white and blue, number 33. Ninth as they went across the line and disputing eighth position. Lance Wilsey down the inside. He's not there. He's nowhere near there. And I think when he gets going again, that'll be being looked at by race control. He's uh, come from quite a long way back. You don't need a big touch there. These yeah. cars are really on the ragged edge of adhesion and a wheel, an errant wheel on the back straight. And that is the uh, number 81, the uh, Dragon Speed car, which is missing a right front wheel. That hasn't been in recently, has it? No. It hasn't. That's uh, Henrik Hedman. And I think I think uh, that that instant down turn one. I think they were looking ahead. Uh, I think um, who was it making that pass? Who was it making the pass? It was uh, Lance Wilson, wasn't it? I think he saw it ahead of him. Ori Fidani making a pass on Ari, Bail Ari Baylog, uh, also from position. He said, "I can do that too." Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't quite. Let's head to the pit lane. The leaders are in. Joe Bradley. 60, my Shankar comes to my feet, tyres and fuel, and just behind that, the number 10, Kodak of an Alter car, also, again, no sign of any drivers being changed, just tyres and fuel from all of these teams. Down at Miami, we've had a slew of LP2 cars in, the most recent of which was the racing team Nederland, it was fuel and tyres for that car, it was a slow stop for the 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche, as Ryan Hardwick was not alerted that he was going to be driving until the last possible minute, he is now in the car. Everything to schedule here, the Mayashan car getting off its pit box just ahead of the number 10, so equal times for those pit stops for those two teams. And the Cadillacs as well, the O2 is already gone, the O1 just passing me now, and there goes the number 5, the Mustang Sampling car, just out ahead of the Dragon Speed, and the number 48, the Alley entry just behind that, the Alley entry before me there just outside and we've got now we've got gts so from dpis and prototypes we've now got a gaggle of gts on pit road and i presume that's because we haven't gone to full course yellow yet no we haven't so these are th these are green flag pit stops effectively we've still got lance wilsey it is uh, pointing the wrong direction on driver's right at turn one. I think race control is going to let everybody cycle through the pit. Uh, GT pit stops with Sher Adam. We had Robbie Foley come into the pit lane. He is staying because Michael Dynan has taken over the Turner Motorsport BMW. It is a pit stop for fuel and tires at Team Cawthorpe. I wasn't able to see if there was a driver change there. But in the LMP3 realm, we had just about everybody come in. Fuel and tires for the 54 core Autosport LMP3 that is second in the championship size. The pit closed or lights are now on and we are under a full course caution but it was a beautiful stop from our championship leaders in LMP3 Junior 3 racing fuel and tires only there very good very good indeed from all of those drivers and from race control uh, by the way it was the left front tyre from the Dragon Speed car uh, I forgot to turn that over because I was looking at it straight on thanks to Roddy Digital for uh, reminding me it was the other right front it was indeed the left has been in and back out again by the way uh, before the yellows have come out Joe Bradley a little wrap on what's been going down at pit out at the end of things hang on I'm going to have to have a look at my notes there was so much happened there <laughs> uh, the only driver change I saw from everything down at pit out was the number nine Faf Porsche that had a change of driver there um, I'm not sure what happened to Corvette. I'm not sure what they did. And I think there may have been an overtake. The, the Corvette number three got out in front of the number nine Porsche guys. Was that an overtake on pit road? Uh, yes. Yes, it was. Yes. Well done, Joe. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, uh, Corvette came from quite a few places back in actual fact. The Ooh. wheel from the Dragon Speed car coming off as the car... Uh, that was the uh, left front wheel uh, coming off as the car was coming back onto the short course. So not too far for that car to get back. Apologies, that was in the short, it was in the cutout. It went back up the wrong way up the track. Um, and when I originally saw that, I thought that was coming out of the, uh, coming out of the uphill 
S's. So not too far for the car to get back to the pit lane and they managed to get in and out before the yellow came out, which it is now. But because they took the shortcut, they will be docked that lap. Oh, did it take the shortcut? Well, didn't, didn't you, I thought you told me. No, that's where the wheel ended up. I don't know where the car went. I only saw where the wheel ended up, Jeremy. So uh, if, if you're right, they will lose a lap. So let's keep an eye uh, on that one for the number 81. I'll scroll back down. Uh, they are showing a lap away at the moment from the class leaders. So what happened then to number 48 car during that round of pit stops? Because it came into pit in, in fourth position and less, left in seventh. That's disappointing for the, that uh, Chad they Knauss. Did, they did they, change drivers. Yeah, OK. Well, you, it shouldn't should, make any difference. No, because it was pretty much the end of a stint in any case. They were due a pit stop within a few laps, so it needed full service. There should have been plenty of time to change the drivers. So uh, I'd like to find out what, uh, what happened there, because Chad Knauss... Uh, is uh, he put that whole pit crew together? He's one of the best strategists in the in the business. Okay, best done in NASCAR. But he's, he's he's just fine at these races as well. Trust me. And uh, you know they were looking forward to a good race. They, they didn't think they had quite the same the, enough pace to challenge the front of Chad this morning. Uh, and he was uh, very gracious to me. They didn't think they had quite the pace, but they were looking forward to the race. But they'll be having made up those positions in the early and the early stages. Made up three places. Did Kamui got past uh, Bourdais just before that caution mm. came out? And now he's fallen behind Bourdais and behind number 31 car, which made that early stop, and number five of Tristan Vautier as well. So that's disappointing. Jimmy Johnson now at the wheel of that number 48. Yeah, cracking restart from Philippe Albuquerque at the uh, last throw of the green flag. Uh, as I say, it appeared that he'd uh, caught quite a few people behind him, although not Tom Blomqvist, but pretty much everybody else uh, by... Uh, a little bit uh, unexpectedly when he went to the throttle. And the positions changing on the pit lane between the two Acuras. So the 60 getting out just ahead of Philippe Albuquerque. Yeah, so annoying for Wayne Taylor. Uh, more than that, I would say. <laughs> Uh, the incident that sparked this uh, full course yellow, the number 33, that's Wilsey, Sean Creech Motorsport and the Andretti Autosport, Jarrett Andretti driven number 36 coming together at turn one is under review. I fear there's only one way that that is going. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch with us, we're live from trackside at Watkins Glen International from the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Jeremy Shaw and John Hindorf, Shea Adam and Joe Bradley down in the pit lane for us. RS2, IMSA Radio, all the way through to the ends of the race. If you're outside the US, you can have a live video there as well. Hit the live video tab on imsaradio.com and here in the US it's Sirius 207 as well as on the World Wide Web via imsaradio.com and, uh, and now with uh, many cars having come into the pits before the full course caution the order has been shuffled around quite a bit uh, and with, there's a lot of people now getting that wave around the cars that are in between the safety car and their class leader and uh, so they can now run around to the back of the pack. They're then free to make a pit stop if they like to after that uh, and uh, remain on the lead lap in their class. The pits... Uh, still closed. Yeah, still closed. So, so John eight. Ferrano has just come into the pits for a splash of fuel yeah. from third position. You're only allowed five seconds of fuel uh, if you come in when the pits are closed. That's yeah. part of that emergency service we were talking about earlier on. And that's the only one of the LMP2 cars that did not come in before the caution period. So that kind of bit them in the backside there for number eight car. So, he'll, I mean, no big deal. He'll drop to the back of the pack. He'll still be on the, the lead lap with everybody else. Uh, but he'll have to restart at the back, and s because it's emergency service, he will have to uh, serve a drive, yeah, make another pit stop. The bright blue Cadillac four-door saloon leading the pack around at the moment, which is the Cadillac CT4 V-Series Blackwing. It's the Watkins Glen track edition, uh, revealed officially in July. Uh, bad news to those of you at Cadillac, um, we're watching it now, so <laughs> it's been re revealed right now. Other IMSA track editions coming out, Sebring and Road Atlanta. 
So really nice piece of activation from Cadillac for their IMSA. So CT, CT4 V-Series Blackwing. That means it's got a stonking V8 that makes a very, very nice noise. That's all you need to know about that. And it seats four in comfort. I had the predecessor of that car around right about this time of year, actually, a few years ago uh, with the supercharger on it to drive from uh, Canada down to here and then back up to Canada and thoroughly enjoy it. One Montoya looks like uh, he's getting ready to do some work down in the Dragon Speed pit. That was uh, the number no. 81 car, Henrik Hedman, still in that car. I think it'll be the ladder gets in next, Sebastian, uh, and then and then JPM, probably. JPM, by the way, I had a great chat with him this morning. He, he first raced here 28 years ago. I can't believe that he has been racing that long, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but uh, indeed so. He, st he started his career, he made his first career start here at Watkins Glen in the old Barbador, in the Barbasar Pro Series, as it was wow. back then in the uh, mid, what, 90s? Yes, <laughs> end of the night. Yeah, mid, mid yeah. 90s. Yeah, well, we're only 2022. Yeah, so the... Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, so the, the Dragon Speed car <laughs> had to avoid its own wheel. It was coming out of turn eight into nine, uh, and the wheel actually built, beat it to turn nine. And as you've heard me say many times before, it's never a good day when different parts of the car are doing different lap times. And the left front tyre making its bid for freedom. Actually, a pretty good job by Henrik Hedman to avoid his own wheel. Now, the pits are now open for prototypes and taking advantage, Mustang Sampling, JDC Miller car and the 01 Sebastian Bourdais. Uh, no, sorry, it's the number 48 that's coming in down at Joe Bradley's end of things, Joe. Yeah, the Ally car comes in. Looks like it's only fuel. Oh, that was barely any fuel. Stall coming out the number five Mustang Sampling car. I think, it, again, matching wheel for wheel, fuel for fuel, just a little bit of a splash and dash, barely touched it with the, the fuel hose, and then he pulled it straight back off. So literally, what, a gallon, two? Yeah, yeah. but, but you know, that, that could be the difference between you know, being able to do an extra lap if there's another caution at the wrong or right time, depending on which way you look at it. So it's worth it, you know, if you're at the back of the pack in any case, because they'd fallen to the back with that slow pit stop uh, a few laps ago, uh, so, you know, it, it's nothing ventured, nothing gained. They're going to be able to make up the pos make up their ground and, and take up position at the tail end of the DPI cars. So you can be able to pass everybody else and get back onto the tail, tail of the DPI cars before we go back to green. So no, no harm, no, no uh, penalty there, effectively, for making that extra pit stop. Uh, we've got uh, one of the... Uh LMP2 cars back into the pits as well. Sorry, LMP3 cars. Uh, and yeah. Adam and was watching the P3s into the pit lane. Yeah. Right side tires and fuel for the 36 Andretti machine. It was four tires and fuel for the 58, that's MLT Motorsport. And then I couldn't see what was happening down at uh, Mjolnir because it was a bit further down, but that was the other one that came in as well, John. Thank you, Shit. A little less hectic for you uh, that time, <laughs> that time around. Uh, thank you for all the great work down in the pit lane to our two very warm pit reporters uh, today. Jeremy. And that number 81 car did lose a lap. He wasn't penalised lap. He did lose a lap as a result of having to limp back to the pits and um, and get, get a fresh wheel on that on that car. So uh, Henrik there doing a you know, good job to set, to keep it... Uh, hopefully not cause any additional damage, but odd that that wheel should have uh, departed company uh, toward the end of a stint. You know, he, hadn't, he hadn't been in the pits before that, so that's going to be a cause of concern for that team. Uh, look at the GTD cars right now. Ross Gunn leads the GTD phalanx of cars uh, in, in a pro car. Then behind him are the non-pro cars of Robert McGinnis, the Lamborghini car number 39, Giorgio Sernagiotto in the Chetelar Ferrari car number 47, Tilbeck Kulsheimer in the gradient racing Acura number 66, uh, Louis Camponc in the number 21 Ferrari, and also John Potter in the Magnus racing Aston Martin car number 44. None of those cars have yet made a pit stop. So uh, the pits are open now for GT cars. I would expect them all to be ducking onto pit lane next time around. 
Yeah, just uh, a quick hello to Simi Rich, who's listening from the Jackie Stewart Grandstand. First time at WGI. Hello to Aaron and Simi. Uh, let's get back to green. Yeah, th that'll happen very shortly. Uh, and thank you for tuning in to IMSA Radio. Always good to, to have your company. It must be a bit toasty uh, over there in the Sir Jackie Stewart Grandstand, but uh, goodly amount of fans there. Not much... Uh, not much respite from the heat there. I suppose you can nip out and uh, go underneath it. Nice to see the picnic tables that have been installed around the place as well. I noticed when I've been travelling around on the golf cart. Uh, thanks to all the workers here at Watkins Glen. We've uh, had such a good time here. Again, our first time here for a while, although, of course, we called the races both of the races from here last year. A GT stop, Shea Adam, that's your end of things. I'm only seeing one driver change as John Potter is staying, no, he yes, he is staying in the Magnus Racing Aston Martin. They've psyched me out there for a minute by opening his door. It is a driver change for the Chetelar Ferrari. That is Giorgio Cernigiato getting out and Roberto Lacorda taking over for car number 47 for the sister car, the 21A, of course, Ferrari. Fuel and tires only, no change from drivers. That's the sound of the hardpoint Porsche roaring back into life after fuel only, and it was fuel and tires for the Gradient Racing Acura. I've seen fuel only for the car bond, the number 39 Lamborghini and also the number 16 Porsche of Wright Motorsports. Fuel only there, nothing else. Thanks, Joe. And Shay, a bit of track cleanup going on as well. We've got the blowers out with exactly five hours remaining. And uh, Roberto Lacourt there. A happy birthday to him from yesterday. So he's a year old than he was so when he began the race weekend. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like I'm about 30 years older, Jeremy, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, the, those, those, the, the, the Aston Martin of the, for Heart of Racing did not come into the pits that time around. Uh, all of the other GTD cars that I talked about, number 39, 47, 66, 21 and 44, did, uh, as, long, as well as uh, several others, including the six, number 16, Bright Motorsports Porsche, I just saw there as well. So the number 23 car is the only car in the field yet to make its first pit stop. Well, with an hour of racing gone, we've had two full course caution periods for a total of uh, eight laps or 27 minutes. Here's how it stands. The class leaders, car bomb with Peregrine Racing, Robert McGuinness in the number 26 GTD car. In GTD Pro, Heart of Racing, Aston Martin have cycled to the front. Ross Gunn then leads the BMWs for the first time after that pit stop cycle. In LMP3, Performance Tech Motorsport, Dan Goldberg in the number 38 is the leader in 12th position overall. Sixth for the LMP2 leader, the 11 PR1 Matheson Motorsport, Stephen Thomas. He's been in that car since the start, as has Tom Blomqvist, who nicked the lead away from Philippe Albert. Kirk on the pit stop. That was turned over in the pit lane. Right at the end of the pitch they are. And Blomqvist and the Meyershank racing with Kerb Agajanian number 60 crew turned that pink and white car around uh, quick enough to get it in front uh, of the Albuquerque black and blue car. Philippe still at the wheel. It's still the two Acuras that lead. That's your VP Racing Fuel update with four hours and 58 minutes to go. Well, this is setting up very nicely, Jeremy. That uh, yellow, or at least actually the green flag stops before the yellow. Actually, round about the right time for most of the guys in the field. Yeah, just a little bit earlier than they needed to. Certainly, uh, you know, a bit, yeah, a bit, but yes. Nobody massively disadvantaged there, Jeremy. We saw, obviously, the 81 lost the tyre, but that, that wasn't anything to do with the, the timing of, of the yellow. The two cars that caused it, they have dropped off a lap each, and I suspect there's some further penalty coming. It is being investigated, and I think that's going to go the way of Jared Andretti, I'm afraid, because he was coming from a very long way back. But other than that... Oh, it was no the other way around, wasn't it? It was number 30, 33 uh, car making a move on. Uh, on Jared. It was, it was Lance yeah. Wilsey making a move on uh, and Jared Andretti at turn one. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, no, the, the big loser there is number 48 team, uh, you know, with that with that poor pit stop. Certainly like to find out what happened with that stop. Um, but uh, when they come around now, uh, we're seeing... Pits are open for everyone. Yeah. And that's the LMP2 leaders coming into the pit lane. Shea Adam is now down in that end of things. I was not expecting to see them. It will no. be fuel only for Stephen Thomas. Let's see what they're going to do for Ben Keating. He pulled in at an angle and actually blocked Stephen's exits to where they need to pull it back a bit. Ben Keating's going to leave with the lead. 
Oh, side by side. No, Ben, sorry, you're not ahead. You need to give way. That's the rule in IMSA, uh. and he does. But Stephen ran the red light at the pit exit. Oh, oh no. And Ben Keating saw the red light and stops in the wind's car. That's going to be a huge, huge penalty for the number 11. Now, don't reverse there, Ben. You've, you've done the right thing. You weren't in the acceleration lane. That's the thing. He's done everything right here, Ben Keating. And unfortunately, Stephen Thomas probably distracted, I think, by trying to get in front of the... Number 52, wins car from Ben Keating. He blew the red light on the pit exit, Jeremy. That'll be a big, big penalty. I think you're absolutely right. I'm sure he was concentrating on his mirrors uh, and making sure that uh, he was clear of the number 52 car. They weren't going to collect those RFID readers or, the, or those, those blocks. Is that a concrete block? I hope not. Uh, right before it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm sure he's completely distracted there and wouldn't have been looking there. So really unfortunate. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's able to uh, somehow redress that without getting an additional penalty. Because the number 52 car, it was ahead, but it wasn't clear of yes. the number 11 uh, car. He has that to be is ahead. The key. He has to be clear of it in order to pull across into the fast lane. Otherwise, the guy in the fast lane has the... Uh, has the right of way there. And unfortunately, from that f fast lane, you have to move to the right a bit mm -hmm. to go through those readers. And that's why Stephen Thomas would have been distracted there, because he had to turn left, but he knew, he thought number 52 car was, was still there. I think there might have been a wee touch there. I tell you what, heads up from Ben Keating, because the 52 car was between him and the red lights. It would have been easy to not have seen that. And he pulled the car up well before the yellow light. So yeah. he's clear. But Stephen Thomas and the number 11 is going to get a pit lane penalty for blowing the red light on the exit of pit lane. That is classed as a safety infraction as the looks like the prototypes are moving forward again. So we can't be too far away from going back to green flag. Joe Bradley down in the pit lane with what looked to have been a uh, reasonably standard stop further up the pit lane has been ended up being something entirely different. Where are you, Joe? Yeah, and I think there's going to be more to this story. It's the number eight, the Tower Motorsports car, uh, was brought in. Uh, this is the car that won at Laguna Seca, remember? It came in, it looked like just fueling tyres. However, then they produced a front end, and the front end was changed. And now they are just in a massive conversation with Johnny Knox, the pit lane official. I think they're going to... Uh, they've... Um, it's something to do with not taking a first opportunity for emergency service. It's something along those lines. That might appear uh, soon on your screen. But the car is out. The car slightly delayed for the, for the nose, but then it's, um, it's now a win. Great flag. And this time it's Tom Blomqvist who leads them back to the line from Philippe Albuquerque. And in third position, the 0 2 of Earl Bamber, then Sebastian Bordier. Bamber remembers past Bordier on the track. Oli Pla then in fifth position for the 31, the red and white wheel and Cadillac. Tristan Fournier and Jimmy Johnson. That car back up to seventh position. But a long pit stop there that we need to find out about. So the 48 crew, the 48 team is due a visit from one of our pit lane crew through the inner loop for the first time. Uh, and when those uh, DPI cars came into the pits, that enabled number 81 car to get uh, ahead Dragon of them. Speed. Oh, big spin. Back D on the lead lap. Down at the inner loop, and there's uh, some bodywork damage as well with the cheese wedge uh, sitting on the track. It's the right... Uh, Motorsports, number 13. AWA. Uh, the AWA, yeah, sorry, Ori number 13. Ori Fadani there. Yeah, that car, I think, just locking up on their own. Ori then losing the back end. And that was coming into was turn, turn one. one, and then he's on the grass. Oh, he got hit from behind. Hit from behind, Fadani. Uh, by mm -hmm. the white and green. That was Andretti behind him. Yeah, that's the 36 car again. And very lucky not to spin back into the track. And there were some penalties there as well. Uh, issued as we went back to green. Let me just grab those back up again. 
Oh, I now know why the number 38 car came through early on. The crew were improperly attired right at the start of the race. Uh, sorry, didn't pick that one up. Uh, when that was changing tyres after qualifying for the 36, the 38 got a drive through for all crew improperly attired right at the beginning. Incident responsibility for the Sean Creech Motorsport uh, hit on the 36, as Jeremy rightly said, and a pit lane speed violation for the number eight. Uh, that is going to be, well, that's a drive through. It's uh, plus two kilometers an hour. Uh, that car will have to come back down pit lane again. It's the John Ferrano, Louis Delatraz, and Rui Pinto de Andrade LMP2 Tower Motorsports car. Looked to me though that there was a slight nudge from the Andretti car on the number 13, which has come back into the pit lane and gone straight back behind the wall for the AWA of Ori Fadani, the car that he shares with Karl Marcelli and Porsche racer and test driver Lars Kern. Yeah, it's driven back, but uh, it is missing some essential bodywork at the back. That cheese wedge behind the rear wheel has an aerodynamic responsibility that I'm sure they'll want to sort out. Maybe a little bit of suspension damage, maybe a tall link as well on the back of that car. But Ori's done a good job getting it back. He locked up on the way down to turn one, but then looked to me as though he was nerfed onto the grass uh, at turn five, the inner loop. So yellows, breeding yellows, yeah. Jeremy. Th this will be a, a short yellow then. There won't be, the pits will not be uh, opened again uh, because we had one just, uh, <laughs> it wasn't, it not only was it less than 15 minutes, it was probably less than 15 seconds, <laughs> slightly more perhaps, but uh, yeah, well below the 15 minutes. So this will just be, uh, get that car out of the way and then go back to racing as we are right now. So no more shuffling of the of the pack, uh, other than the, the class split, which is which had been done before. And in any case, so that really shouldn't be a problem. We have the, all the prototypes ahead of the GTD cars and the prototypes are all a lap behind, two laps behind actually, the, uh, the, the, the GT, GT cars are all two laps behind the prototype, so it shouldn't be any uh, shuffling of positions there. Uh, what I did notice at the restart in GTD Pro, uh, we've now got uh, three cars at the, uh, at the head of the field in GTD Pro, ahead of all the GTD cars. Uh, change for second and third. Ben Barnicott able to get past Conor Filippi at that restart. So the Aston Martin, that still has not yet stopped, by the way, car number 23, oh, right. leads the class. Ahead now of Ben Barnicott and Alexis, car number 14 for Vassar Sullivan, then the BMW for Di Filippi. Green. That was quick. Yeah, it was quick. That was a quick yellow. A bit of waving down towards turn one for Tom Blomqvist in the number 60. Maya Shank racing pink and white Acura. The blue and black car behind him is the second place car. Connick Manolta Acura, Philippe Albuquerque, Earl Bamba, and Sebastian Bourdain, Oli Pla. They all started the race, so they've been in just coming up to 70 minutes of this race. Down the back straight, equidistant, down into the inner loop. Getting very close to the grass. They are so quick into that. I'm going to call it an S bend now rather than a chicane because they're just. They're barely slowing down. There's a lift and a slight dab of the brakes, and then they commit so early to the throttle through that first and second part. Gather it all back up again and fire it straight out into the parabolica, the outer loop. As Joe Bradley on the reef start has problems down in the pit lane for the NSX Acura, the number 66 gradient racing car that was rebuilt yesterday. Yeah, three mechanics just uh, <laughs> threw themselves on the back of the car. They've taken the engine cover off and they've, they've each got hands down there. So it's a, it's a, it's in the engine bay, the, the, whatever the area is, and it might be they're just tugging on some what looks like perhaps cooling pipes. I'll wait a little while and see if I can suss out exactly what the issue might be with the 66 Acura. Very wily to notice the long stop for the 48 there. Jeremy, it was a fuel plug-in issue, so that's what caused them to be delayed so long. They thought the fuel was plugged in. Took a little few extra seconds. 
to actually get the fuel into the car. Ah, thank you, Shay. So a fuel plug in issue. Now, running the pit light, stop at 60 seconds for the number 11, and in the pit lane now, Stephen Thomas. However, the car 52, which is the car that they are battling, the Ben Keating machine, PR1 Matheson Motorsport, passing under yellow. So that's a drive through for the number 52 as well. Now, has Ben already taken that? Yes, I think he has, yeah. Um, no, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. He just, uh, the number 11 car has just served its penalty. Yeah, I just said that. He's yeah. sitting there in the pit lane yeah. now. Um, 60 seconds Plus for the drive-through. It's oh, really unlucky, isn't it? So, Keating's been down the pit lane three times, though. So, that was once after the first, once after the second, and once for the drive-through, surely. He hasn't been in three times for service, has he? Uh, just before the first yellow. Then did he top off? Well, he, he was assessed at the same, roughly the same time for passing under yellow. Uh, so that is going to even things out at the front of the battle. Oh, yeah, down into turn one, he went yeah, no, past he came, the driveway portion. Yeah, he did come under yellow, so no, he hasn't served his penalty yet. Right, OK. So that's going to be a drive-through there as well, but that will just be a drive-through. No stop at the end of the pit lane for Ben Keating. He's going to get frequent flyer miles for down the pit lane the amount of times he's been in already, with only an hour and 15 minutes gone. Just waves at uh, Joe and Shea every time he goes down. I'm sure that's the only reason he's back in and out of the pit lane. Stephen Thomas has exited. Here comes Ben Keating to serve his drive through. So he's going to gain 60 seconds on Stephen Thomas, whatever else happens. Uh, probably a little bit more than that, actually. And who's just followed in? Ross Gunn is just out. Improper emergency service for Tower as they come back in. It's the number eight didn't pit at the first available opportunity. That's exactly what Joe Bradley said. Johnny Knox was talking to them about. So spot on from Bradders there at the top end of the pit lane. So that's a drive through for them as well. well we said it now, Porsche keys to the race that a drive through here can be costly it's so quick down the front straight you're going to lose the better part of half a lap maybe a little bit more on your competitors at the front of the field then Tom Blomqvist resets the fastest lap now down to 131.638 little bit of cloud cover and immediately the track temperature which was up as high as 45 Celsius now down to 41 that's still a toasty 106 Fahrenheit. 28 in the air, 82 Fahrenheit. Blomqvist down through the gearbox. Just one cog, I think, into turn five. Porsche Keys, the race said, keep an eye on what's going on weather-wise to make sure that they know what they're doing. Hello to Blue Fiend, back home in Orlando. Blue Fiend's been on holiday in the Cayman Islands, watching and listening live. Mid-race points for Michelin Endurance Cup, Jeremy. Here's the question, is it at the three-hour mark or is there a lap count that must be met? It's the lap completed after the three-hour mark, is that right? Yes. So there you go, Blue Whoa. Fiend. Oh, that's a very big blow-up for Milner Motorsport. They didn't have the best of luck yesterday. That's an engine problem. That's gone in the most spectacular way. That's an old-fashioned 1970s style. I'm out of here. And that Dylan. car is a light, immediate full course yellow. That car's well on fire. That's going to be an oil fire underneath the bodywork there. And already we've got the EMR safety crew making sure that the fire bottle is emptied into it, checks to see if the onboard fire suppression has 
being fired in. He's actually just done that. That is very cool work indeed from the EMR safety crew member. Leaned in, looked to the fire button inside. So coming through the uphill S's for Mulder Motorsport and the number six car. It was Dylan McAvern, I think, behind the yep. wheel, Jeremy, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, they were racing at the Nürburgring yesterday. Didn't have the best of luck there either. And that was just, it just absolutely grenaded both sides, both sets of exhausts. Uh, and he gets off the racing line as quick as he can. Looks like it's doing the Blue Angels air display with the amount of smoke coming out the back of that. Pulls over at the fire point and the drivers know where all the fire points are that is a huge conflagration under the back of the H&R sponsored machine Dylan in his uh, Turner Motorsport overalls out of that car but how cool from the EMR safety crew member who was right there went in with the fire bottle and then reached calmly in to the car and pulled the fire suppression very cool indeed, and has a bottle of cold yeah. water for the driver. There you go. Uh, who's uh, who's still wearing his Turner Motorsport yes. uh, suit? Of course, he won yesterday's Michelin Pilot Challenge race. Did Dylan McAvern along with Bill Oberlin. So uh, hero to zero. But what a shame for Dylan. He's doing a nice job there in that mule the car, and uh, he was looking forward to, to sharing it with uh, Ugo de Wilde and uh, Danny Formal, who was due to make his. MCW Tech Sports Car Championship debut. That was a heck of a save by Dylan, but golly, yikes, that was really scary for the following drivers. Absolutely, completely unsighted there. And he did a great job of spotting that Marshall's post and pulling her into the racetrack. I, most of the teams have spotters that can see that part of the racetrack and until they said, there's nothing behind you, you can pull across. Yeah, and the windscreen and the camera on the Hartner Racing number 23 car absolutely covered in oil there. We've got the intervention vehicles down there. The fire is under control, I think. Yes, it is. In fact, it's been put out. As I said, brilliant job by everybody uh, involved there. Let's uh, take the opportunity to go down the pit lane. We'll check in with Joe Bradley, first of all. Well, I've got Danny Formal, who was down to drive that number six mill the motorsport car, but that's cars out now, Danny. Did the driver get any indication that was going to happen? No, um, kind of feel bad. I really, really feel bad for the team. We're working really well. Uh, Dylan, you know, is getting used to this LMP3. It's so different what he's used to. He was making out, you know, making good ground on, on, on everyone. Uh, no, nothing, really. He was just going into turn two, and he thought it was the gearbox, but that's the engine uh, the engine went, and uh, that's probably something uh, inside that just sounded like the gearbox. Uh, luckily, he got out of the car really fast because there was a small fire, obviously, with all the oil and fuel on the exhaust. Uh, uh, unfortunate, I really wanted to drive. This was my first weather tech weekend. We had a dream weekend in Lamborghini Super Trofeo with Wayne Taylor. I'll take that as the positive over this weekend. Getting this opportunity last minute is always awesome, right? Uh, starting to get my name out there in the IMSA, IMSA paddock, which is super important. Uh, no, just thankful for Mjolnir Motorsports for the opportunity. Hopefully we could do it together again. And yeah, uh, good luck to Wayne Taylor, obviously in the number 10 car. And uh, yeah, a shame. Look forward to seeing you again, Danny. I'm sure I will. Thank you. Thanks for talking to you. Unfortunately, back into the pit lane for Gradient Racing in their Acura. They are suffering from a misfire. It's almost as if an injector isn't giving all the power that they need. So that car has come back into the pits. The engine cover is off once again with the mechanics into the back of that car. Many thanks to Mark Miller for giving us the intel. Shea, do we know if that was the same problem that they had in morning warm-up uh, when we saw them pulling stuff out the back of the car? Do not know if it was the same problem as morning warm-up, uh, but it is the same problem that's been plaguing them all race. OK, thank you, Shea. Still Bechtelsheimer uh, making that report to the team and coming in straight after the restart. It's been a... Well, one of Bradley's character-building weekends for the number 66 team. And they've had quite a lot of work to do in the last three races and they've got down to it Andres and the rest of the team have uh, got down to it very professionally indeed four hours 37 minutes to go we are under yellow flag number five already not really getting into the rhythm of this race four, so far one two three is it four, four or five? Yeah, Sorry, four. four. Yeah. Seems like five there. 
Uh, yeah, the long, we had nine nine run nine laps in the first stint, and then we had so we had ten in the second before the second caution. Hardly any since then. Now, has the heart of racing Aston pitted yet? Uh, no. <laughs> so Ross Good. They're going to do the race on one pit stop, I think. <laughs> uh, I think that might uh, that might be slightly beyond them. Um, fuel mileage kings hyper miling and the aston martin v8 vantage uh, but uh, because we just had a short yellow the pits will be open this time uh, and uh, I, I certainly would have ex would expect to see the aston martin on the pit lane uh, pass around first so yes it looks like we're going through the full formalities for yellow flag uh, pits not open at the moment as we're preparing for the pass around yeah and the only car that uh, needed the pass around was number uh 11 which very fortuitously was uh, able to uh, was, I don't know, was that one of the lp3 cars as well wasn't it yeah uh that uh, which is a, several laps down the uh, yeah, number 11 car, very fortuitously, even with that one minute penalty, was able to just about stay on the lead lap, wasn't lapped by the other leaders, apparently then in LP2, so really lucky there, break for the number 11 car. He is going to be back on the lead lap with the wave around this time around. So it is the fifth stroke of uh, full course caution, Jeremy, because we only had the tiny little gap mm -hmm. between two and three. Fourth, um, so one, two, three, four, yeah, this is the Fourth. One, two, one on lap three, ten, four. one on lap twenty-five, one on lap thirty-one, and one on lap thirty-six. Uh, well, what's, what's that one there then? No idea. So the first one was fifteen fifty-five. Uh, so what lap was that? So how many laps have you got for? full course caution that I've got 13 laps and 44 minutes at the moment and five times it's been out because there's one where we yeah, virtually yeah, didn't get 13. back to green interesting so did, is that one did we not go back to green there that interesting so 31 car came in there for a splash uh, that is emergency service for the wheel and Cadillac number 31 emergency service Shea Adam, is that correct? Five seconds of fuel, that was it. That's bizarre. They shouldn't have needed fuel. Uh, uh, well, it, I mean, it, 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 that's all the fuel they probably had. had uh, that's weird. And it's not up to speed now. Uh, 16 laps that car's been out for Pla. Yeah, but most of that's it. been under yellow. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, and it's slow now going up through the S, or is it going up the back of the field? I don't know. Confused. Uh, red light at the pit exit before Oli Pla moved on. Sure, but uh, I'm not sure it's up to speed uh, after that. I don't know, maybe it is. Hopefully it is. So maybe that was just a strategic call by the number 31 key team just to top off with fuel. Uh, if they're only allowed to take five seconds, uh, but uh, maybe that five seconds was enough for them to deem it worthwhile because there's going to be no... Yeah, but then they have to come back in again if it's emergency. So, but I presume everybody's going to anyway yeah, so so at the end of this. Maybe they will. Um, in which case he's going to le need less fuel than everybody else. Yeah. Odd one. Unless they didn't take full fuel the previous time that they came in, Jeremy. That's the only other thing I can uh, think about because uh, Oli Pla uh, did. And he's been in since the start, hasn't he? Uh, been told there was a false green that immediately went yellow, and that's why the timing shows five yellows. Who's what? A false green that immediately went yellow. That uh, coming in from Lee Driggers. When was that? That was in between. That's the, the ones that I've got on the timing screen that shows um, a lap where it went back to green. So that is a false green that immediately went yellow. So it well, is indeed. I mean, it went green and then we went yellow you know, 20 seconds later. 
Uh, that's what I'm being told from race control. A bit full, 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 four proper full course cautions. The, fir the first one was timing the, showing uh, five, Jeremy. That's my point. One well, of those okay, well, was, it, was a, a false, a false green. Okay. Apparently, it's, it's not, not relevant. haven't been told which one that was uh, all right it was just before midday they sent a green via the feed the timing feed and it went straight back to yellow two seconds later mistake we think uh, pushing green rather than the commence split so I'm button. not, not going to count that if you don't mind no no I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy for that I just couldn't understand why the difference was uh, let's go down to Shea Adam in the pit lane. Fuel only for all of the Cadillacs and the pit close light is on. Everybody noticed Tom Longfist was the only Acura to come in, which means Philippe Albuquerque stayed out. I uh, did see Pippa Durrani up on the wall, though. Whelan Engineering not coming back through that time. It's a big traffic wait at pit exit. It is going to be the 60 leading out the 02, then the Ally Cadillac, and then the 01, the other Cadillac racing entry, and then the number five with now the 38 performance deck. Uh, no, Oh, sorry, that's the 40 Fast MP LMP3 machine joining them as well. But I do see Pippo up on the wall. Ah, there we go. Now the Whalen Engineering Cadillac is in. That is four tires and a Pippo change. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't arguing with you there, Jeremy. I just wanted to know the, the reason for the, uh, for the discrepancy. And thank you uh, for Absolutely. passing that on down from timing and race control. Yeah, so I, we're, we're, I'm going to count one less. Correct. From from here yeah, on. Yeah, one in. fewer. Absolutely. Fantastic. So number 31 car in again then with absolutely no gain. Not quite sure what the. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly like to know what the reasoning was for that extra stop there for number 31 car. Uh, it certainly didn't. Thanks didn't, to Lee Triggers for that. Gain uh, Yes, that's uh, a question that Shea Adam, who is down there, can ask uh, from the Whelan team. So, the rhythm of the race rather disrupted. Uh, people to Rani now in the 31 car. Still not quite comfy in the car. He's just shuffling himself around and making sure that all the wires are plugged in. He's got his helmet cooler in, his lap straps. Clearly not quite as comfortable as he wants them. And he pulls down the belts to get himself sorted out and plugs in his radio cord. So that was a very, very fast change for those guys. Sitting in behind the CT4V. The Blackwing Watkins Glen edition. Yes, by the way, if anybody asks, we would love to do a real world road test on that car. I just the wish to bring them to Europe. They are such a good car. At IMSA Radio, by the way, if you'd like to get in touch with us, tell you what, let's do a, a quick VP Racing in-race update before uh, we go back to green. Philippe Albuquerque, uh, he is leading for Konik Manalka Acura, uh, and he has uh, a whole bunch of LMP2 cars behind him. They'll get waved out of the way. Number 66 car, the gradient... NSX going behind the wall to try and diagnose their issue. In LMP2, it's high class racing that leads LMP3 performance tech, the number 38, so 20 in LMP2, 38 in LMP3. Uh, and in the GTD Pro, Heart of Racing still to stop. Well, just in the pits now for Ross Gunn, he's followed him by Ben Barnica in the number 14 Lexus, staying out. Connor De Filippi in the BMW, so he will assume the lead. And in GTD, it's Richie Highstand that leads from Michael Dynan in the number 96. So 12 Vassar Sullivan Lexus from 96 BMW and 32 GTD is the team caught up. Stephen McAleer, number 32, and Shea Adam has more pit stops. It's fuel and tires for Ross Gunn. He is not pulling himself out of that Aston Martin as of yet. Cooper McNeil is, however, out of the Mercedes. Fuel only for the Lexus. That's the number 14. Fuel only for the Corvette. And fuel only for the 
back Porsche as the red light is on at the pit exit. And there we go. Now it goes green. Barnico was the first car already through the Michelin RFID readers, but he did come to a stop. So a little bit of a change up as far as the GTD Pro Order is concerned. But I do like the fact that Ross Gunn still thinks he can drive this whole race by himself. Poor Alex Ribeiris. Yeah, yeah, and of course that, that Aston Martin needed a lot more fuel than everybody else that came in right now, so that's why it has shuffled its way somewhere back down the order. All those other cars, number 14, 32, 39, uh, and 62, they'd already been in, you know, not long ago. Only really, you know, a, a couple of green flags and about 10 laps under under safety car. And the point that Jeremy's making there, if you're not following along, the thing that almost always takes the longest time is putting the fuel in. That really in terms of your pit stop should be your determining factor you should be able to get your driver done you should be able to get all four tires done uh, if you need to in the time that you're taking your fuel if you've short fueled or if you're coming in for a, a splash then either you don't change tires you probably don't change drivers or you only change two drivers uh, two tires uh, on the car because you do not want to be sitting on pit lane with nothing happening to that car. If you're bolting on a wheel or something like that, you're wasting time. So fuel and how much time it takes for the fuel to go in. And there is a mandated time for each of the classes from IMSA as to how long a full fill of fuel, try saying that five times quickly after a big night out, a full fill of fuel uh, should Even actually- Without that. Jeff. It's well indeed, <laughs> uh, should take uh, sitting on the pit lane. That is part of the balance of performance for each of the categories. Now, you might think, well, surely, you know, everybody's taking the same amount of fuel. That's not quite true because some cars burn fuel at a different rate. And so in order not to uh, disadvantage them, um, then the uh, fuel time, the fuel fill time is set to each cars from empty to full. Uh, and then there's a time set for that in each individual category. Try to make it the levelest playing field possible. And that means the pit crew know exactly how much time they have got to sort out anything else that needs doing, whether that's a driver change, set a new Michelin tyres or whatever. Pipo Durrani just making sure all his vents on his helmet are open. He's put the visor down, interestingly, even though he is driving a, in a closed cockpit car. Got the reflective, but not very dark visor on in that car. Big shade band uh, on the top of the Cadillac windscreen though, which will help him. Sun pretty high in the sky now with the local time at just after midday, quarter past, 15 minutes past midday here. So high noon, noon about 15 minutes ago. Still a very pleasant day. A bit of cloud bubbling up towards the south as in comes the, L the rest of the prototypes as the class split is starting for DPI. Shea Adam. Watching the driver change going on in the LMP2 world, first and foremost for Aero Motorsport. This is intriguing. They're putting Razzle Dazzle in. That's Ryan Dial. For the 81 Dragon Speed car, Henrik Hedman is out. It is Juan Pablo Montoya who's taken over there. That was not Sebastian. We've got a driver change for the 11 and the 52, both PR1 Matheson Motorsports cars. Stephen Thomas out of the 11. It's Josh Pearson in. And for the 52, Ben Keating out. I believe that was Mikkel Jensen getting in as well, which means that jumping ahead of the queue, the 29 Racing Team Nederland and the 20 High Class Racing, I did not see driver changes for either of those two cars. Now, we'll give you the update just before uh, the, uh, just before the pit stops, we'll give you another VP Racing Fuels update before we go back to green. Jeremy, you're looking perplexed. Well, I am a little bit because why didn't, all these cars come into the pit there with the other prototypes. Come Were they getting the laps back? I'm just putting that out there. No, because they were everywhere else. I guess they're just taking on a splash of fuel um, while, the, while the, the fuel gets itself sorted out. Yeah. I, I don't like to see you that perplexed, no, Mr. Uh, Shaw. I, I wasn't expecting to see that, that many cars uh, take advantage of that, but you're just looking for a splash of fuel again. You're looking towards the three hour mark in the race uh, because we're now, where are we in the race? We're now, we're, we're over halfway toward the first tranche of points, yeah. which will be the three hour mark. So 
Uh, from here, you know, you've got to assume it's going to go green from here. Uh, and uh, with with uh, two more pit stops, they will be able to get to that three-hour mark from here. Already almost a, an hour of full course yellow. Mm. That's twice as much as we've had green flag running. Just uh, underlining how untidy the first part of this uh, race has been. But really, nothing... Uh, I don't think anything that uh, race control could have done differently in terms of the incidents that we've seen. Uh, the question is, why does it take so long? Always, of course, and I know there's plenty of you asking this on uh, at IMSA Radio. When you've got five different classes, you've got to try not to disadvantage anyone in any yeah, of the classes. It, it should, doesn't really matter how many classes you, you have. You've still got just the two laps on which to make pit stops. Of course, the... One of the problems here, of course, is it takes, you know, how long is it? Three, three and a half better, minutes. Better, half, better part of four minutes, yeah, for, for a, the, the pace car can run. Three, yeah, but the weird buys... Three, three and a half yesterday, so... The weird buys in the pass around take at least another lap as well, Correct. which if you were a single category, you wouldn't have to have to do all that. The resetting of the, the field is uh, something that is particular to American style of racing, and it does bunch everybody back up. It also means that there's an opportunity for people who are laps down. Um, to get laps back, which uh, is a feature of this racing, and that is the strategy that we were talking about in our keys to the race, to be able to use what the race gives you. And Joe talking to John Church from JDC Miller Motorsport in our Mission and Countdown to Green, and I bet he's already on to about plan Y now. <laughs> he said he expected to be on plan D after the first 10 minutes. Uh, it is uh, a true statement that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Well, no race plan survives the first half an hour with two full course yellows either. And that is uh, why these guys on the pit lane are doing just as much work as the drivers. And just in a slightly different way, they are recalculating with four hours and 20 minutes to go they'll already be looking at how many pit stops and when they have to take them and when you're in the window for the next one. Talking to some of the race engineers at Le Mans, for the LMP2 cars, they were pitting every 32 minutes and four laps in at Le Mans, which is about 12 minutes, a little bit more than that, maybe 14 minutes into the stint. So let, fewer than halfway through your stint, uh, you're already in the window if a safety car or slow zones come out. And that's exactly the same sort of calculations that the guys on the pit wall will be doing here, Jeremy, working out, right, do we come, do we not come? There's a, a sort of an if, if we're so far through the stint, yes, we'll come. But also you've got to look, fortunately, you've got to look at what everybody else is doing as well and make sure you're not disadvantaged by some, someone doing something a bit cheeky that might play out, in this case, you know, three and a half hours down the road. Yeah, which is which is really my, my point there about those, those cars not coming in when the other prototypes came in a couple of laps ago. Uh, it's certainly a little bit uh, cheeky there, and, but it hasn't cost them anything, uh, and particularly because we've got an, an extra lap of yellow than we... Well, whatever. Yeah. So after the reset of the field, keep an eye on the lights of the safety car, which are now out, Jeremy. So get ready to go racing again. Yeah, good. Um. So I said we'd do a quick rundown. Connick Minolda, Acura, Philippe Albuquerque, 10, 60 and 0, 2. That's the Acura in second of Shank Racing. Then the first of the Cadillacs, Earl Bamba, Jimmy Johnson in fourth in the 48 after that pit stop turnaround. Remember, they struggled with a fuel connection and lost ground before. They made it up this time because they didn't have to put as much fuel in. So the Ally Cadillac is up to fourth with JJ behind the wheel. Then Porte in the 0-1, Fortier in the 5, and Pipo Tarati in the red and white number 31 car. Yeah, so the gainer, the gainer in this round of pit stops 
uh, ironic it was number 48 car because they, they came in for a splash after the slow early stop and this is why they they did that because this time they needed a little bit less fuel and able to get back a couple of those positions particularly number 31 car oddly making two stops during this caution so the number 31 car having gained uh, some something of an advantage has now uh, tossed that away again so it's going to be at the back of the pack of the restarted cars. Leading LMP2, racing team Nederland. LMP3, Andretti Autosport, the number 36. GTD, Richie Highstand for Vassar Sullivan. And Ben Barnicott, also for Vassar Sullivan in the pro class with the 14 cars. We go back to green with four hours and 17 minutes still to go. Side by side, Jimmy Johnson under pressure, immediately Whoops. off the restart by Tristan Fortier. They're toughing it out, going up the hill, and Vortier slips through on the inside, and here comes P. Portorani along the, alongside of the Seven Times Cup winner as they go through the drying agent from that huge, huge explosive engine blow from the Milner Motorsport car about 15 minutes ago. Yeah, so Jimmy Johnson's lost a couple of positions there, and uh, Pippa Durrani, uh, no problems there. Those two, the number 31 and the 48, both run by the same Action Express team, so uh, no problem there for Pippa Durrani to get ahead of Jimmy Johnson. Um, I saw a car running wide at Turn 1. It was one of the P3 cars. I'm not so sure it wasn't Jared Andretti, who, who'd found himself in the lead of the class, despite running at the back early on, uh, uh, with a couple of dramas along the way. Uh, but uh, he is not only that, but in fact, the two LMP3 leaders, number 36, number 58, which is driven by Josh Sarche in that MLT Motorsports entry, uh, they're leading actually all of the LMP2 cars. Because yeah. a bunch of the LMP2s came in for another for last, splash yeah. before we went back to green, which is somewhat odd. Uh, so, that, so there's a big shuffle of the orders there amongst the prototype cars. In GTD, by the way, number 25 BMW leads. Uh, in GTD Pro, then it's four GTD cars. Number 12, which is Richard Highstand in the Vassar Sullivan Lexus, Michael Dine in the Turner Motorsport BMW number 96, then Stefan Wilson in the Hard Point Porsche ah, number 99, and Robert McGuinness in the number 39 Lamborghini for Carbon with Peregrine. Uh, and we're watching that car from on board the number, number nine Porsche, Manny Campbell couple of calls on penalties one rescinded for the number eight tower car not fulfilling emergency service requirements so that's been taken away but working on a kind of closed pitch for more than emergency services this is a stop and a 60 second hold a full one minute for the number 31 wheel and engineering car i thought that was a bit odd when that car yeah. came in we mentioned it at the time race control have taken the same view on that so people to rani is massively disadvantaged there not sure what was going on when they brought that car in and then brought it in again uh, for after it had only been out in the hands of Oli Pla for 16 laps most of which had been under yellow and this will be absolutely mind-bendingly annoying for people Durrani the Brazilian driver waiting he's got he got into this car after the offence for which it is now being penalised. At 60 seconds, standing still in the car with no air blowing through it, he's going to be hot and bothered, literally and metaphorically. He's waved away, he's going to lose the lead lap. Here comes the leader, he's going to lose the lead lap. Here comes Albuquerque. Durrani is rolling, but he must just be ahead of the leader. Yes, he is. He's about 15 cars lengths away. And this is a very important part of the race. If Philippe Albuquerque can put that number 31 a lap down, that is one of the major contenders that he's put 3.4 miles behind him into the inner loop now. And Durrani's going to have to drive the lap of his life. His Michelins will have cooled down. Hardly got them up to temperature after the restart anyway. I suspect they knew that penalty was coming and Albuquerque closes in down into turn six through the laces of the boot towards the tour. And Durrani will start be starting to get temperature and pressure in those Michelins. It is quite warm on the track at 113 Fahrenheit or 45 Celsius. Somebody's been off onto the dirt on the way out of the S's and there's a big plume of dust left in the air. I think that was the Riley Motorsports number 74 trying to go by. 
Jared jinked Andretti. out to the right. Oh, and, and hit the back of the Andretti car. Well, he was squeezed onto the grass, wasn't he? I the think he car. was. It looked as though Jared Andretti moved in, and he's got bodywork flapping around at the back there. He's lost that cheese wedge again from the back of the car. Did he move in response? That's what race control will be looking at. There's defending, which is fine. But if you move in response to somebody else, that's defined as blocking. That decision will have to be made by race control. Four hours and 12 minutes to go. Albuquerque looking at the back of people Durrani as Dylan Murray has reset the LMP2 fastest lap of the race in the racing team Netherlands. Orica, that's the number 30, uh, 29 car, yellow and blue with the Jumbo Supermarkets sponsorship. Fastest lap of the race, Tom Blomqvist, by the way, still holds that in the number 60, 131.638. So now, what are the guys telling Philippe Albuquerque? Do you go for it? Do you not go for it? It'd be nice to put the wheel and car a lap down, but not surely with any risk of throwing away the lead, Jeremy, that they have at the moment. It's risk versus reward here. Yeah, absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll be, they'd, they'd love to, but uh, he's not going to take any risk to do so, as you, as you suggest there. Uh, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what sort of pace uh, these cars set, I think. Uh, but, um, yeah, that was a, uh, a major blunder there. They're lucky to, to, to be able to stay on the lead lap. Uh, the two Barely. cars have had those sort of penalties. Uh, 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 both been lucky. Number 11 car was lucky because the caution came out as it was serving its penalty. So because everybody slowed down on this lap, it didn't go a lap down to everybody else. And the number 31 car, yeah, he had to hustle. He's just about made it um, without losing a lap. And the Jared Andretti, Andretti Autosports car, has been assessed for incident responsibility with that number 74, forcing him onto the grass. That'll be a drive through there. I don't know whether it's the heat, Jeremy, whether it's the fact we haven't done a long distance race for a while, but the amount of particularly pit penalties that we've seen and mistakes in the pits, we talked about it in the Porsche keys to the race, but the, it does seem to have been particularly heavy uh, in the first, what, hour, couple of hours of the race. GT battles. Inception McLaren going yeah. through on the inside. Two McLarens together yeah. there. Great to see the two 720s. Here comes the Jared Andretti car down the pit lane to serve that penalty. Effectively, that's for blocking. It's been called incident responsibility. There was no uh, accident that happened, although they've lost a bit of bodywork. So there was contact. Pushing over to the right hand side when the Riley Motorsports number 74 had a run on them. Ah! Now, that was from earlier on, we're now being led to believe. This was the AWA car incident responsibility for driving into the back of Ori Fadani and pushing him around. That was quite some time ago, but we've had quite a lot of uh, yellows to deal with in race control, and they'll be working through all the incidents. So that might be the first of a couple of drive-throughs that we are yet to see for Andretti and that number 36 car. Yeah, he's going to be lucky if he doesn't get another one for, for that uh, incident, as you say, with number 74. A couple of other notes here. Number 01 has passed number, number 02 on the uh, third lap after the restart, so last time on lap 47. 01 ahead of the 02, so Bourdais ahead of El Bamba again. And he's going to try and track down those two leading Acuras. Some super battling in... Uh, and the leaders coming through There's it, the Jeremy. Coming, weaving their way through. Also, the uh, Dylan Murray is pulling away from Fabio Shearer in LMP2. He's also passed Jimmy Johnson's DPI car as Dylan Murray. He's got the bit between his teeth. Reset the fastest lap of the race in P2 a little while ago for Racing Team Netherlands. That Oregon LMP2 car uh, looking very strong indeed. People to Rani really making the best of the GT traffic there to put some real estate between himself and Philippe Albuquerque in LMP3. Kai van Berlo behind the wheel of the Riley Motorsports number 74 has just set the fastest lap of that category. 141.7 for the man who is leading 
Porsche Carrera Cup North America presented by Visit Cayman Islands.com. Now, the lead has come down just a, a little bit, I think, between Philippe Albuquerque and Tom Blomqvist as they're both going through the traffic. Often the case, although Philippe Albuquerque is getting a little bit of a helping hand here from Pete Durrani because he effectively is letting all of the other cars know that the leaders are coming through. He's on the end of the lead lap, remember. At 138.60 the last lap for the race leader, Philip Albuquerque. His previous lap, 131.96. So seven seconds, basically, he lost, weaving his way through that traffic. That's, again, why we talked about earlier on patience uh, being the key here. You want to make sure you get through that traffic cleanly. And you see the cars, they're moving left and right as they work their way around the GCD cars. This is really scary on a, a snake track such as this it's really difficult and this is why it's so mentally taxing because yeah. you want to have your wits around you at all times and that applies not just to the leaders working their way through the traffic but also the traffic you know the slower cars they've got to make sure they try and stay out of the way of the leaders and uh, all of that uh, oh uh, yikes that's a big crash for number 13. Yikes. yeah what, both sides wiped off the awa orlando car this will be a full course yellow four hours and Six minutes to go, and we're, I'm afraid, into another full course yellow. Lars Kern behind the wheel, yep. and already the Porsche Cayenne is there with traffic coming around. And that is, is that the exit of turn one, Jeremy? I think yeah, it is. Again, I think. Doesn't seem to like LMP3 cars, does it? Turn it's, one. It certainly has a bit of a magnet for LMP3 cars today. Yes, he's just on the exit of turn one, halfway to turn two, actually. Wipe both sides off that car, and that'll be the end of the day for AWA. And that's really unusual for Lars Kern. He's an exceptionally... Oh, no, don't do that. One of the Lexus. They're being waved to the... Well, not sure this is very smart here. They were being waved around the other side of the accident, but one car goes to the left and then splits the safety vehicles. And then, of course, everyone else has followed them through. It was the Lexus, uh, one of the Lexus that uh, went through first of all. I think they wanted them to go to the right-hand side. Maybe there's a bit of debris there. that uh, they've now seen. Looks like a Formula, an old Formula One car from the 1980s from above with the all of the bodywork wiped off over the top of the wheels and the bits in between the wheels looking like side pods an old copper Sioux car from above there with the uh, low drag package on and no front wings as the field goes through very slowly dangerous times for the safety workers there Lars Kern extracts himself from the remains of the AWA car was sitting in eighth position when the accident occurred in its category. Uh, Lars got out on his own, didn't need any assistance. Let's uh, go down the pit lane. We'll use uh, this caution as the opportunity to pick up some more driver interviews. Shea Adam is down uh, at the number 11 PR1 Matheson Motorsport pit with Stephen Thomas. Lamont winner, Stephen Thomas. That's something that will be tethered to your name forever and ever going forward. Coming back into your LMP2 car in IMSA, though, did it pinch you for a minute to remember that the last time you'd driven an LMP2 it was around Lasarth? It really did. Uh, one thing, when I came here, so many people came up to me to congratulate me, people I knew, people I didn't know. Uh, it's starting to sink in what a big, big deal that is. It was a ton of fun. And it's cool that you and Ben Keating, your sister car teammate, also got a win in the same year. Yeah, we were on the podium together, you know, in different classes, which was a lot of fun. And I've told this story before the race. Ben sat with me and went corner by corner, you know, and which was a big help. Uh, so, you know, we're not teammates over there, but we he still worked together and then we're teammates here. And he put on quite the show in qualifying yesterday. Uh, more pace to come, but of course you're in this for the full season championship. So has Ben issued you any words of wisdom as to try and follow in his footsteps from last year? Yeah, he told me go just a little bit slower than him. Uh, but we had, no, we had a fun. We, he was very kind. We were just talking about this off the air. He just told me that my pass of him around the outside of the carousel was the pass of the year. Very generous by Ben Keating to say that. And so far, coming back to this track, this is the one that you won at last year. Fond memories racing at Watkins as well? Yeah, we won here last year, and uh, I think 
last year it was the other way around. It was like .00 something in qualifying too. So uh, it was a lot of fun last year and we had good memories. We're hoping to turn around to another victory today. Hopefully for the team we'll be one too. Are we going to see you in the car again the rest of this race? I don't think so. I think my drive time is over, and I think in a little bit they're going to, we got the kid in there now who's, you know, super fast, and then we're going to put the veteran JB in there, and uh, well, I couldn't be happier to have them racing with us. But on the other side of the garage, you know, those guys are great too, Huffaker and Jensen. So, you know, Ben and I are fortunate to be going with such great pros. Stephen, thanks for the chat. Good luck the rest of the way. Thanks so much. Well, we're under another full course caution, and it's for a very, very big accident for Lars Kern, has destroyed the number 13 AWA prototype, and he was sharing with Karl Marcelli, the Canadian, and Ori Fadani, two Canadians, and the German there, the AWA Orlando Corporation machine. Now, that is a car that is meant to be racing next weekend uh, at Canadian Time Motorsport Park. As I say, it looks more like a single-seater from the 1980s. Every single part over the top of the wheels has been ripped apart. Look, Jeremy, as though Lars just got offline going through Turn 1. Not a massive uh, uh, we've seen other people do it right up the curves, but the curves spat him off to driver's right to a big impact uh, on the guardrail on the right-hand side there and wiped off all four corners of the car pretty quickly. Kind of looked like he had a bit of a tank slapper, maybe going over the um, over the curbs on the exit, and he, you know, the car snapped one way, then the other, and he can't, caught it, didn't catch it, caught it, didn't catch it, and, and then the car was history. It just spun off there to the inside and made very, very heavy contact with that inside fence. And uh, so that was uh, you know, just kind of un you know, super unfortunate for that team. It's, that number 13 car has been involved in a few scrapes today already. Or if it had had a couple of misses or near misses, he was being, wasn't he the car that was dive bombed uh, in turn one earlier on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wicker Bill asking uh, how many laps the safety car has led uh, this race. I can tell you that. Stand by. Uh, because if I pull up the session statistics, I can tell you it has led 19 laps. That's how many yellow laps uh, we've had so far. For just over an hour and eight minutes in terms of race time. I think the more frustrating thing for the teams is that they're not able to get a real read on what's going on on the track and how the cars are performing because we're not getting any long runs we've not had a single long full fuel run have we in terms of a full green run pass around is starting so the CT4V the Glen Watkins Glen edition in its very pleasant blue colour. It's almost RSL jacket blue. How many laps did you say? 19, I think. Yeah, yeah, we, we've we've just about had more green laps than than uh, yellow, but not by very many. But 20, um, 28 laps of tw 20. Of yeah, uh, of green, I should say. Yeah, 20. Yeah, we'll complete 28 when it, they come around this time around, and 19 laps of of yellow. Obviously, the yellow laps take a lot longer. The math so, isn't right. There. We've had 51 in total. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. All right. Let me reset that then. So probably more. Problem is, I can't get the, ah. There's the errant. At least now I found the errant green. All right, we have tw tw 21 Tw laps, laps of yellow, of yellow. 30 yeah. of green. 51, 52 laps now in the books for our race leaders. And it's still the two Acuras there. The only two cars have led this race. We've had just two changes of lead uh, so far. Not including, of course, that one on the uh, on the first lap. Yep. Yeah. Because. Uh, 
the change already happened before the end of that first lap, so I don't, I don't count that one as a change of lead, although I probably should do. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you can see, you know, the lap one leader was uh, is is the first leader of the race officially, uh, and uh, the you know, so number ten and sixty have traded lead a couple of times. Sebastian Bourdais has, has managed to find himself back up into third place, then having overtaken the number zero two of Earl Bamba. Uh, shortly after the restart, and then uh, a couple of laps before we went to yellow again, Tristan Vautier also found a way past Earl Bamba while they were negotiating that traffic. So it's the uh, number five car up into fourth position now, ahead of the number zero two. Then we've got the LMP2 leader, Dylan Murray, and then Jimmy Johnson, who um, is running next ahead of the, a train of LMP2 cars led by Fabio Shira in the high-class racing, car number 20, Ryan Diel in number Era Motorsport, car number 18, Mikkel Jensen in the car number 52 for PR1 Matheson Motorsports, then Juan Pablo Montoya driving number 81 car for Dragon Speed USA, Rui Pinto de Andrade, car number 8 for Tower Motorsport, number 11 is the youngster, or the kid, as Stephen Thomas called him, Josh Pearson, 16-year-old in number 11. Um, then it's the LMP3 cars, led by the MLT Motorsports car number 58 of Josh Sarche, followed by Kai Van Berlo, who's had a great weekend already with two wins in the Porsche Carrera Cup North America to extend his championship points lead. He's driving number 74 car for Riley Motorsports. Then number 30, of the, another youngster, Nolan Siegel, driving for the Junior 3 racing team in number 30. Number 54 is George Kurtz for Core Autosport. Number 38 is Cameron Shields for Performance Tech Motorsports. And then the, the last of those mm. trade of cars is Max Hanratty, yeah. who is in car number 40 for Fast MD. The only other cars on the lead lap are the are Pipa Durrani, number 31, who uh, this caution is certainly excellent news for him because he's going to make up that ground that he had lost with that penalty. And Jared Andretti, who had that drive through and just able to maintain the lead lap as well. So those are all the cars on the lead lap. Behind that is all the GTD cars, led still by Conor Di Filippi in car number 25, leading pro as well. And then behind him is the best of the non-pro cars, Richard Highstand for Fassel Sullivan, car number 12, and Michael Dynan in for Robbie Foley in number 96, turning most what BMW, getting ready to go back to green. It's the VP Racing Fuel in race update from Jeremy Shaw. Green flag is in the air. Philippe Albuquerque weaves left and right. He's clear of the rest of the field as we go back to green. 19 minutes and six seconds is the longest green flag segment we've had so far. Come on, people. Let's see if we can get a full green flag stint in. 54 minutes and 30 seconds to the Michelin Endurance Cup points being awarded at half distance. We've gone through the first third of the race. And very quickly back onto it is the 0-2 of Earl Bamber. He's having a look at the back of Tristan Vautier in the number five Mustang sampling JDC Miller Motorsports car into the pit lane for Jared Andretti. That's for a drive through, I presume. Ross Gunn into the pit lane as well. That'll be a driver change in the heart of racing. Aston Martin. Fuel only and driver change, no tyres. Bamba down the inside. He's alongside the number five car into turn number eight. Last of the lip breakers will take this one. Fortier misses out. And through goes the 0-2, the black front with the very dark red metallic middle and hind quarters on that Earl Bamba driven 0-2 Chip Ganassi Cadillac. Strong move from the Kiwi. Got that one done really with the drive out of turn seven, the toe of the boot. Got more than halfway along before they got into the braking area, then just released the brakes at the apex and cruises through. Did give Fortier room though. That was fair. Now he sets off after Sebastian Bourdais, his teammate. 
Josh Burden has taken over the Andretti Autosport number 36. So that was a pit stop there for that car. I, I, I'm still waiting to see if they're going to get another drive through. They've had one for the contact with the with the AWA car, wasn't it, early on? If that might have been at the start of the problems for Lars Kern, because it was on that left rear corner. So if something broke there as he went across the kerb, maybe that's what tipped him into the barriers. Because that was uh, that was quite a, a, sto a stern hit. And then he clipped the barriers as well on the, the driver's left. Meantime, high class racing, red and white with the Racing for Netherlands, blue and white jumbo car right in behind it. So that is a change because Fabio Shearer did get past Dylan Murray then at the restart and now hot on their tail is Mikkel Jensen in the pole sitting car number 52. Trade of cars there with also Ryan De Yell in that mix and uh, Juan Pablo Montoya and Rui Pinto in, and De Andrade as well. So a train of cars there in LMP2. In LMP3, uh, Josh Sarche has lost the lead now to Kai Van Berlo who leads LMP3 in number 74. That same car won both races here last year. Good work by the 81 Dragon Speed team. Remember, there were three wheels on their wagon earlier on when the left front wheel made its bid for freedom. It's tried to get onto the infield, but they weren't too far away from the end of the lap. But that happened between turn seven and turn eight and turn nine. And so they were just a couple of laps away from getting the car back in, restored to healthy white with uh, red and blue, the Evil Knievel leathers type livery. Those of you with a long memory will know what I'm talking about there. White with the blue band with the white stars. Absolutely think of that as Evil Knievel. Can't see that car without uh, thinking of that great showman. Down into turn six for that battle at the moment. Conor de Filippi still leading GTD Pro from Ben Barnicott. The Lexus have been strong today. Uh, between de Filippi and Barnicott is the other Lexus, the GTD leader. Richard Highstand keeping pace with the two Pro cars. And again, make the point, the performance potential of the GT Daytona cars identical. It's the drivers that make the difference, and that's what uh, makes the difference as well in their categorization to whether they are GT Daytona or GT Daytona Pro. Another 10 minutes of racing ticked off. Three hours and 50 minutes exactly to go from Watkins Glen on Sirius 207 around North America, around the world, on RS2, IMSA Radio via the player or via imsaradio.com. And if you're outside the US and your territory does not have a network TV deal, then you can watch the international, the world TV feed as well via imsaradio.com. Just uh, scroll up to the top left-hand side and you will see the live video button on there. And we don't interrupt the action for anything. all the way through from start to finish. And don't forget, when the chequered flag drops, that ends the race, but it starts our conversation about it. Michelin post-race tech, the original uh, listener, edited show, I suppose, directed show. Your questions, please, to at IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT. Observations from this week, from today, questions, points arising, whatever you'd like. Throw it in there, uh, Jeremy, myself and the team will try and answer it for you. Always tend to get a few driver interviews in there as well as we're uh, patrolling the paddock around the Victory Circle area and she and Joe will be on duty for that as well tonight. That's straight after the race coverage here on RS2 IMSA Radio. New fastest lap of the race last time around. A 130.790, so just under 91 seconds for Philippe and Albuquerque. The uh, temperatures, uh, a moderate 47 degrees now. Well, that sounds rather silly, doesn't it? But uh, that has uh, been far higher than that uh, this week. 
that is 86 Fahrenheit. The, the humidity, which was 73% earlier on, has dropped down to 55. That's still pretty sticky. 117 Fahrenheit on the track, which is 47 Celsius, 30 degrees in the air, that's 86. So, around the circuit then, the big battle we were watching was whether Philippe Albuquerque could uh, stay ahead and on the lead lap, well, uh, sorry, whether people Durrani could stay ahead and in the pits is the leader. And I'm not sure how this works out, Jeremy, for the leader. Tom Blomquist has now gone through into the lead. So the number 10, Conning and Minolta Acura, Philippe Albuquerque. That's 30 laps, but with three tranches of yellow there. Let's go down to the pits and pick up this report. And a pat on the back from Ricky Taylor to Philippe Albuquerque as Philippe jumps out of the Acura and Ricky jumps into it. That was very well deserved as Philippe did a great stint. This is four tires and fuel and the driver change for Conic Minolta and their Acura. And the car is on a downhill slant, so Ricky needs to keep his foot on the brake. Actually, no, crew members holding on to the rear wing as Ricky now rests the car into life and away he goes. about 46 minutes remaining until a three hour mark in a race so uh, that number 10 team reckons uh, excuse me yeah number 10 team reckons they can get to that mark with this person they didn't need to come in now they've got plenty of fuel on board that car but come in for top it off and uh, absolutely brim full and uh, they will be uh, well of course caution would help them now but they, they've made that stop and they reckon they can get to the end to the end to the three hour mark uh, from here uh, and that will serve them well. If there is a full course caution and the pits are closed, that they will cycle through to the front and they'll be golden from there on in. But to everybody, all, all the cars in DPI do need to make a pit stop before that uh, three hour mark in this race. And they're the first to do so. Uh, effectively, they're looking at this as two separate races, as Jeremy said before. And remember, the reason for this is the Michelin Endurance Cup points awarded at half distance. It, it has made the difference in the past between who has won the championship and who hasn't. So they're looking now, to, effectively what they've done is made their last pit stop in the first half of the race. That's the idea. I always say those people who can make their last pit stop first, well, they're looking at two, three hour portions of this six hours, the sail and six hours of the Glen to get those additional points that are awarded at the interim three hour mark. So they've dropped down for the moment. That number 10 car uh, down to 14th position behind pretty much all seven of the LMP2 cars. But Ricky Taylor in the car for the first time, remember, Philippe Albuquerque has driven all the way to the two hour and 15 minute mark. Taylor, though, in what they have done is they've put him out in a really lovely gap uh, just ahead of the number 74 Riley Motorsports LMP2. And the next car in front of them is the Andretti Autosport number 36. And as the number 10 Conning and Minolta Acura goes into turn six, the 36 is just cresting the brow and heading into turn eight. So this is going to be a pretty decent lap for Ricky Taylor new, brand new sticker Michelins and a full tank of VP racing fuel and tapped on the head and said, right, go on, off you go. And being able to dial himself in before he's hit any, hit any traffic. Sean Olmstead saying, dear Watkins Glen, can the six hours be on a Saturday next year and finish at night? Ooh, bit of night racing, no lights around here. It would be very dark, but then again, this time of the year, it takes a long time to get darker. You'd have to finish at 11 o'clock to get any darkness at this time of the year. But yes, I like the idea. Jerry Z, trackside here, 
says the win of LMP3 could well be the car with the least damage. Not sure why P3s are having so much trouble. Yeah. Don't disagree with you. At all. Just waiting to see if we can grab a quick word with Philippe Albuquerque. Having done two hours and 15 minutes, but really not got into a rhythm. Interested to see what he says. Now, down the front straight, here's an opportunity for the 0-1. That is Sebastian Bourdais going for the lead. Round the outside at turn one, has to drop in behind. We'll do the switch back, though. Tom Blomqvist defending. Up the sweepers through the S's. And Blomqvist survives for the moment, but here comes the Cadillac. Bourdais smells blood. Faints to the right, goes to the left. Brilliant dive down the inside, can't get it done into the inner loop. Blomqvist very late on the brakes there, and here comes Earl Bamba catching these two as well. We'll keep an eye on that. Here's Philippe Albuquerque in the pit lane after two hours and 15 minutes in the Cunningham and Alt of which he led most of that race. Joe Bradley. Thumbs up from Wayne Taylor there, Philippe. Job good. Yeah, it's good to have a thumbs up from the boss, right? <laughs> yeah, so it was good fun out there. I mean, a lot of yellows in the second stint, which made things a bit different, uh, timing at the restart. Um, we are in a different strategy now, so we just need to keep fingers crossed that our strategy is better than the others. That was a great race at the start of this, uh, this event. You guys were really going for 100%. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the beauty of IMSA. Like, uh, it's six hours, but uh, it's like a sprint race every time you go in the car because track position is so crucial. And once you are there, you try to save some fuel for the pit stops and so on. We could see that the Shane car passed me on a pit stop just because they went on a little bit different strategy to get the position. Then we went on a different strategy as from everybody staying out. So now we need to wait and see when the yellows are coming for us to be ahead of the others. And as a driver, when you've be, you know, you get into a floor and then out comes another yellow, you get back into the floor. It must be really hard to keep the keep the psychology of what you're doing. It is, but uh, you know, like I, I always say that in racing, it's what it's cool about is like when the green goes down, the last one come, you know, is is a loser, right? So there is four yellows, five yellows. I mean, in the end, it's the same for everybody. You need to be, you know, ready to warm up the brakes, warm up the tires dive in on the first braking, counting with a pickup on the tires. Be aware that if you do a mistake, you're going to get passed by the other guys. It's about being spot on all the time and not, you know, not allowing a single mistake because that single mistake will make the other ones an advantage. And is the team strategizing towards the half distance points? I tell you what, <laughs> I push like hell and I trust them 100% because just now everyone pitted it. And they told me to stay out. They're like, hmm, I'm sure they know what they're doing. So are you sure it's to stay out? Because I felt like maybe I misunderstand. Like, no, no, we're staying out. OK, full trust on them as they are trusting on me. And you did two hours 15. That's quite, that's more than a gr Formula One Grand Prix distance. Uh, what do you do physically now to, uh, well, firstly, cool off, I would imagine? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, this is what is crazy about endurance racing. So me and Ricky are the cars that have two drivers only. We're going to be doing, each of us, two Formula One races in one week, one, 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 in six hours, which is kind of wild. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of demanding on fitness, but again, it's all about, you know, training harder, going, training at lunchtime at home when it's the hottest time, running out there. Um, I was, going to, I was going to ask Philippe, uh, Philippe if, you, if it did any special training. You've just answered that. In the heat of the day, you go running. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So especially for this one, I know this is the this is the toughest one of the championship. This is where the, we have the most Gs, lateral Gs, like the the carousel. We have three and a half Gs. Uh, follow before we have like a, a, a very quick bus stop in uh, fourth gear. So I, I train at home. I like to run in the heat, like when it's 30 degrees. Uh, then going on the bike, you know, close the windows, everything, so it's proper hot, and keep working on those temperatures, because that's what we have when we are in a car. Well, I'm going to let you go in and prepare for your next thing. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you. Into the pits comes the BMW number 25, which uh, has been running at a very, very sharp end. Conor de Filippi finally gets out of that car, doesn't take the steering wheel out, uh, and his...
he uh, is replaced in that car. This is the number 25. Felipe started that car. And already the driver is ready to go. And off he goes. Smart work by the RLL team. And it's a Gustav Farfus who's got in that car. Let's confirm that as he goes out of the pit lane. Yes, it is. In from fifth position, Tristan Fortier for JDC Miller and the Mustang sampling. As we have a track limits warning. Corvette lost laps during practice and qualifying. And again, it's the number three car. Uh, in GTD Pro, Jordan Taylor in second place at the moment. They've worked their way forward in GTD Pro, but it's the number five in at the moment. And that is, that looks to be well, something going on in the cockpit of the car there. Fuel still going in though, so no time lost. 29, call that 30 seconds stationary for the number five JDC Mustang sampling. Might be worth just sauntering down there and see what was going on there. As it rejoins, Richard Westbrook got into the car. Hello to Jess, who'll be watching and listening at home at just after six o'clock in the evening UK time. Straight onto the pace down there. So, Jeremy, again, are, are we looking there at the, the JDC uh, Miller car responding to, to what happened with the with the number 10 Conic and Minolta car, or were they about due anyway? Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, they want to be uh, in position. It is the number five car, actually, that leads the Michelin Endurance Cup right. coming into this race. Uh, uh, they are currently two points ahead of both number 10 car and the number 31. So that is the uh, the standings coming into this race. Pit stop also there for the number one BMW. 35 minutes to that first tranche of points. The number one BMW being the Paul Miller racing car. Madison Snow in that car. In that car now, at least. And uh, the first time Madison has been in that car. I think Change. he's just taken over from Eric Janssen. Yes, he has. Change of lead again in LMP2. Dylan Murray, Murray has got back ahead again of uh, Fabio Shearer. And both of them are bottled up behind uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson, who's fallen 20, nearly 25 seconds behind the rest of the uh, DPI cars. This is a pit stop for the second and third place cars and lap 66 and 25 minutes remaining until the top of the hour. And Joe Bradley Race is wise. at the Cadillac pit for the O2 Earl Bamber car, Joe. Yep, well, just bringing it on to pit road now, as you say that, just coming into his pit box around the O1, sister car, Earl parks it at my feet. It's going to be a driver change, Alex Lynn, just walk past Alex Lynn at the back, he's just preparing his helmet to take over from Earl, Earl steps out, Alex hops in, slots into that very confined space there, while the fuel, everything, everything happens at once in the IMSA pit stops, remember, fueling, tyres, driver change, everything at the same time. It's quite a dynamic choreograph that they go through, or choreography, I should say. So everything done, driver in, the tyres are on, and the other thing I love about IMSA is, oh, and a knit almost coming together with a Turner Motorsport BMW there, waved away by the team, right into the path of the Turner Motorsport. And of course, the uh, the Michelin tyre scanners only fit one car through at the same time, so you can't go out side by side. And the uh, it was Alex Lynn who deferred to the uh, the heavier BMW, no doubt, uh, but they've both made it out there. And I was about to say. Guys, the other thing I love about him pit stops is uh, you're allowed to wheel spin off the pit apron, which is, uh, you should be given a penalty if you don't, in my yeah, view. Yeah, absolutely right, Joe. The Turner car was already in the fast lane. Um, that may be seen as an unsafe release by the Chip Ganassi team. 
Uh, there was absolutely no way that that prototype was going to get in front of the BMW, which was just holding its line. It's the number 96 car, which had, uh, was just rejoining from uh, its pit stop. And that car has on board 96, Bill Orbelin on his way out. So Bill was never going to give way anyway. Main time, further back on the pit lane, the number 12 Lexus from uh, Sullivan, which is the leading car in its class. And mixing it up with the GTD pros as well. Richie Highstand was second GTD, actually, for quite a long time. His teammate, Ben Barnicott, has uh, assumed the lead. No, he's still in the lead, rather. No, no he's assumed the yeah, lead. Yeah, well, who stopped? Number 12 car was ahead of number 14. Oh, right, OK. Yep. Uh, they're in different classes, though, yeah? So Indeed. So where so was... GTD what's was ahead of GTD Pro. Yeah, um, I thought there was a... I thought there was a... It's up there for number 48, car Jimmy Johnson getting out already. That's Mike Rockefeller climbing aboard number 48 car. So Mike going back out again. Mike Rockefeller into that car. Ah, yeah. It's, uh, Augusto Farfus was leading, or at least the BMW was leading, wasn't it? The number 25. Yes, that and, pitted a couple of laps ago. Correct. That, yeah. that was what was throwing me out. Yeah. Because I knew Ben 12. wasn't leading GTD Pro when the last time I looked. Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The number 12 car was next in line behind. He was about three seconds behind yeah. Di Filippi before that pit stop. Correct. And, uh, but Heisland pulled out a couple of seconds over Ben Barnicott, so yeah. hats off to him in the GTD car ahead of his uh, pro teammate, Ben Barnicott. Yeah, I remember seeing at the time a perfect example of the performance potential of the car. Nothing to do with whether it's in GT or GTD Pro. It's down to the driver lineup in those cars. Yeah. Alain so, Cadillac back out on the track and now with Mike Rockefeller behind the wheel. So now the only uh, DPI car that has not yet pitted is the, uh, the, le the race leader now, car number 60, Don Blomquist, still at the wheel of that car. Just been a spin out on the circuit for the number 74, Riley, at turn number eight, but that has continued. We'll keep an eye on that as Joe Bradley brings us more from the pit lane. Richard Highstand. Uh, Richard, you must have took a lot of pleasure from overtaking the sister car. Say that again? You must have took a lot of pleasure from overtaking the team car. Ah, uh, well, you know, I'm just glad both of us were running up front. Um, you know, we've, uh, I think this year, uh, pace at some tracks has been a little bit of a struggle, and, 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 and here we, we seem to be on it good. Both of us had uh, a decent qualifying, and um, so far, so good in terms of, uh, you know, not making mistakes and being up front, and long way to go still in the race. Uh, hopefully, uh, I prayed to the, uh, the, 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 um, the caution gods. I sacrificed like a little small animal uh, to make sure that the cautions fall our way. There it is, everybody. Richard Eistan takes small mammals in the car with him. Thanks, Richard. He is only joking, by the way. No small mammals were hurt in the making of those cautions. Into the pit lane. Tom Blomqvist out. Oliver Jarvis into the number 60. Auto Nation. Sirius XM. Acura. Nice pit stop by the MSR team. The wide brown eyes of Ollie Jarvis getting up to speed straight away. He leaves his visor up, checks his left-hand mirror before he joins at the exit of the pit lane. And that was the car coming in from the lead. 57.4 seconds he was ahead of Ricky Taylor when he on the previous lap. So he then came into the pit lane and see where he is now in relation to Ricky Taylor. Of course, he was the first car to make its pit stop in this round of stops. Oh. A uh, full uh, t 11 laps ago. Uh, I said, oh, because the race control have just in issued a penalty drive through, a drive through penalty rather, to the number 12 Lexus for multiple track limits. Mm. Uh, and now it's come up as, a, as just a warning. 
Now let's wait to see if they rescind that original one or if that's actually two different things. One at 11 minutes and 53 seconds and one at 12 minutes and four seconds. So certainly though the number 12 has been noted for being off the track rather too many times. And this is the car that we were just talking about, Richard Highstand leading in GTD. He's handed the car over to, I think he said it was Frankie Monte Calvo who got into that car, yes it was. So, let's see if that uh, drive-through is rescinded for the 12, or if that is indeed two potential penalties, one warning and one drive-through. And that was a spin, wasn't it, for this number 74 it, car? It was a spin for the 74 yeah, car at turn it, eight and yeah, then continued. Indeed, that, and that was the LP3 leader, uh, so... Uh, He's, he's able to keep going again. It's a Riley Motorsport car. Yeah, I think he's... Uh, is that Kai Von Berlo? Yes, it, it is. It was, yeah. And, and he's, he still hasn't pitted, I think, compared to uh, most of the other cars in LMP3 that have made an extra stop. Well, but he's able to maintain the lead even with that spin. Yeah, that car's only had two pit stops behind them. Nolan Siegel for Junior 3 has had a three stop. The Andretti Autosport car, with its various penalties, has been down the pit lane five times. Josh Burden's in third position in that car. Uh, that's the Gilbert Kortoff Mercedes missing the chicane, or going through the uh, barriers at least, the number 32 AMG GT3. Now that car right at the very sharp end early on in the piece with Stephen McAleer driving it. Looked like it... Uh, just missed the breaking point, or was there some... Oh, no, got got a, a little nudge there from the 0-2. Now, that's interesting. That was Alex Lynn. I don't... Th oh, it's oh. front suspension damage for the 32. Championship leader. This is huge for the championship. Gilbert Cawthon beat be, uh, AMG, and it's Dirk Muller behind the wheel. I just, I'm not sure Dirk saw the prototype on the inside at all there. Alex Lynn had given him room and was driving up the inside. Clearly didn't have to brake at the same time as the heavy GT car. That's not just a tyre, Jeremy. That is a tall link or a suspension arm. And Dirk Muller, extremely experienced GT and endurance driver. That is heartbreak for the team that are leading in the championship. Well, well, 25 minutes to go to the first set of points. Yeah, in-room really set of points, and that is a disaster for them, Jeremy. Really is unfortunate for them. Uh, the uh, After those pit stops, by the way, the number 10 car was able to get back in the lead after the number pit stop by number 60, who resumed just ahead of Rega van der Zander yeah. in the number 01. Uh, so... Uh, uh, so it's still Ricky Taylor, or Ricky Taylor back in leading car number 10. In LMP2, there was a change last time around. Anders Fjord back for, for high class racing got past Juan Pablo Montoya for the lead of the class in LMP2. So number 20 ahead of number 81. Guido van der Garde right there as well in car number 29, the racing team Netherlands entry, and Michael Jensen in car number 52. So the number 32, Tim Kohoff Motorsport. Mercedes has made it back to the pits. and. Oh, I can barely bring the smoke billowing off that right from corner. Uh, the suspension is broken. It's as the wheel was taken off, the wheel was devoid of a tyre. The tyre's just completely destroyed itself, and the, uh, the the hub just fell over and was lying at 90 degrees to the angle it should be. So the team will now go to work, and it'll be suspension components that will be brought out. It's completely broken that front upright where it links to the top wishbone. Thank you, Joe. So, Ricky Taylor back at the head of the field then. That pitted 12 laps earlier than the Mayer Shank Racing with Kerr Magaccini in number 60. Tom Blomqvist then in the car for most of those 12 laps and Oli Jarvis uh, just jumping in and just getting up to speed there. So that tactic has worked there for the guys at Cunningham and Alder. They're back in the lead as we head towards the last 23 minutes of the 
run to the first set of uh, points for Michelin Endurance Cup. Yeah, but if there's no more full course caution here, 47 minutes is what they were trying to do on it with that number 10 car. That's pushing it. I mean, that really is pushing it. So uh, I think the number 10 car, yeah, I, I, I hope they weren't planning for a full course course. We've had so many during this race, oh, can't you can perhaps uh, forgive them for doing so. But they certainly came in quite a bit earlier than I would have anticipated. We'll have to wait and see now whether Ricky Taylor can stretch that fuel line to get to that three-hour mark and get those maximum points for the Michelin Endurance so having removed the right front wheel of the number 32 and have the suspension collapse, they've kind of pushed the suspension back where it should be, put the old wheel back onto the car, and the car's now making its way back around to go behind the wall. That's just too much for any kind of work to be done on the pit road. So the 32, the 32 car, sport car, has now uh, gone out and round the back, and. The, <laughs> Quite remarkable how we can still drive, to be honest, the, the destruction on that right front corner. That's the number 32, uh, the Colton of Motorsport AMG. Thank you, Joe. Donnell says, uh, Philippe Albuquerque, great interview as always. He's brilliant, isn't he? Yeah. He really just loves it. You can hear the smile on his face, you don't have to see it. Hello to Andrew Muggeridge, to Dave Alcock, to Plastic and Plasters. Nice way to spend the 55th birthday watching the six hours of the Glen and spending some time with Sarah Rigby as well. Hello to Racing Chocks, who were listening. Ooh, if only I had some. Hello to Otter, FR, and to Vincent Bruins. Watching the battle for LMP2, which is quite interesting, actually. And there's Fjord back, leading at the moment, but having a cracking battle with Juan Montoya and Guido van der Garde. Really interesting, even after that spin, that the 74 car is uh, still in uh, LMP3 as well. So, 20 minutes to the first of those points that we've been talking about. The cloud cover has come over again. That will uh, help the track temperature. Let's see if it drops down. 118 is where it is at the moment. Multiple track limits for the 96. That's the Turner Motorsport BMW. And that incident with the number 74 Riley car and the number 38, that was the little spin earlier on. That has been reviewed, no further action on that car, on that incident rather. So our very busy race stewards are getting through what's been going out on the track. Plenty of action for them to look at as well. I've got a feeling we are going to see some drive-throughs for track limits. There's been plenty of warnings handed out. Uh, Ricky Taylor leads then by 3.9 seconds from Ollie Jarvis in second. It's the 10 from the 60, the two Acuras. Perhaps as expected, always seen as a bit of a, an accurate track here in terms of the pace, but Acura have never won here. Even the great Penske, Team Penske Acura, didn't win here. Renga van der Zander, another 1.6 seconds further back for Cadillac Racing number 01 with Chip Ganassi. His teammate is another 10 seconds further back, that's Alex Zin Lin in the 0-2. And people to Rani coming back from a one-minute stop and hold. When his uh, teammate blew the red light, Wheel and Engineering Racing, number 31, in fifth position, 20 seconds away from the lead, Richard Westbrook 
38 seconds away from the lead for JDC Miller Motorsports, the dark grey and gold car. And Mike Rockenfeller is another 25 seconds further back from that in seventh position. But all the cars in DPI, in fact, all the cars down to 13th position are still on the lead lap. 13th would be Jonathan Bomarito, the sixth place car. PR1 Matheson Motorsport, that number 11. And that is the sixth place client LMP2. At IMSA Radio, if you'd like to get in touch and trailing ahead, we've got Michelin post race tech coming once the checkered flag has fallen. That'll be exclusively live on RS2 IMSA Radio. So we have had a decent amount of green flag running and some green flag pit stops as well. This is... I think this is the longest green flag we've had. Yes, it is. We're about a long way, yeah. yeah. This is what we like to see, the balance being set. We've got all the DPIs ahead of most of the LMP2s, ahead of most of the LMP3s. Then GDD Pro. GTD is the usual dogfight. Aston Martin and Mercedes at the front of the field. In GTD, Marvin Deans for Winwood. Number 57, it's rather stealth there, way to the front of the field there, but it's been good work by the Techamic sponsored number 57 car. Got the heart of racing, Aston Martin with Max Martin, Maxime Martin, the number 27 for company, about a second and a half. And in the pro category, it's still the Vassar Sullivan Lexus ahead of Corvette Racing. As Jordan Taylor just goes into second place ahead of David e. Regan for Racing Competizione. Corvette. Not qualifying too well, 16th off, sorry, 14th in the GT category. And, ah, and there is the first drive through. I said earlier on that Corvette had been rather, uh, rather remiss on the track limit kind of things. And they are going to get a drive through penalty. So that number three, Jordan Taylor, finally has attracted the attention once too often of race control, having just taken a position from Davide Regon. And in the second place, Regon Farisi down to third, still the Lexus 11 seconds up the road, but it will be a drive-through penalty for multiple track limits violations. The race control patience has finally run out. Yeah, very interesting because the, the, the Corvette had been holding off that Ferrari for a long, long, long time uh, and it was running wide on the trail limits in order to maintain that position, John. That is why the penalty was, uh, was caused because he had to run off the track all the time to maintain that position. This, that was the, the view of race control. Got you. Understood. So gaining advantage is what we're seeing there, Jeremy. It's not just about going off track and he's done it again at turn one. So using more than the track to gain advantage. Hello to Chris Sutu and to Dave Alcock, both enjoying the comments of Philippe Albuquerque. Dave saying family's comments on the lateral G-first and thermal challenges, interesting. I would have thought Daytona or the carousel at Road America would pull higher Gs. New surface here, I think, John. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and of course, Road America is due to be resurfaced uh, next winter as well. I tell you oh, what. Oh, really? Yeah, when we get My back goodness. there, uh, they've, they've just done some amazing improvements to that racetrack over the last several years, continuing to plough back the uh, the money into the racetrack. It's a fabulous facility. It always was tremendous, but uh, the sp for spectators now, it's even better. I mean, all the campsites, all the, all the toilets, all they're all new. Did you the say there was fencing, a new bridge new... by the carousel as well? Yeah, they've replaced that bridge yet. It's now a two-lane bridge ah. and room for also for pedestrians on either side. So, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant stuff. So, drive-through penalty for the second-place GTD Pro Car for continually going off-track, 
Turn eight, one of the places that has been monitored uh, and basically taken an advantage by going outside of the white line on the circuit. The white line is beyond the kerb. The kerbs form part of the track. The Ferrari just about keeping the right side. Michelin's on on the shot we've just seen, but that's one of many times that race control have been watching this. Correct, and there would have been a warning before that penalty. Oh, there was. Yeah, there exactly. was. There yeah. was a warning quite some time ago. Yeah. I remember talking about it and mentioning that they'd had laps deleted. That's right. Uh, from uh, the... Uh, from the... Brent Barnicott comes in then. Uh, in the Lexus RCF GT3, that is the lead car. So that has promoted the penalty... Uh, the car that will have to serve the penalty, the Corvette, into the lead. It's going to be four brand new Michelin tyres onto the number 14 Lexus. This is the lead GTD Pro car. They're waiting on the fuel, waiting for the fuel, excuse me, the VP Racing fuel going in. 12 minutes to points for Michelin Endurance Cup. Passenger door open. Probably changing a drinks bottle there, maybe doing some other work. Uh, data stick as well on that side of the car. Door is closed, hose is out, car is gone. Simple as that. And out through the... It was Kyle Kirkwood, by the way, that took over that car from Ben Barnegat. I saw Ben jump out. Ben's been in since the, the start of the race. Kyle Kirkwood, who won the race for them at, uh, at Detroit with two phenomenal laps before the pit stops and was absolutely superb. Uh, another warning, this time for car 42. And this is, again, this will be the final warning for track limits violations. And uh, therefore, next time it will be a drive-through for that number 42, uh, which is the... Uh, 42 is the NTE SSR. Here comes the Corvette for its drive through. Let's go to Joe Bradley, who has Davide Regon recently out of the Risi Competizione number 62. Davide just wiping the sweat away. Obviously, these GT cars very, very hot inside of those GT cars. Davide, how is the race going for the Risi Ferrari? Yeah, actually, yeah, quite hot in there, uh, but uh, there was a lot of safety cars, so it was not that bad. Uh, the car is going very well, uh, very good balance, but uh, we're uh, not so fast on the first sector, so actually it's difficult to overtake and to defend, but uh, we, when we are alone, we, are, uh, we have a good, very good pace. And I take it you will get in, back in the car before the end? Yeah, it should be now, I need to speak with my engineer, but now it's the turn of Daniel that uh, he will push maximum. The tyres lasting well, it's very, but the track temperature is really high, not quite the high as we've seen all weekend. But how are the tyres faring up? Yeah, yeah, well, the tyre was good uh, until the end, uh, just at the last few laps, I was start to struggling a little bit, but looks like uh, we, we manage better the tyre than the other car, so we're pretty happy about the managing tyre. Thank you, David. Jeremy, you were saying that the Corvette would have had a warning. Two minutes past the hour, I've just gone back. It, it, it had the warning. I remember talking about it. That was a while ago, yeah. So that was some 26, 27 minutes ago, uh, and they've continued to offend. Yeah. Meantime, uh, not offending the eye at all no. at the front of LMP2. Cracking racing going on yeah. uh, between Dragon Speed uh, and Anders Fjordbach and the... the, the High-class racing car, yeah. PR1 Matheson Motorsport. Yeah, Fjordback took, took the lead, uh, what, 10, 10 or 11 laps ago now, but he's still only uh, a second or so ahead of Montoya, who has been uh, hassled by Michael Jensen and Guido van der Gardner. So the top four cars there in LMP2 separated by less than two seconds uh, on this lap. Uh, Louis Delachasse in terms of quick laps, he's next up in line in the number eight for Tamos, where well, here's another pit stop for what is now the GTD Pro leader, Matty Campbell, in car number nine. And that is a changeover. Driver out, Matthew Campbell. And now, who is jumping into the number nine, I think? Uh, that is... Oh, and it has to be Matthew Jamin here. There's only the pair of them, isn't it? So I don't know why it took me that long. Thanks to Austin from McLaren, Philadelphia, for the uh, 
liquid refreshment, and I promise you it is only iced water. Two McLarens in this race, so they'll be being cheered on uh, from our guests in the studio at the moment, just having a little bit of what a watch of us doing our work. Clown of Philadelphia, you, you will know, are great supporters of IMSA racing and tweet an awful lot. If you're not following them, you should be. In fact, one of their uh, Ferrari of Philadelphia uh, technicians was working at Le Mans a couple of weeks ago, was taken over uh, by one of the teams to engineer one of the cars and absolutely hated it. And when he came back, said, no, oh, nobody else should go. It's terrible. It will be awful. Don't send anybody else. If anybody has to go, I will do it. You know, I'll take one for the team. I'm sure that was the story when he got back. Good to see the uh, involvement that the McLaren dealers have, have brought uh, into this uh, this championship. And uh, Reid Atherton, who looks after the motorsport for McLaren here in the US. Uh, let's go down to Joe Bradley, who's at Dragon Speed. So, Eldon, um, what on earth have you guys done to get that Dragon Speed car back into contention? You want me to tell you what I just told you? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we lost a wheel. And that put us out of sync. And so you're out of sync, but you're back in there. Yeah, in a funny way that allowed us to take the next safety and get Henrik to the end of his run. So the other ones took a lot of penalties. They made a lot of mistakes as well. So they also gifted it back. That's what it is. Ellen Julian there, team principal at Dragon Speed there. And that's the car that lost the wheel earlier. Uh, my problem with Toyo, the wheel of that car at the moment. Uh, and your drama for the number 10 car as Ricky Taylor is back in the pit lane uh, from the car that was leading the race and that's early as a big spin no, from the it, uh, is it on time Jeremy well yeah it is because uh, I think they gambled on there being another caution period yeah oh yes uh, because we were expecting them off. to stay out yeah. to the three hour mark exactly I talked about that and it hasn't paid off because they've had to come in with uh, just what four Seven minutes, where are we? Two hours, 53, seven minutes remaining in this race. I thought it was too early. AF Corsa Whoa. with a right rear yeah. puncture on the 21 car and a big spin for the right car. Was there a coming together there? Yes, there was at turn number eight. So the right car spun around by the AF Corsa number 21, the 16 getting pointed in the right direction, if you'll pardon the pun, reasonably quickly. Uh, but the little tag from the Ferrari as the, uh, from the Porsche as it was spinning has done some damage. And that incident will be looked at uh, in the stewards room. The uh, number 16 has recovered. Yes, it has, and it's gone through to start another lap. That was Zach Robichon. And the number 21 was Tony Vlander behind the wheel, a very experienced Nordic driver, and I think the suspension damage on the back of that, that was the end of the incident. So, the gamble that Jeremy said, oh, they're going to be doing well to get the three hours for the number 10, Whelan, uh, the number 10, Connick Minolga, accurate for Ricky Taylor, and has not paid off, and they've dropped down to fifth. Ollie Jarvis leads by three quarters of a second with Renke van der Zander in the 0 1. Been taken over from yeah. Sebastian Bordet and then Alex Linz another 20 seconds further back. And here's that uh, incident again that I just described for you. Tony Vlander up the inside, turns around the 16 and then gets tagged as the 16 was spinning. And a McLaren spin as well from 11th position, the number 59, 11th in class for. John Miller and the crucial motorsport car. That's the metallic copper coloured machine. I don't think he's got any damage on that. Oh, he's weaving it around. Maybe he has. Is there a problem on the left hand side? Now, did he jump or was he pushed? Nope, he was pushed. That was another Ferrari trying to force its way through. This time it was the Chetelar 47. The Ferraris have all gone a bit bonkers at the moment. Antonio Fuerco as the Tony Vlander 21 AF Corsa car is on its dolly jacks and pushed behind the wall. Not a good few minutes for Ferrari. I think Vlander will get a penalty for that, and I think Fuoco too is, will as well. 
And yes, already come up. Incident responsibility turning around the 16. It will be a drive through if and when that AF Corsa comes back. Tony Villanda judged to be the aggressor there. And I think Antonio Fuego will get the same treatment. Joe Bradley down at the number 10. Conningham and all the Wayne Taylor Racing Cadillac. They were gambling, Joe, on going to the three hour mark, I'm pretty certain. Uh, and it hasn't paid off for them. Yeah, I think you're right there, John, because uh, just ask Wayne Taylor, and he's a very good poker player, remember. Um, and he tells me that this is all to do with their strategy and their fueling, and they've needed fueling, and their rear tyres. Um, some blisters beginning to develop on the inside edge of those rears as they came off. So this is perfectly on, on cue with their strategy. It's just unfortunate that they've missed out going to the half distance. Oh, really? Okay. Kyle Tilly's just got aboard. Sorry, I missed that. What, what he said they were perfect. Wayne Tiller says they were perfectly on strategy. They were worried about a little bit of blistering on the rear tyres. No, no, sorry. Not going to go for that one. No, I agree. I think they've uh, slightly miscalculated that. I mean, that was way early. Uh, 47 minutes is, is a real stretch. Um, I, well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not, certainly not going to call Wayne a liar. Uh, because I've known him for too long, but... Um, that was 25... I mean, um, he was turning consistent lap times that were, you know, way slower than he'd been going before, let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I think he was trying to stretch the fuel. It was, 20, it was 25 laps uh, of full green and 39 minutes only that they got out of that car, and they came in with, what did you say, 47 minutes to go? Uh, yes. They came in after two hours and 13 minutes, so yes, so 47 minutes to go, which is a real stretch in these cars. I mean, the surprising thing was the, the next car didn't come in for another six laps, uh, and then they all kind of came in together, uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the leaders. So, yeah, that was, I think that was way too... I think they were gambling on there being another yellow. I really do. Yeah, me too. Uh, back at the infield paddock for the number 66... Gradient Racing, NSX, wow, it's been a tough weekend for their engineers. A turbocharger being changed on that car. Uh, and the number 47, Antonio Fort, well, incident responsibility with the McLaren. That'll be a drive-through, so two incidents with Ferraris, two penalties for Ferraris in the last few minutes. 33 seconds to the three-hour mark. And... Therefore, the next lap after that will be when the points are awarded. Right, Motorsports just tweeting, Zach Rubbish on clip, spun by a Ferrari, slight vibration, but the car OK. Well, that's good news. Forco will have to come in, and the blue and green Chetela Ferrari. This is one of the cars that is with us for this event because it is a Michelin Endurance Cup machine came from a very long way back at turn eight and was barely, uh, was halfway down the car, but halfway down is not far, not far enough down. Uh, when you're getting uh, a right-hander coming up and Antonio Fogel then will need the drive-through. Now, if he's got any sense at all, he will stay out until the third lap when he has to come in, because at the moment, well, he's sitting in 11th, so he's not getting great mission. In fact, you don't get any um, Endurance Cup points for being 11th, do you? No, you only get you only get it for top three, effectively. Yeah. It's 5-4-3, and everybody else gets two. Right. So it's so only it the top matter. three that score more than anybody else. So it doesn't matter whether he takes that penalty or no, not. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter whether he's you know, fourth or 108th. <laughs> So in, into the second half of the race now, and we'll wait for the bulletin that comes out to tell you who's got what in terms of the points. Into the inner loop. High-class racing and dragon speed. And high-class defending at the moment, the number 20. This is the battle at the sharp end of uh, LMP2. And... And as for your back as Juan Pablo Montoya right up his rear aerofoil. As he is trying to defend that lead. At the front of the field, Oli Jarvis is still just three quarters of a second ahead of Cadillac Racing's Renga van der Zander. 
And closing in a little bit on the leaders, Alex Lane. He was 20 seconds back, not too far ago. He's taken about a second and a half, two seconds out of them. Forecourt into the pit lane for Chetelar. This is the drive through for the contact. Incident responsibility. Remember, Tony Vlander has been assessed the same penalty, but that car behind the wall with broken right rear suspension after that incident with Wright. So when do we expect those leading cars into the pit lane? Uh, Oli Jarvis has been out there. This is his 20th lap. 22 laps for Renge van der Zander. 22 laps up. Yeah, I think 24 laps is uh, would be. It's about there. Yeah, I think so. So the five, the five car I would expect to be the first to come onto uh, pit lane. And that is actually just done now, 24. So, uh, yeah, 20, between 24 and 27, I think, is uh, would be the, from the information that I have. Was that a replay? Was that the same as happened? Uh, uh, it's, lap lap, it's lap after lap, isn't it? <laughs> and this time, Montoya does get the rub of the green from the traffic. It goes through and takes the lead. And sitting right in behind is the wins car. That's the third place machine, the 52, Mikkel Jensen. And he's not quite able to take advantage, but Juan Pablo Montoya, wily old fox that he is, started racing. First race here almost 30 years ago. Meantime, in the pit lane, Pipo Tarani, out of the 31 wheel and engineering car, and full service for that machine. And driver change as well for the number 31. So that will be, well, I was going to say, I'm surprised that people, I mean, it tells you how hot it is, Jeremy, when people's not doing a double stint, like Conway getting into that car for his first run at it. That does tell you how gruelling it is, people's normally up for a challenge. So with those maximum points at the three-hour mark, unofficially, the, the uh, Kerbag Ajanian car, car number 60, uh, that one, of course, at Daytona will now have 26 points. The uh, number five car, which was leading coming into this weekend by two points over number 31 and number 10, will have uh, 26 points as well. And the number 31 and number 10, uh, with the gamble not paying off for number 10 or a problem, whatever, uh, it, they have uh, thir uh, 24 points now, so they remain two points behind a lead, but they've dropped from second and third to third and fourth in the points. Right. Thank you for keeping us uh, abreast of that. Tony Fuoco using the indicator there, and now he's back with the McLaren. The same McLaren that he nerfed out the way earlier on, just getting out the way of Juan Montoya. Uh, and this time, he manages to make the pass on the metallic copper number 59 uh, without any contact uh, and so it goes through but of course has lost a lot of ground there here comes the number 60 ollie jarvis the leader into the pit lane for richard westbrook at jdc miller motorsports and as jeremy mentioned he expected about uh, 24 well that's actually 26 laps for westy yeah 41 minutes he was out on the track and the 31 car was in a lap ago that did uh, 23 laps on this stint yeah that was people getting out of that car Mike conway uh, getting in I was say, did, did, did i miss people doing a double stint because i'm Really quite surprised if he didn't. Things are going by so quickly. Yes, he did. He did 27, 28 laps in in total. I remember he, they had that uh, extra pit stop that they actually got them a penalty. In for the number one car, Renga van der Zander. And full service there as well. Ah, mistake. Mistake for the 0-1 car. They've dropped the car and the left front is not on. It has to be lifted up again. But I don't think it's cost them any time because the fuel hose was still in. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Also, inception number 70, McLaren into the pit lane. 
And that car just waiting for fuel. It's the Brendan Array, Molly Milroy, and Jordan Pepper car. Yeah, which was uh, again running on a different strategy to everybody else, like it was at uh, Mid Ohio, where it uh, had some remarkable fuel economy. Uh, and again, it, it would suck it up into second position and was running there for a long, long time before making this pit stop. In fact, it, was, it would have been leading in GTD regular. It, into the pits, Juan Montoya in the number 81 Flexbox sponsored Dragon Speed from the lead of the class. Uh, this will be a driver change as well. Juan out. And new set of Michelins going on. It did look brand new on that car. Very sensibly, the incoming driver hasn't closed the door yet. In fact, they've opened both doors on that car. You don't always see that. But just to get a bit of a breeze through the car, just before the car dropped, and there's a couple of three or four seconds before the engine fires, and it runs back out again, and it drops in behind the high-class car, which has jumped them back in the pit lane. So that is position gained for high class as they leave with Anders Fjordbach still on board at Sebastian Montoya, who took over from his dad. But that little stutter when the car either wouldn't fire or wouldn't go into gear has just cost them that position. Now they've dropped down. Now, have they dropped down? Or are they still first and second? Did Louis Delatraz go through? I'll have to see them come through the next timing line. I think that's uh, I think that was a pass for the lead, the effective lead certainly in the pit stop. That little foobar from the 01 Cadillac. The wheel didn't quite go on and then it, the car was dropped. But I don't think that cost them any time at all because the fuel hose was still attached. And in fact, Renger van der Zander is still ahead of Alex Lind, his teammate. Jarvis from Taylor by a minute now. So Ollie Jarvis, who is yet to make the pit stop that everyone else has just made, if that makes any sense. And Ricky Taylor is, is miles off strategy for everybody else. He's uh, 10 laps into his stint when everyone else has either come to an end of theirs or just about to. I reckon Ollie Jarvis will be in. He did 30 laps on his previous stint, but I think that had a bit of yellow in it. Yes, it did. This has been an all green stint. Expect to see him in next time around. Can, how quickly can they turn that car around? And where will Ricky Taylor be? He'll go through. Let's go down to Joe Bradley in the pit lane with Heart of Racing. In from second place in GTD, towards the number 23, Aston Martin, and there's no driver change going on here. Just fuel the tyres, and it's just coming to the end of the pit stop, the fueling. As we say, the pit stop time is restricted by the fueling. Everything can be done, driver change, tyres, whatever. The 23, though, hasn't bothered changing the driver, just the tyres. Fueling still going on. Large tanks on these GTD cars. This, and we've got the number 60 in, further down pit road, John. That's from the lead DBIs. And we've also got the 54 Core Autosport LMP3 machine in. This is George Kurtz getting out. John Bennett's done his time. And now it is time for Colin Brown. So stand back from the fences, ladies and gents. Meantime, with the leader, that was full service for the number 60 Sirius XM Acura. Waiting, waiting. Ollie Jarvis, that would have been the end of his 24th lap, 25th lap. And out he goes, spot on time for that, Jeremy. You happy with that? Yep, 25 laps, absolutely right. And uh, he came in, two, three, uh, as on the previous sequence, three laps after the two Ganassi Cadillac racing entries. So let's have a quick look at uh, how things... That, is that, that's a full set of pit stops then, Jeremy, for the, for the DPIs now. Correct. So Ricky Taylor will go back through to the lead. Yeah. 
and yeah, he I, it'll be uh, it'll be fairly close. Just let I'd me. I'd like to see where he comes out actually on the racetrack, but um, because uh, but of course the number ten car is fully up to speed now on hot tyres, whereas the yeah, he's, he's ahead. Number sixty. The sixty is is uh, has just dropped in behind. They're just heading uh, through turn six now and into turn seven, and it is the ten car that's ahead. So it's the Conic and Minolta Acura that leads, but not by much. So I, I think that gap's come down a little bit. So I think in many ways it hasn't paid off for Conic and Minolta. They didn't get the points in the uh, Michelin Endurance Cup and they uh, haven't stretched the lead that they had. We'll wait for them to come across the line and I'll, I'm prepared to be proved wrong on that. They're coming through turn number 10 to turn number 11 now. So if we look to our right, we should see the headlights of the blue and black car. And here they come now in traffic as well. There's the leader. There's the second place car going past us. And the gap between them is what? It is 2.9 seconds. So under three seconds, Jeremy, between the two leaders now. Yeah, and bef before the rounder stops, yeah, it was around about the same. It was fluctuating around about three three to four seconds, so it's really about the same. It, it always fluctuates according to traffic, but uh, no, about about the same there. The number zero one car, uh, however, has certainly dropped back because that was only a second and a half or so behind a number 60. Now the gap back to third place is 5.7 seconds. The gap back to fourth place, that was about yeah, 16, somewhere between 16 and 20 seconds back to the number zero two car. That again is 20 seconds. Two hours and 45 minutes to go, or 46 minutes to go. We're into the realms of a normal race for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Just, uh, let Jeremy take a quick breather and uh, introduce a guest uh, into the booth. Welcome to Jim Shantz, who is a voice you've heard before with us here uh, on on uh, IMSA Radio. Was with us uh, a couple of three years ago. And uh, glad to have him back in the booth again. In the meantime, Ricky Taylor now down to just 1.5, 1.7 seconds of a lead. Jim, welcome back to IMSA Radio. Well, thank you, John. This, it's good to be back. The last three years have been the season for golden anniversaries. When we were last together, we were celebrating IMSA's organizational golden anniversary. Since that time, we pay tribute to Solar Productions 50th anniversary, the 1971 release of Steve McQueen's Le Mans. That by which our subconsciouses were forever melded to the pale blue and orange golf colors, along with the synonymous association with Lamar itself. Certainly, the you know that that for me is is one of the moments that I remember in sports car uh, racing when I first saw that. That would have been mid 70s by the time I saw it, mid to late 70s by the time I saw it in a, a school hall in the comprehensive school in Sunderland. Let's go down to shit in the pit lane, Shay. Just pretty acclimatizing myself, John, after a brief lunch break, and I come out to the 30, the Junior 3 Racing. This is our LMP3 Championship leader, keep in mind, coming into today's race. Their air jack is not functioning properly, so they have a manual jack prepared on the wall to try and lift the car up that little bit further just to be able to change the rear tires. The fronts come off the ground as they should, but the rears are not even an inch up. So the crew is struggling, trying to figure out how to change the rear tires on this car. Now they've loosened them 
see if they can pull them off. But this car, which came in from the second position, is going to be having slow pit stops for the remainder of this race. So even though Canadian Garrett Grist has now gotten behind the wheel, he is their gold-rated driver. He's going to have a lot of work to do out on the track to try and get that number two back onto the side of this car. Happened at WRT at Le Mans, uh, not, last, uh, not the last race, but the one before. And they used an airbag underneath uh, the car, if you remember, to get the rear tyres changed. Thank you, Shea. Um, got uh, Jim Shantz in the uh, studio uh, with us. The Le Mans movie, of course, Jim, uh, was what brought a lot of us to the uh, uh, Etruscan orange and sky blue golf cars. And, and there was such a feature here, the John Wire cars at Watkins Glen International. Uh, yes, they were. As a matter of fact, the very same titanic struggle between Ferrari and Porsche in 1970, 21 days later, the very same cars and drivers we're here in the paddock area for the Watkins Glen six hour. That race won by Pedro Rodriguez and Leo <laughs> Kinnunen. Oh. And by John Wire's own admission, he said Watkins Glen was their best race of the season. And they didn't fare as well at Le Mans, as you may recall, all of the entire team of the John Wire golf cars were in the hedges by the halfway point. Uh, their pit area was totally abandoned by that time and their presence was marked by three crosses of retirement on the horizontal Antar scoring pylon. Just a, a note here for the Andretti car. It's been a really, really tough one for them today. Another penalty. It's a drive through for leaving with pit equi equipment attached. Is that fourth? The, the in fourth position, um, and remarkably, after all their trials and tribulations. Uh, but still, they have... Uh, yet to be finished with the stewards room um, i picked up the other night a good friend of ours jim roller who's hails from around these parts jim uh, was kind enough to to bring some fly slot car models up from the late great bill ausler's collection um some of the the uh, the extras there and uh, brought some up for joe bradley and myself and knows i'm a porsche enthusiast and one of them was uh, uh, the uh, Porsche 911 driven by Michael Kaiser, the Todd Hall car. Of course, that was another great anniversary as well. Yes. This year we celebrate 50 years of the release of Toad Hall Productions, the Speed Merchants, Michael Kaiser, who traveled. It was an actual documentary that went the entire season of the 1972 World Championship for Makes, which was the first year of the three liter open cockpit Group 6 formula. And featured in that film were six races, the Daytona, which was a six hour race that year, the Sebring 12 hour, the Targa Florio, Nürburgring 1000 kilometers, Le Mans itself, which had the challenge of the John Wire Golf Mirage M8, M6 and M8 cars, as well as Joe Bonnier's yellow Ecurie equipped Bonnier yellow Lola's. And then of course it culminates with the finish here at the Watkins Glen Six Hour, which is a battle between Ferrari's own teams. I, I remember that movie. I've got it on DVD, and I get it out uh, at least once a season, normally just before I go to Sebring uh, in March, because those days, in some ways, things have changed many ways. Some of them, they haven't. It, it's still the circus coming to town every round, and the camaraderie between the drivers in that paddock it's different now on the racetrack. There's different technologies. But when we all go and eat at the same place and we all end up drinking in the same bars and eating in the same restaurant, to me, that camaraderie still exists in the endurance racing paddock, which it perhaps doesn't in some other world championships. That is the case. The camaraderie, because not only do they compete together, they travel together, they see one another frequently at various hotels and uh, traveling destinations. So it's... Not uncommon for them to be commensurable both at the track and away from the track. And also on that subject, we also pay tribute to the life and career of Victor Henry Elford, known as Vic the Quick because of his single day driving performance at the Nürburgring 1000 kilometers back in 1971. Vic Elford, the great all rounder. Uh, and, you know, lovely to see people like uh, Sebastian Ogier, Sebastian Lowe before him, Colin McRae even before that rally star stepping into uh, endurance. Uh, and, and we've got here um, Lloris perez Compank, who's been racing here uh, this weekend as well. But we're never going to see an all-rounder like 
Vic Elford again, are we? Uh, it, that's entirely possible, but remotely so. Yes. Closest we've had is is Fernando Alonso, of course, who's who's you know done two parts of the triple crown. He has crossed the street on occasion, but I think he's found the place where his heart has truly been. He just needed a respite from Formula One, but now he's back in full earnest, producing good results. He, he was he's been brilliant in the last few races. Jim, what, what was what's your earliest memory of being here at Watkins Glen? Because you've worked here, you've been part of the part of the furniture, as we would say, for quite a long time. I was here for the very first six-hour race, 1968. And the great Lucien Bianchi, which was, he was, was co-winner with Jackie Eakes. And under team orders from John Wire, who told David Hobbs and Paul Hawkins to lap at a two-second deficit to allow the Jackie Eakes, Lucien Bianchi golf car GT40s to take. The, and this, at that time, that race was held before Le Mans. Yes. Because of the 1968 postponement, there was unrest in the country of France, so Le Mans was actually in September. forestalled until September. Yeah. So they were here in July, but that was my first. And, of course, the helmet turbines were here as well. Oh, the helmet TX cars. That, we normally see those at Classic Le Mans, which is next weekend. Just a final thought from you. We've got uh, Porsche Team Penske coming back into GTP racing, and it will be known as GTP racing next year. We now know that uh, we'll also have a uh, Porsche customer car uh, at least one in the hands of JDC Millet Motorsport. New GTP cars from Cadillac, from, from Acura, from BMW. Are we staring at another golden era? If, if, we, if you and I are talking here in another 20 years' time, are we going to be looking back at 2023 as the start of another golden era? Well, I certainly hope we're here in 20 years' time. Well, I, about so this. do I, yes. <laughs> I hope I can get up the stairs, with, stairs, because the lift hasn't been working today. But, but with that said, in the mid 1980s, during the IMSA Camel GT era, we had a renaissance of international presence. You had several factory supported 962s with uh, Al Holbert, Jim Busby, and as well as the Electrodyne Nissans, <laughs> the Group 44 XJR5 Jaguars, and then later on the, the XJ8 when Tom Walkinshaw came in. I think we're approaching another renaissance of stateside sports car racing to that proportion. Well, Jim, it's been lovely to see you again. Thank you for making the slightly more difficult uh, did you sort of bivouac halfway up the stairs and make a big count there or is the lift working again? Well, we made a sprint. <laughs> I haven't spent this pandemic downtime. <laughs> I've been working out. Thank you, Jim. Jim Shantz, always great to, to speak to him here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Lovely to see you again, sir. Let's head down to the pit lane. We'll start with Shea Adam for a little update on what's been going on down there. With Dakota Dickerson, who's fresh out of the MLT LMP3 machine. Dakota, you said it's busy out there. Even from your perspective, there's a lot going on when it's green. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's plenty of cars out there. The restarts were making it really, really tight, but looks like the race has kind of gotten into a rhythm now. So Tyler's doing a great job watching the 74 car scene when he's going to pit. But we're looking really good. We're feeling confident. Car feels great. So looking forward to the last back end of the race. You and Josh have proven to be a good duo together, running an IPC and then making your debut into this championship. How is Tyler Maxman fitting into that equation? Yeah, he's doing a great job. It's been a seamless transition for him. He raced for us at uh, an IPC, so he fits really well into the team. Super professional, uh, really young as well, really quick. So we're really happy to have him as a third driver. Looking forward to keeping him on board, hopefully for the rest of the year as well. Good luck today and good luck keeping cool, more importantly. Awesome, thank you. I uh, just noticed the number 12, the Vassar Sullivan Lexus, came in a short while ago for a scheduled stop. However, they soaked up a lot more time than they would have liked, and there was consternation on the face of the crew. It was something to do with what was it, something inside of the car. I suspect it was a replenishment of a drinks bottle. They couldn't quite get to seat or something along those lines, from what I could gather. However, it may have cost them a lot of time in the pits, and that's going to reflect out on track. The other thing I've noticed is um, I mentioned I mentioned earlier that there was some blistering on the inside edge 
of the tyres that came off. I think it was the uh, the Wayne Taylor car. Um, yeah, the number 10. Um, well, that's pretty much the, the form all the way down the, uh, the pit lane in the DPI classes, and it's a very, very thin streak of blistering right on the inside edge of these rear tyres. And, of course, with the camber of the tyres, that's the inside edge that's doing all of the work on the straights. And with a track temperature of 120-plus, then you can understand why. Driver's not complaining about tyre performance. Um, they seem to be at ease with that, but um, stretching these tyres, I think it's part of the into the pit lane for the Paul Miller BMW. It came in with the number one on the side because that's its car number and that was its track position. Madison Snow brought it in. Brian Sellers takes it out for new Michelin tires and a lot of fuel. And I've been informed that the air conditioning is no longer functioning in that BMW. So what was once a very comfortable car to drive is now hot, hot, hot. Uh, which was a big hit for Arrow back in the 1980s. Um, somewhere I have that on 12 inch vinyl. The uh, track temperature 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 49 Celsius, 30 Celsius in the air or 86 Fahrenheit. Number 42 just being assessed a penalty. In fact, it's just served the penalty for that presumably was the NTE SSR car. Yes, it was for, uh, again, multiple breaches of uh, track limit etiquette. So at the front of the field, with uh, another half hour of racing almost complete. Ricky Taylor leads by the scant 1.7 seconds over Ollie Jarvis, the two Acuras, number 10 and 30. The blue and black leader and the pink and white in second. Then about 11 and a half seconds to Renga van der Zande in the 0-1. That's the white and black Cadillac from Chip Ganassi Racing. The 0-2 is the black and dark red car that's Alex Lynn he's about another 22 and a half seconds further back in fifth it's wheel and engineering the 31 red and white Cadillac seven seconds back from Mike Conway or for Mike Conway should I say Richard Westbrook another half minute further back for JDC that's the uh, grey and gold number five and can we Kobayashi for Ally Cadillac is another four and a half seconds uh, further back. That's your top seven within a minute and 20 seconds. And as Fjord back leads uh, in the LMP2 category by just on a second, second and a half from Sebastian Montoya, 20 from 81, high class from Dragon Speed, red and white from the uh, Evil Knievel sort of uh, colour scheme, the white with the uh, Knievel stripes on it. Then it's Tower Motorsport, another four seconds further back for Louis Delatraz, the number eight car. It's the black and orange car. Racing Team Netherlands, that's the blue and yellow car, Guido van der Garde, just another two seconds further back. Uh, and then five seconds back from fourth in fifth position, the two PR1 Matheson cars, Scott Huffaker in the 52, that was the Paul sitting car. And another 46 seconds back, Jonathan Bomarito uh, in the number 11, another PR1 car. Kyle Killy, Kyle Tilly is the era motorsport driver just coming out of the pits in seventh position. In LMP3, Kai van Berlo leads for Riley Motorsport from LM, MLT Motorsport and Junior 3 Motorsport, 74, 58 and 30. GTD Pro versus Sullivan for Lexus is ahead of Daniel Surra for Risi Competizione by just under two seconds. Faf Motorsport and Batia Jam in here. Jam Jam. It's another 1.5 seconds further back. Marvin Dietz leads the GTD category for Winwood Racing. As I said, I said before, when we were doing one of these VP Racing Fuel in race updates, they're kind of stealthed up to the lead, but they've been holding that lead and still hold it at the moment by about eight seconds from Roman De Angelis for Heart of Racing's Aston Martin GT3. And it's a second Aston Martin in third position. Behind the 27 is the number 44, the Aston Martin Vantage of Magnus Racing and Spencer Pumpelli. That's your update from VP Racing Fuels in race update with two hours and 30 minutes still to go here at Watkins Glen from the Hagley Global Broadcast Centre around the US on Sirius 207, around the world on RS2 IMSA Radio via imsaradio.com and in sound and vision as well for those of you outside the US. Just click the live video tab on the top left of imsaradio.com. Lovely to have your company in the pit lane. Jeremy it is uh, uh, joining me, Jeremy Shaw, and me and Jeremy Shaw in the Hagley Global Broadcast Centre in the pit lane is Shea, Adam, and Joe Bradley. 
And with another half an hour of racing completed, it is still very tight, Jeremy, at the front of the field. Top three within 10 seconds in TPI. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not a lot of change. Number the zero one car has uh, yeah, lost a little bit of ground to the, the two Acuras in this stint, but, but really not very much. Nothing really has changed up towards the front there. The only interesting thing is perhaps, or the most interesting thing perhaps, is that number 48 car, Kamu Kobayashi, now at the wheel of that car, having taken over from, well, he, he's driving that car. He's, he's now, he took, he took it from Rocky. Rocky drove it last, Mike Rockenfeller. He is closed now to within 3.4 seconds of Richard Westbrook. So he's definitely closing that gap between the number 48 and number five quite significantly. In fact, over the course of the last 10 laps, the gap has come down by about 12 seconds. Uh, Kobayashi catching Westbrook. Uh, the, uh, we just saw a pit stop, didn't we, for the number zero, for the number one car that was leading GTD. Um, so that was falling back kind of down the order as that whole thing is shuffling around again. Number 14 car back into the lead of GTD Pro and, G and yeah, of all the GTD cars. Uh, and as far as the front of the field is concerned, we'll see Ricky Taylor in probably next time around. And remember, they are off kilter as far as their pit stop strategy is concerned. So the number 10, Conning and Manolda Acura should be in next time around. Uh, there are about nine, almost 10 laps off strategy, depending on whether you're counting from the start of the stint or the, the end of the stint. On his 25th lap uh, at the moment, and it was 25 laps that they did last time before they came into the pit. So keep an eye open for that number 10 coming down pit road. And then, of course, we'll start the cycle where Ollie Jarvis will lead the motor race uh, for a wee while before he pits. Uh, and he and uh, Renger van der Zander will, will pit out of third and drop back. He and Alex Lynn are on the same pit strategy. Uh, so Ollie Jarvis at the moment, I've got to kind of work this backwards, but I, f I think the 60 Acura is in the, in the best position at the moment in terms of how they're going towards the end of the race. We've got two hours and 30 minutes, let's say, to go when Ricky Taylor pits. He's getting about, four, let's call it 40 minutes. So that's 120, 140 minutes. So it's, ne it's not an exact number for them. So they might have to splash at the end or take their advantage. I'm impressed. The, if you can figure that that far ahead, I am seriously impressed without a computer. Wow. Oh, yeah. That is awesome. But I mean, it's neck and neck between those two, no yeah, doubt yeah. about it. Uh, and that strategy you know, could could or not bite them in, bite them in the backside later on. Do, should we look through the, Emmy, M, the Michelin Endurance yes. Cup points? So no, now official, talk, yeah. Now, yeah, well, no, they're not official because the, that, that waits till the end of the race. Okay. But at least unofficially from the... Uh, bulletin issued by IMSA. Uh, as we talked about in, in DPI now, there'll be a, a tie at the top between the number five and the number 60 cars. Jeremy, just one second, because yep. the lead is about to change. Traffic has held up the number 10 of Ricky Taylor and straight there like a rat up a drain pipe. Ollie Jarvis is right there. Now the number 10 car's coming into the Whoop. pits anywhere this time round, spot on. Uh, from our calculations, but he nearly lost the lead on the in-lap. And that is going to be a slow lap coming into the pit lane uh, for Ricky Taylor when he wanted a quick lap. And now that has released Ollie Jarvis, and he'll be out there now for another well, 10 laps. So he gets 10 laps in the lead before he has to pit again. So this is where he wants a nice, clean run uh, to try and build up space or a very a very quick yellow flag so he can get in and out before that number 10 car gets by him so 26 laps on this stint then for number 10 car it was 25 on the last one that still wouldn't have been enough to get into that three hour mark yes, so good point. when he talked about the the the, the uh the outer strategy there. Was he talking about the previous stop where they had a tire going down? Must have been. Yeah, oh, must okay. have been. In that case, fine. Uh, must have been. I just, that kind of just thought just struck me now. But yeah, good it, point. It didn't at the time. It, it was in, in fairness, it wasn't clear from uh, mm. from from the interview, as you see. It. Out goes the number ten, 
Cottingham and Alder accurate. The DPI back on track. Jeremy, we interrupted you doing the uh, the points from the bulletin. True. Uh, so uh, that, that was DPI in e, the, the a lead tie for the lead temperature, number five and number 60. In LMP2, uh, the... Uh, no, well, the, the number 52 car had a one-point advantage over number 29. Uh, they finished, uh, well, the number 52 car finished third, so they will extend that by one point, so a two-point edge now for number 52 over the 29, in, which is PR1, Mathis Motorsports over Racing Team Netherlands. In, uh, in LMP3, the number 33 car led by two points over the number 74 coming into this round, and they're well clear of everybody else. They are now tied for the lead because the Riley Motorsports car finished second in the points at that three-hour mark, and number 33 car was outside the top three. So 29 points each for number 33, Storm Creech Motorsports, and number 74, Riley Motorsports. GTD Pro, the uh, lead hasn't really changed at all. The Corvette had a four-point edge over everybody else here, and uh, nobody else made any significant gains. So it remains four points clear of number nine and of number 62. In GTD, there has been a change because Inception Racing was out front when the three-hour mark came around. It was tied in the points lead with number 21 that had the problem earlier on. So number 70 car, Inception Racing McLaren, will now lead the GTD Michelin Endurance Cup uh, at this stage in the season. It'll have 27 points to 24 of number 21 car. Here's a tight battle down into turn one with number 81 car defending robustly there over Louis Delatras. It's Sebastian Montoya for Dragon Speed and Louis Delatras who was trying to make a move on the inside and he was kind of dissuaded Ooh, nasty. from doing so by Sebastian Montoya. That's one of my biggest pet hates in motorsport, pushing someone towards the pit wall. Really don't like that at all. Uh, there's not anybody on that outside pit wall here, which there would be in Europe, but even so, don't like to see that. And, and that's right on the very edge of act, act, uh, of, of uh, acceptability there for me. And Sebastian needs to wash himself there, because that was a move in response to something that was going on. Yeah. And I think they'll be looking at that up on... Uh, our left. Uh, Joe Bradley is down in the pit lane, down at the... Oh, which pit are you at, Joe? I'm at the number 10, coming up an altar pit, where I've got a chance to speak to Ricky Taylor, who's still sweating after getting out of the car. Uh, Ricky, you guys are making this very exciting for us with this out-of-sync strategy that you guys are on. Yeah, it, I'm glad it's exciting for you. <laughs> but it's not for you. It's a little stressful. Um, yeah, there's a window now. You know, either we can get lucky or they can get lucky with a yellow and jump to the front and kind of solidify with either strategy. It's kind of nice that we're on our own thing because it means if we get our way, we're the leader, uh, clearly. Um, but there's quite a big window for them. So at the moment, my last stint was trying to save save a lap of fuel just to, just to open up our lucky window, if you will, and, uh, and give ourselves a better chance at, at beating them out. Would a long yellow period spoil the party for you? Uh, it depends when it falls. If it falls, uh, if it falls right now between the time when we pit and they pit, perfect for us. Um, we'll pit with them and jump to the front. Uh, if it falls after they pit, locks them in as the leaders, and we'll be kind of the last of the DPIs. So we hope for it between now and when they pit, or no yellows. I noticed. Uh, I've been thinking it was rear tyres that were blistering, but the front tyres on your car, the inner edge, was the performance lacking at all? Yeah, I, th I think partly also due to, to saving fuel, um, changes the balance of the car, everything gets a bit cold. Um, but yeah, we're, we're struggling with a bit of understeer. As it gets hotter, the track goes to a bit more of that balance, so uh, we're making adjustments as we go. Still a long way to go. Thank you, man. Thanks. Yeah, very good stuff uh, from the guys, and it's going to be... Uh, they are in a very good position, there's no doubt, but uh, the fall of a safety car... And that's very much the roll of the dice here, isn't it? Two hours and 20 minutes to go. And that incident involving Sebastian Montoya. It says 82, it means number eight. Uh, yeah. 81 and eight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was the, the number eight car that was 
pushed towards the pit yeah. wall. That, that is being looked at. Yeah, and that was the battle for the lead because number yes, 20 was. car uh, for uh, high class, yeah. high class race. It was in, in to make its pit stop in the previous lap, so Anders Fjordback has rejoined uh, some distance behind him, but he had been leading up until then. It's Jeremy Shaw, I'm John Hindall for in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Thanks for your company this afternoon or this evening, uh, 20 past eight in Central Europe. Very hot in Germany, I'm hearing at the moment. Hello, Ollie. Hello from hot Germany to hot Watkins Glen. Hot, hot and hot. Certainly is, and plenty of action to keep things warm on the track as well, with Ollie Jarvis leaving by, leading by about six and a half seconds. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us. And don't forget, in about two and a half hours' time, Although the chequered flag will have fallen and ended the race, we'll be starting Michelin Post Race Tech. It's where you get to set the agenda with your comments, questions or points arising from anything you've seen today or across this IMSA weekend. On Twitter, please, hashtag MichelinPRT at IMSA Radio. Bit of damage to the right rear of the number five, Richard Westbrook, JDC Miller Motorsports car. Looks like he... He has uh, had someone run up the back of him, and that someone was... Oh, no. It was him muscling his way past one of the LMP3 cars. That looked like one of the decanes that he was going by, um, and that uh, is what's caused that. And Joe Bradley is down at that pit. Have they got bodywork ready for that uh, number five car, Joe? Yeah, they certainly have. Just noticed a, a kind of a dynamic sort of activity at the number five Mustang sampling pit as I walk by. The rear deck's being brought out. That's going to be replaced straight away when the car comes in. I'm not sure how scheduled this stop is or whether it's in reaction to that damage, but the car, I think that the car may even be on pit road now. I can't quite say because I'm back in the box. So it's on pit road, yeah, it pulls up just in front of us. The team go to work and do what's required with regards to the service, which includes the driver. So a driver change going on now, fueling and tyres already on. And now the rear deck comes over the wall. Once the team have put the tyres on, then they'll go to work. And you can see the rear deck and the right-hand rear corner have been pulled from the clip. So now then, the question is, is that clip damaged? Because the new deck is reliant upon that. And it looks to me as though it's going to have to be a whole new... So the engine cover, where the clip attaches to for the rear deck, is damaged also. And a little bit... Oh, they're choosing to do some work on the... Uh, ah, it's the rear deck, yeah. So, so damage repair job on the number five. Racing Team Nederland was just in Guido Vandegarde getting out of the car and it'll make Jeremy Shaw very happy to know that Dylan Murray is back in because he put a show on a little bit earlier on. Fuel and four new Michelin tires is also into the pit lane and also on Joe's end. The 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac and the 52 PR1 Matheson LMP2. Thanks to the pit lane team. Beautiful afternoon here, very warm for the Michelin tyres. 50 degrees now on track, and that always starts to ring alarm bells for me. That's 122 Fahrenheit, 86 Fahrenheit, or 30 in the air. Two hours and 15 minutes to go, and in GTD, Marvin Beans. Ah, oh, something's just happened on the front straight, and it's the 5.8 slowing down, and has got to turn one has it not quite I can see down there and where has that gone well, pit stop still going on in the pit lane and nothing from race control so maybe a spin at the final corner not sure about that but with 2 hours and 15 minutes to go in GTD Pro, Kai Kirk will lead to Vassar Sullivan and Alexis by just a second from Risi Competizione's Daniel Serra. So the black and yellow and the red, Lexus and Ferrari pushing on very much indeed at the front of the field with Mathieu Jaminet for Faf Motorsport in third position. I think that was number 40 car in which uh, that came into contact with the, with the number five. Yeah, that car's that been in, it's, it's getting its uh, rear deck changed now. Yeah, it's losing uh, a fair bit of time, unfortunately. Uh, it was Richard Westbrook recently out of the car. Joe Bradley is down there. Richard just in uh, conference with uh, one of his crew chiefs. We'll find out just exactly what happened. He's already been 
and explained it to Christy Fittipaldi part of the time. Uh, Richard, what happened there? I don't know. I mean, you can't expect everyone to be fully attention in their mirrors through that S. And yeah, he, he didn't see me, so I was fully past him and he turned into, onto my rear wing, so I was plenty enough past him. But, you know, it happens. You, I needed to take the rest, I had Kamui behind me and Helen P3 hadn't seen me, which is disappointing because I was fully past him. I mean, he hit my rear wing. 95 out of 100 times, that would have worked, you know? Yeah. One of those things. I mean, it's part and parcel of this racing, so you listen, I'm, you know, wise enough to know that, you know, it's not the end of the world. Still get back in this, I assume we've lost a lap. Um, all to play for. It was only the bodywork that was damaged. There was no, yeah, nothing. Yeah, nothing on it. He just hit my rear wing. So the, 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 the wing end play. Yeah. Cheers, man. Richard Westbrook uh, down there. The MLT Motorsport car was the car going slow on the front straight. It did get round, but then took the shortcut, uh, which means it will get docked a lap and pulled out right in front of the number 27 Aston Martin racing car. Uh, and when I say right in front, I mean right in front of the to the point where that car, the heart of racing car, had to to swerve. So that's another piece of slightly dozy driving there. Not sure what's the problem with the uh, 58. We'll get a report from our pit lane team in just a moment time. Into the pits for Riley, the number 74. This is one of the cars that has been. Uh, battling at the sharp end of the LMP3 field. In fact, comes in from the lead of that uh, class for Kai van Berlo. And that was fuel, tyres and a driver change as Felipe Fraga has taken the 74 back out. The number one proudly displayed on the side. Oh, this is not looking good for MLT Motorsports. The 58 did come back to the pit lane. It is sitting in its box, both doors open, with the mechanic buried in the passenger side, which is the left side door. Um, huh. Oh, computers coming out over the wall. Headlights were off completely as well. As further down the pit lane, pit stops continue. Zero on Cadillac in from uh, what was second position. Uh, Renga van der Zander bringing that car in. New set of Michelins on there. Earl Bamba has just done the same stop, the equivalent stop for Cadillac Racing's number zero two, and therefore has already rejoined. Down and away for the number zero one. It goes out through the RF uh, ID readers. Uh, we, we didn't really explain what that they were doing there, to be honest. We mentioned them earlier on. There, there is only one car's bit through there. You've got to go through one at a time. Michelin have embedded RFID chips into all of their racing tyres. It's something that they've picked up from uh, HGV, heavy goods vehicles, so truck tyres, basically. Uh, and therefore, in the old days, when you used to have to put the chalk markings or the, the white markings on the side of tyres to make sure they were marked and you knew how many sets of tyres had been used through a race weekend and which cars they were allocated to. All of that now is done by those RFID chips and so they are red on all four corners of the car as they go out there and that gets sent to Michelin and to race control as well. So there is data as to how old all of these tyres on the track are and uh, that could be made available and Michelin do use that, of course, when they are developing the new tyres. Meantime, bad news, Shea Adam, for the uh, MLT car. It's being pushed behind the wall, human power. They plugged the computer in, there was an error message that popped up on the screen. I wasn't able to see what it was before they clicked out of it, but that immediately determined to them that they needed to go behind the wall to fix the problem. Terrible, terrible luck for them. Yeah, they'd uh, already had some strife earlier on in the race. The Faf Matthew Jaminier car in second position, going through turn one at the moment. Second position in its class as Roman De Angelis. Uh, excuse me, has Marvin Deanst for Windward Racing right behind them. And, uh, Marvin Deanst leads GTD, Matthew Jaminier third in GTD Pro. So those two battling for a position on track in terms of 23rd and 24th, but are not in the same part of the GT race. 
No, but the number 57 car has made up a couple of seconds over the last uh, four or five They're laps. They're having a cracking race. On Just the number nine. Very yeah. quietly, aren't they? Yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting race. I mean, the Carl Kirkwood leads by not very much in number 14 Lexus over the Matthew Jaminé, uh, uh Faf Porsche in second. Then Marvin Dietz right there as a GTD leader for, for Winwood Racing. Roman DeAndre's about another seven seconds back in the next position. Just looking at the at the leaders now, the, that gap between number 60 and number 10, it, it was over 60, 66 seconds, which should be enough for number 60 car to yeah. make its next stop, which I expect to happen in the next lap or two, and still maintain the lead over number 10. That was the that is significant. That is the very next question I was going to ask you. Uh, Oli Jarvis on his 25th lap now, so that's one lap further than he went last time. A close call there between the hard point number 99 and the 40 prototype. Was there a little 20, touch there? 25 cars last lap. Yeah, you're right. 25 is already done now. Yeah, well. Yeah. So Ollie Jarvis keeping the pace up, but still able to uh, eke out an extra lap. So let's see if he comes down the pit lane this time or whether Ollie, by some form of alchemy, uh, is turning air into fuel out there. Philippe Albuquerque now 65 and a half seconds behind. Into the pit lane, the number 14. This is the Lexus, the Pro Car. New set of Michelin tyres going on that car. Fuel still going in. Tyre changer on the right front, just having a quick look around. And making sure everybody was aware before he dropped the car. Still waiting on fuel. Still waiting on fuel. And still waiting on fuel. My goodness, this does take a long time to fill, doesn't it? And the moment the fuel probe was out, he was waved out and he's side by side with the windward car coming out the 57 machine. And wasn't able to beat that car out. So how significant will that be then with uh, Phil Ellis just have No, that wasn't the, uh, the Windward car then, was it? How close were they when they came back out? Check that for you. And I next see those two cars what was the question together. Was Another off-track moment with a bit of a pass on the grass for the Team Netherlands car a moment or two ago, just coming out of the... It was coming out of the top of the S's. Just trying to work out which uh, AMG has just been into the pits and came out. It was Winwood, was it? Ah, of course. Ah, that it was the Winwood car. Philip Ellis then uh, in the 57 Winwood car. Uh, uh, Joe Bradley has the leader of the race, stretching an extra lap for Ollie Jarvis this time, Joe. Great bit of fuel saving there from Ollie. He's going to stay in the car. Tom Blomqvist sits on the perch, just had a chat with Mike Shank, so he's not due to take over quite yet. So the tyres just coming to... The tyre stop, I should say. The tyre change just coming to the rears now. I'm just going to quite see if I can see what the state of the tyres are. Ollie Jarvis taking a very well-earned drink. Replenished drinks bottle. I'm pretty sure it's not the same. Lighting down the uh, back straight and then taking for a drink spot. Fuel always, as ever, the last thing that occurs. Could be the wheel spin. Let's see if I can see those front tyres. Can't quite see any blistering on these ones. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the reasons they got an extra lap. I think they've eased their pace just a little bit. Uh, let me give you some penalty news. Unsafe re entry drive through for the MLT car. Penalty, that's the number 58 penalty for the number five, more than the permitted number uh, of uh, personnel over the world, wall and considered working on the car. That'll be a penalty for the uh, Cadillac DPI number five that Lloyd Duval is driving for JDC Miller Motorsport. And there was one more as well, but that's disappeared just before I got to see that. So that must have been just served. Uh, Number 23, multiple track limits, drive-through, and also drive-through for the number 96. 
So two significant cars there. The 96 is the Turner Motorsport car. And uh, the number 23 also getting a drive through as well. So Corvette into the pit lane. And Joe Bradley will give us an update on that at the moment. Just having a look as well, the number eight now. So Sebastian Montoya has been warned for blocking on the front straight. So that did get a finger wag at least from the uh, pit, from the race control. So heart of racing team, by the way, the 23 was the other car. Uh, that's going to get a drive through. And that car's already served it, which is why it disappeared. But I did want to see which car it was so that when I work out that they've disappeared and had too many pit stops late, uh, later on, uh, I know why. Joe Bradley, that looked a fairly standard stop for Corvette. Very, very standard. Even had a chance to clean the windscreen and take what was left of a tear off off there. Fuel and tyres only, though, driver stays on board. In a quiet race for Corvette, but uh, came in out of the lead, Antonio Garcia, and takes the car back out again. They're hovering around on a slightly different, and I mean very slightly different pit strategy in terms of uh, what's been going on. Remember, they have had a drive through 35 laps for Antonio in that car, which is about standard 34 35 for the GTD Pro cars. Coming up to it, another significant part in the race, not in terms of points or anything like that, but we're coming to two thirds distance, two hours and two and a half minutes still to go. If you're with us this afternoon, nice to have your company. Just coming up, just past in fact, half past two in the afternoon. Uh, it is 20 minutes before eight in the UK, before nine in Central Europe. Thanks for spending your Sunday afternoon and evening with us. Sirius 207 RS2 around the world is IMSA Radio via imsaradio.com and IMSA TV available on there as well. So that last stint from Oliver Jarvis has enabled him to uh, stay ahead yes. of the number 10 car. First time we saw that last time and he wasn't able to do so, but this time he was able to uh, make, enough, make enough ground uh, on their different strategies, 10 laps apart, well, it was 10 laps, it's now 12 laps difference yeah. between those two, because number 60 car uh, turned a, a really great sit in there, 27 laps he was managed to eke, able to eke that out, uh, and he still comes out ahead of number 10 car, so that could be absolutely critical towards the end of this race. And if you remember the last time, Jeremy, he was pretty much three seconds behind, and now he's pretty much three seconds ahead. So that's exactly. a six-second swing yeah. in that run for Oli Jarvis. We hear a lot about fastest laps of the race, but what really counts in these long green flag runs is your average time across the lap uh, right throughout your 24, 25, 26, 27 laps, as it was there for OJ. And uh, I know Chelsea will be listening back in the UK. Hope you're well, Chelsea. Your lad's done a cracking job there. That's one of those real hero stints that he's just pulled off. Head back into GTD, where there's always a battle going on. And this is for the lead. Brian Sellers and Ollie Milroy, Inception Racing McLaren 720. And the red, white and blue, the Stars and Stripes, Paul Miller racing car. And uh, as that battle goes on, we tick down to two hours to go. It is the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre talking to the world from here at Watkins Glen International. Two hours to go. And we are looking at a cracking race at the head of the field. Oliver Jarvis for Maya Shank Racing with Kerb Agajanian knows how to win here. The summer of Mazda, of course, when he was on the top step of the podium in that cracking run for the Mazda prototypes. He is two and a half seconds ahead of Philippe Albuquerque and Renger van der Zander, just another six seconds further back. The closest battle at the moment is the battle for the lead in GT Daytona. Going through the inner loop now, the bus stop at the end of the back straight and now into the outer loop, the long 
parabolic turn five, banked down to the inside. Fantastic, get the power on nice and early. And the black and red McLaren 720S of Inception Racing with Ollie Milroy behind the wheel is holding off. Brian Sellers in the red, white and blue. BMW M4 GT3 of Paul Millet Racing, the number one car. Battling for the lead in their category. Not that far, actually, only about 20 seconds behind the lead in the pro category, which is Augusta Farfus again. He cycles to the front again. This is all about when pit stops are being taken because we haven't had one of those yellow things for a while. The pit stop strategies have played out. I know, I know, I said it. That battle for the lead in GTD just being passed by Earl Bamber, who is once again behind the wheel of the 0-2 Cadillac. A bit of cloud cover bubbling up again from the south and west. There is some, there is some uh, weather incoming. The question is, when will it get here? That's at this point, I'm very pleased I've got an all-wheel drive. Porsche Panamera for the trip back down to JFK tonight. Under two hours to go. Philippe Fraga leads LMP3 for the Riley machine. That's the number 74 LMP2. Anders Fjord back for high class. Having a cracking battle with Sebastian Montoya in the number 81 Dragon Speed. And DPI. It's Oli Jarvis ahead of Philippe Albuquerque in GT. Augusto Farfus leads for BMW in the number 25, Daniel Surra. Welcome back, Rishi Competizione and Carl Kirk. We're doing a great job for Lexus. And it's Oli Milroy from Brian Sellers. They're almost nose to tail with Philip Ellis in the AMG number 57 of Winwood Racing. That's how it stands, that's your VP Racing. Fuels update with just under two hours to go. Now, Jeremy, you've got to ask yourself at this point, what are the temperatures going to do? And now it's the hottest it's been today, 51 Celsius on the track. That's 124 degrees Fahrenheit. And how hard can these guys push, particularly the guys in the Koninka Minolta car, because they clearly backed off their pace a little bit with some potential tyre wars. Uh, yeah, possibly so, certainly. And uh, you know, the, the, there's still only a couple of seconds between those two. Albuquerque has closed in a little bit on Oliver Jarvis at this stage, but as you say, there's still a long, long way to go. There is the gap between the two of them. It's not much at all, is it? But uh, the... the uh, the pendulum definitely swung during that last stint, right between the third and fourth hour. The number 10 car lost its advantage to the number 60, but uh, you know, re the, the best of the Cadillacs remains the number zero one car, and he's hanging right there as he's, he's yeah. six seconds back. He's actually lost a couple of seconds over the last couple of laps. We have to see whether that changes because during the last stint, uh, it, it, it was a, the gap was around about six seconds between number 60 and the number zero one car. But number, number the zero two Cadillac has certainly fallen a long, long way back in the fourth position now. It's more than half a minute behind the zero one. S two stints ago, it was about 20 seconds. So he's lost uh, you know, another 10 seconds over the last uh, 20 laps or so, half a second a lap. And meanwhile, uh, Mike Conway, uh, he's making no ground at all in that number 31 car, which remains another 20 seconds. Uh, behind the uh, second of the Cadillac racing entries, the zero 02 car. Jeremy, Joe and I have just swapped ends on the pit lane, so now I'm down with the GTD Pro Runners, and I've noticed that almost all of them, as far as the eye can see, no, all of them, are standing up on the pit wall waiting for something to happen, some of them with uh, drivers on the wall, all of them with tires and fuel nozzles. Is this a point in the race where they can make it home on one or maybe two more stops? Is that why I'm seeing this? Yeah, they can do a, they can, the GT, GTD cars we're talking about, right? We're talking about GTD cars, right? GTD Pro, yeah, yes. Yeah, they, they can do, so between 60 and 70 minutes on a tank of fuel is the, uh, is the, uh, is the thinking here. So, yeah, from here, uh, one more stop to the end. And, you know, we saw most of them in 
you know, just a little while ago. I think, I, I'm sure they think from there they can get to the end. The car that's out of strategy a little bit is the number 70 car, which just making a pit stop now. Um, so it's going to fall to the back of the pack, whereas all the others have just recently made a stop. So the question is, can all those guys, the rest of that, that have made a stop, get to the end on just one more stop? Which I think they yes. can. Yeah, I agree. And therefore, the number 70 car, having, having pulled off that bit of a coup by getting up in second place at the three-hour mark, so he scored really good points there, I think that's probably not going to pay out towards the end of the race. We see the two Acuras battling once again for the lead of the race overall. In the turn five, and Ollie Jarvis has company, and that is Philippe Albuquerque. Philippe coming to the end of his stint. He's probably got another five laps, so he's got a much lighter car. Let's keep an eye on that. What Shea was asking that for is, when do you make your last pit stop? And so, if you stop now, you only need one more stop for those cars. Yeah. So you're trying to maximize the time that uh, you are out there, and that 70 car making that stuff will trick, I think, Jeremy, you're spot on, and so is Shea. That will trigger, the 70 Inception car coming in will trigger a whole load of stops, because no, you do well, my point is, we've seen most of them just stop recently. Just recently. Yeah, the only ones that haven't stopped recently is the 25 cars in now, uh, and the, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you know, they're, they're all, they've all been making their pit stops over the last four or five laps. But that's, is that too far out no, for those guys? I think should, you, you think uh, they can... How, we were less than two, two hours, hours ago, so no, 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 I think that should be fine. Oh, okay. I think between 60 and 70 minutes is okay. what they should be able to run, uh, all bar the number 70 car, which is run for about three days. Yeah, well, that, that was extraordinary. In for the from Pro is the... At number 25, BMW, driver change there as well. Driver change, tire change, and lots of fuel being added. John Edwards finally be given some responsibility this weekend. Oh, no, they've just dropped the car on the tire that came off of the left front, and now the driver's side door having trouble shutting once again. Now they're able to put the car back up on the air jacks, get the door closed properly, and then shut the door once again, all before the t fuel was done. So that was crisis averted for BMW M Team RLL. Mm. Goodbye, John Edwards. Let's put to bed some of that data analysis on the number 70 Inception McLaren and that pit stops. Jordan Pepper, you were just explaining to me the reason for the short fuel earlier. Yeah, well, to be honest, we were quite lucky that the one Focus Yellow fell just after Brennan finished his drive time. So we came in on a really good call. And unfortunately, as things happened, his cool suit caught the ignition switch and turned it to a position where we didn't know what was wrong, couldn't get going, and then we had to think of something different to try to get the three-hour points. Obviously, we're leading the North, um, the Endurance Cup coming into this weekend. So we short field just enough to get us past that three-hour mark. And to be honest, the way the strategy and pit stops are falling, it didn't really affect us for the, the for the overall. So we're a little bit we're a little bit on the back foot for that. But to get five points at the midway mark when our nearest rivals got nothing is really important. And with the car just literally pitting as we were standing here. You're, you reckon one more pit stop and you'll take over? Yeah, so Oli has to get his drive time done, so he just finished one hour. He'll probably more than likely stay another hour, maybe a couple of cautions, so I'm here on standby now, but as long as he goes over that hour and a half mark, then it's pretty much me to the end. So I'll just hang around here in the heat, a nice cold towel around my shoulders and wait to see what happens. But so far, so good. We don't have the pace against the, the BMWs and Astons and stuff. We're just struggling in a straight line compared to them. But uh, we're making a work on strategy, and this race is all about speed and strategy, not just one or the other. And it's not just about fuel windows and stretching fuel windows. It's about driver time and it's all very complex and I'm glad I'm standing here and not on your pit wall. Charles Clellan's your engineer, isn't he? He's got all the difficult decisions to make. Yeah, it's, well, I don't know if anyone really follows. I think we've been one of the best on strategy and it's big credits to, to the guys on the pit wall, Chaz, Ian, Bass, um, everyone there who's behind the team. It's an incredible team, you know, so when we see that we don't have the pace, we look for another way to get to the front and that's through strategy and we've done really well in the insurance races as well as in the sprint races if you guys have been following. So it's cool. It's a cool championship. This is why I love him. So this is why I enjoy coming to America. It's door to door racing as well as being one on track, but also can be one this side of the wall as well. So big shout out to my team. Two hours to well, just under two hours to go. Let's see if we can make this happen. And maybe the rain, you never know what happens with that. So the, the, the rain gods could throw some other variable in it. But I like this place. I like driving in the wet. So having fun out there, nevertheless, and let's see what we can do at the end. Well, Jeremy Thor had the, Shaw had the big thumbs up for the explanation in the middle of the race there from John Pepper. 
Um, it's important to them to get those five points. They got the five points, Jeremy. We'll deal with yeah. the rest of it in the second half of the race. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. You know, it, that's, it, was, it could be critical because it's so, there's so many cars there. If you can get an extra two or, th or three points, because all the, as I said earlier on, the, the, the leader at each point beginning uh, at the end of the race and at the three-hour mark gets five points, five points only. Uh, second place gets four, third place gets three, everybody, everybody else gets two. So if you could pull out two points on everybody else, that's a, that's a great move. And for that team, you know, it gets them right there in the, in the mix now, heading into you know, the, the final portion of this race, of course, and then the, uh, the, the final race at, uh, at Petit Le Mans. So that car now holds a three-point edge over everybody else. So great strategy by the number 70 team. It's Jeremy Shaw alongside me, John Hindhoff in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Hello to uh, Rob Chalmers, to Brian, who's at Red vs Art. And hello to Sacred Coffee Sports. Thank you for your support and for keeping us going. They support Matt Campbell as well and Matthew Jaminet and Faf Motorsport, of course. Have a look at their online store at Sacred Pod. Dot com into the pit lane for Hart of Racing. Number 23, Shea Adam is down there. Driver change, Ross Gunn taking back over the controls of this Aston Martin away from Alex Riveras out of the car. Sticker Michelin's no scrub rubber being used at all by this team so far today. There is a ding on the left rear of this car, pushed in just ever so slightly, but the diffuser is still okay. Wonder how that came about, and pit board goes up, away goes Ross. Bad news if you are an Acura NSX fan. Despite their best efforts, Gradient Racing number 66 car is now an official retirement. Uh, had that big incident in the hour and a half practice on Friday, about an hour into it. Car rebuilt overnight, uh, on Saturday, excuse me. Car rebuilt overnight, ran this morning and ran very well. With, for, with Mario Farnbacher behind the wheel. It was the fastest GTD car at one time. In fact, I think it finished fastest. But some other gremlins have come to light. They had a misfire, changed the turbo, and now it is officially a retirement. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, see, he's up at the front. Um, the, the gaps after the pit stops, so let's say three laps after the pit stops, whenever he's right up back up to speed, was four seconds between first and second, then another six seconds back to the third place car. Now, there's a total of uh, 4.7 seconds between those three cars. Yeah, so uh, the second place car, number 10, is closed on number 60, and the 01 Renga van der Zander is closing quite rapidly on those other two. Meanwhile, the fourth place car, Earl Bamba, the gap back to him from the number 01 is about the same, 31 seconds. Uh, we've got Albuquerque obviously coming in uh, in the next couple of laps, so his position is, a, is slightly false at the moment. Uh, and then it will be... Ollie Jarvis uh, in how long? Yeah, he's, uh, he's in another... Eight laps, nine laps. laps. Yeah. So it, will be, it should be Albuquerque who's uh, at next into the pit lane in the number 10 car. Uh, and what weather on its way as well, we're hearing at the moment. Stage one weather warning. Uh, a storm blowing up in the southwest. So this could be mm. even more interesting in terms of what decisions people make. Uh, as you know, if you're a regular IMSA follower, the uh, regulations surround not necessarily what it's doing here, but what it's doing around us, particularly if there is electrical activity in the storm and uh, lightning strikes within a certain radius of the track means that everyone has to seek shelter and that means the race has to be suspended we've seen that uh, in the past most notably at Sebring uh, earlier in the year for the uh, WEC event yeah right right now here the, uh, the the local weather that I have here says uh, thunderstorms possible around 3 45 p.m. so that's a little bit less than an hour from now we've got an hour and 45 minutes remaining in this race if we have a bit of rain, OK. If we have yeah, a thunderstorm, not yeah. good. No. I do like a bit of just add water, but uh, thunderstorm means everything has to come to a halt. Here's the leader in the pit lane, as we predicted. Philippe Albuquerque then already lost that second place because of the tightness of the top three that Jeremy was explaining. Renga van der Zander in Cadillac 01 has gone through. 
and this will be a another crucial stop an hour and 44 minutes they've got this one and two more stops to the end uh, if they stay green all the way through it's like a uh, trying to see if that's a slightly scrubbed set that's going on hard to say very efficient pit stop from the Cunningham and Alta Wayne Taylor racing crew car is back on the floor they're waiting for the VP racing fuel they want every last drop of this this car can do around about 40 42 minutes and there's an hour and 40 to 44 to go so that's 104 minutes as it leaves the pits so that's two two of those would be 88 minutes and that would leave you around about 15 20 minutes and about 20 minutes as a short fill at the end that was the splash that I was talking about early on unless of course something happens to allow them somewhere around about halfway into a stint to be able to get back into the pit lane and stage two weather has just been called that's prepare for inclement weather penalty for tyre operation oh fire in the pit lane it is the second place LMP3 car Joe Bradley is there I, I, I'm staying as far away as I can possibly be. Um, it looked all like it was all going pretty fine. The, uh, the car came to a halt, and then there's some sort of conflagration. I'm not sure if it's brakes, John, that's caught uh, a hold, and uh, fire extinguishers now pretty much all over the car, so I think that might be okay. under the engine cover. I'll have a look when I get closer, or it, it, whether, whether I do at all. It's the 30 car, Garrett Grist, in the Junior 3 racing. Second place in the class. We have the leader in uh, at the moment as well. That's Anders Fjordbach for high class racing which means that Sebastian Montoya has taken over the lead for Dragon Speed in the number 81 and racing team Netherlands Dylan Murray has gone through in the second place but that's always a scary moment and all the teams around would pitch in and help there there's a bit of a congratulatory slap from the guys I think the fuel hose came out the way they're looking at the fuel hose at the moment I think that uh, didn't either didn't lock in or didn't shut off when it was meant to. They're looking at what's called the buck eye there, and yeah. they are going to take off the engine cover. That's brave because you're adding oxygen to that. But I think they're fairly certain that it's okay. Uh, that, that, that's the car that leads the points in the LMP3 regular season championship. We've only had two rounds of that so far. But uh, that was a car that, that was leading coming into this weekend. And they've had a really good run. They finished second in each of the first two races of the season in LMP3 that count toward the season-long championship. Uh, Joe Bradley has confirmed my supposition. It was a refueling issue that caught, caught fire and dealt with very quickly indeed by those around so well done to everybody for that scary thing in a pit lane so just on 100 minutes to go van der zander has made his pit stop uh, excuse me um the number 10 car philippe albuquerque now in that car they've made their pit stop they stopped before everybody else and so they're going to be out for about 40 minutes. That'll take them to about an hour to go. Then from there, another 40 minutes, about 20 minutes to go. That's the calculation that we were doing earlier on in our heads, and it's still playing out. Oliver Jarvis, who leads the motor race at the moment by all of 3.2 seconds, he's completed 16 of what have been 26 or 27 lap runs for that car. Renger van der Zander will pit next of the leaders. He's on lap 20, as is the Cadillac Racing teammate of Earl Bamba. In fact, he'll go through to lap 21 when he comes across the line in a moment or two's time. And Mike Conway from Wheel and Engineering, the 31 car in fifth position. He's due in in about three laps time. He's working lap 23 at the moment. There's Earl Bamba going through onto his 22nd lap. 
And let's go down to Sheer Adam, who has some news on that Mike Conway number 31. There is a new driver ready to take this car to the end of the race. Do you think it's Pippo Durrani? It's Olivier Plois. Oh. They're putting Plois into the end. And remember, Olivier won this race in 2019 in a Mazda, and he raced here in an Acura last year. I think he might be the best guy as far as car knowledge going up against the competition. Very interesting. Yeah. So Plois to take it to the end with two stops. So Mike Conway will do three more laps. That's about six... So let's call it seven minutes. It's going to be about an hour and a half. Yeah, that's going to be tight. That is going to be tight, but I think it's doable for them. If they can get it down to about an hour and a half, that's nine minutes away, two 45-minute stints. I'm not sure they'll be able to go full on because they've only been doing 40 minutes in that car. So they need a little bit of fuel save from Olivier Pla if he's going to get to the end with one more stop. Oli Jarvis, he's going to do another 10 laps. So that's going to take him to, what's it, let's see, lapping in, 33s. So that's about another 15 minutes, an hour and 20. Interesting. That's going to be two 40 minutes dint. Yeah, but I, I think Oli Jarvis can do it on two more stops from here. I think that's what they're looking to do. And that would be very, very impressive. It's a question of how short the stop is for the number 10 at the end. I, I don't think even with that, they're going to be close enough, if I'm honest. So this one... For me, Shank's in the driving seat if it stays great. And where the yellows fly after that, let's see. Of course, that's me, and I've been up since 5 o'clock this morning, and I did that in my head. So that could be entirely, entirely spurious. No, that's about right. I, I, I concur with that. Um, and... Um... Yeah, the, the other classes, it's still a great fight going on in LMP2. We saw a pit stop for the number 20 car about three, four or five laps ago. The 29 car was in a couple of laps after that. The number 81 car, Seb Montoya, then uh, he'll be due a pit stop pretty soon in that car that's now leading, the Dragon Speed car. And uh, meanwhile, in uh, LMP3, uh, Felipe Fraga has a, uh, the got a whole lap I think on number 54 cards up to second place in the class a pit stop here for number one what was this ah that was that was a little while ago yeah. the car came down early and it looked to me as though it dropped onto Brian Sellers's right foot and that will have been very painful indeed yeah he was behind the wall see that again. getting a little bit of attention so we'll try and get down there and find out if he's going to do any more driving. He was helping the pit stop. And see that. just had his right foot underneath the sill and it came down too early. He did manage to get his foot out, but uh, still and all. At least, uh, at least it wasn't the full weight of the car. I mean, it was just that the gap between the sill and the floor was, it was yeah. a bit less than, than, than the, the depth of his, of his uh, Correct. toes. Correct. They had to it, lift it the car back. If, it wasn't as if the wheel felt, you know, was a... The wheel was off on the other side, actually. Yeah. They didn't get it back on. Uh, that might have helped him, too. A lot of cars getting their final warning for track limits as Shea Adam gives us news from the pit lane. Mike Conway is out of a race car, and it is not a Toyota. It is a Cadillac, the Whelan Engineering, number 31. Beautiful red machine out around the circuit. Well, right now it's in the pit box for four new Michelin tires. And as I mentioned, Pippo Durrani being installed for this final sequence, just waiting on fuel at this stage. Well, we've just seen the number 30 being brought in. That's a Junior 3 Racing Ligier. Uh, Garrett Gris, the driver, I brought it in. And then, really, uh, circumstances prevailed there, Garrett, and a, refu Garrett, and a refueling issue and a fire. And now we've had to retire the car. That was really, really bad look. Yeah, it's too bad. I mean, we came in leading points. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the issue was there, but uh, yeah, yeah, we've had to retire. We had a couple issues all race long, to be honest, but we still were kind of holding our own, and I think looking good for a podium, so 
yeah, not a good point today, but it happens. Yeah, I mean, you guys were doing so well. You were in second there when you brought the car in. It's, it's you know, no consolation, but bad luck to you guys. Yeah, I mean, we had broken jacks, so every pit stop was quite long. Um, I, we, we never had that happen before, so that's weird. Yeah, but yeah, no, no consolation, but we'll be back next weekend. Sure you will. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Joe Bradley. So Olivier Pla in the Whalen Engineering Racing Cadillac. And he has an hour and 35 minutes when he got in that car. Meantime, in GT Daytona, cracking battles four wide across the line under our feet a moment or two ago. Uh, and the Faf Porsche with company from Lexus and AMG down into the outer loop at the moment, with the Lexus trying to get up the inside, the plaid Porsche, this is the number nine car, and running at the moment in second place for Matthew Jaminet, and it's Kyle Kirkwood yeah. in the number 14, and behind, right behind them is Mauro Engel, fourth place at GT4 for WeatherTech Racing. Which means that Philip Ellis has pulled away from this battle because he would, that was a four-car train only a couple of laps or so ago, and all of a sudden now uh, Phil Ellis, uh, he, uh, in that windward number 57 Mercedes, he's pulled out to a couple of seconds over this uh, one, two, three-car train. Yeah, and uh, the GT Pro leader is Risi Competizione, yeah, of course. Yeah, a good lead, too. Uh, and that is uh, the better part of half a minute uh, that uh, they've got uh, on the rest of the GT Pro runners. But this battle for second is enthralling between Matthew Giamini and the 9 Faf Porsche. Coming to the end of the lap now, so if you're in the front straight grandstands, it's the three cars coming out of the final corner now. Matthew Giamini, Carl Kirkwood and Mauro Engel in that order. For Faf Motorsports Porsche, the Vassar Sullivan Lexus and the WeatherTech Racing, the white, blue and red AMG GT3. And they have been absolutely on it. Ah, the big mistake by Jaminet went miles off at turn number 10 and then had to check up. And that's what caused that four wide moment, which was all a bit scary for... The car's coming through, that looked like the high-class racing car coming through there as well with the racing team Nederland car. They're battling for position uh, as well. They're third and fourth in LMP2 going okay. through that, and they're all off the track at various parts wow. so of that, that lap. So that's when Jaminet got ahead then of the number 14 car because he was behind it. Uh, the order was just a couple laps ago, 57, 14, 9, 79. It shuffled around several times within a couple of corners there, John, didn't it? It certainly did. <laughs> uh, Multi-class racing at its best. Saw some uh, rather disturbing images a moment ago on replay here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre of Brian Sellers uh, looking like he got his foot caught under the number one BMW M4 at GT3. Joe Bradley is with Brian now. Brian, they say motor racing is dangerous. I'm not sure that's what they had in mind. That looks painful. Yeah, it uh, hurts a little bit. It's unfortunate to say... Uh, Rookie move on my part, to be honest. <laughs> it's never happened to you before, I bet. Uh, no, it hasn't, but that's because you know better than to do something like have your foot under the car during a driver change practice. So, ah, it hurts. I got one more left, so. All right, it's my job now to take your mind off the pin. I know you've got a nice pack on that. So far, so good for the number one. How's it going as the leader comes in from the overall leader, that is, comes in, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I think we're pretty good. The car feels good. This heat, uh, I think, is playing a little bit of havoc on everybody. Um, but I'm pretty happy so far. I mean, it uh, looks like the rain's coming uh, pretty quick. So we'll see. I think that'll change everything up quite a bit. I hope that doesn't keep you up too much tonight, mate. Ranger Van is and hot out of the 01 Cadillac. It's tough work out there with all this traffic and battling. I had to laugh because when you brought the car in, the crew looked at the right rear corner and went, hey, where'd that ding come from? It's elbows out out on the track, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, I had a tough time. I mean, um, I think we don't have the pace to, uh, to really attack like without any uh, chaos. And luckily, it's a lot of chaos, so... Uh, Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can attack a little later on, but um, I gave it everything I had. I had zero safety car, you know, full course yellow, uh, which made it very hard. In this track, I don't know, man, I, it's so intense. It's the only track where I really come out and I'm completely dizzy and uh, worn out. So it was hard work, but I loved it. It's, uh, it's such a 
cool event, such a cool track. And with these cars, it's the last time that we're going to go around this track so fast, because these cars are fast. It's awesome. Well, and you did a great job out there. Your first reaction was to come back over the wall and grab some french fries that are in this cruise pit. So you worked hard, and now you need to instantly replenish, right? Yeah, any salt I could see, I, I took it. So uh, it's uh, a bit of sugar and a bit of salt, and there we go again. But let's see what we do with strategy. It's uh, Seb in the car now. He's, uh, he's, he's very fast. So um, hopefully we can attack a little bit. And uh, let's see what comes at the end. There are some dark clouds coming out there. So uh, sometimes some gusts of wind in the car that you could really feel picking up. So that's, uh, that's a big of an influence. But it's, um, we'll see. Good luck. Thank you very much. Temperature has dropped seven Celsius and on the track and uh, round about, uh, what, 10 Fahrenheit, a little, little more than that, actually, 113 Fahrenheit and 45 Celsius. Full course yellow, full course yellow. The carbon car has gone in really hard. This is the Lamborghini, uh, and this is going to be a lengthy clear up. Early stop for Oli Jarvis, who got... Uh, now, did Jarvis get out of the car or did they just refill it? Down at the turn seven area, it was the battling LMP two cars that drove the Roger Dubois sponsored Carbon Lamborghini into the wall at turn seven. That was a, a knock on effect. We saw exactly the same at Le Mans that took the Corvette out. It was the high class car and the Racing Team Netherlands car, first, second and third in LMP2 together. And the unwitting incident was for the car barn machine. And that was Jeff Westfall minding his own business, staying out the way in the 39 car. And that's destroyed the front end of that Lamborghini. I can see Jeff moving around in the car on the outside of turn number seven. But that's going to take a little bit of clear up. Now, that is was that, really naughty. That was naughty by all of those P2 cars. Montoya yeah. was right in front of them. He had cleared, but then side by side, bit of side drafting, and trying to elbow some room as they were going past the GT3 car. So two, hour, two hours and 37 uh, minutes, that uh, green flag. Um, of green flag racing since the previous full course caution, but that was a, a big shunt there, and that was uh, that was really some irresponsible driving between both of those two. I, I'd like to have a look at that again and see if there's anybody who has more blame than the other. But they were leaning on each other, and that 39 car absolutely innocent, as John said. No doubt on that, Jeremy. The other interesting thing that had just happened there uh, was a stop. Ran about four, maybe five laps early for Oli Jarvis and the car that uh, was leaving for Maya Shank Racing. Uh, what was the score down there, Shit? Well, let's ask the man with his name over the door, Mike Shank. It seemed like the stop was a little bit early this time around. What caused that? I'm just glad it was because the yellow came out right after that. Uh, we wanted to beat the 10 out. And we had, you know, so if we do that, we, you know, we know we got to you know, be careful here at the end fuel-wise, but we, we didn't want to lose track position to them. That's all it was. So nothing wrong with the car. Tire life seems pretty good with you guys. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, it's this pace and the quality of these, all those are only seven cars. Everybody, this is just cutthroat as I've ever been in. And that includes IndyCar. I mean, this is really, <laughs> really tough, so. And now you're good to go to the end with this yellow. It helps you out and make you there? Yeah, it should help us here. Uh, both guys, engineers, team, just doing a great job in the pit lane all day. And, uh, Oh boy, I will see what's going on. He's got to dive back on heads, but that's very kind of Mike Schenk to take a few moments to talk to us. Right. <laughs> Robert, Robert McGinnis is a black and white, would you believe? Um, so I shouldn't really be talking to you. Uh, the 39 Carbon uh, Lamborghini, Robert, has just gone off in a most awful way, and I know. I not going to have to interrupt you there. We've got a red flag, a red flag for severe weather approaching. Red flag. So if you're here at the track, please take precautions and seek shelter. This is a red flag situation. And everyone, therefore, will come into the pit lane. That also means our pit reporters need to seek shelter as well. Uh, and uh, as soon as the officials are off the pit lane, we'll have to leave as well. 
So we have now come under a red flag for weather. That stop for Oli Jarvis. Let's just go back to that for a moment. It was early. They were taking the opportunity, Jeremy, to get Oli in and out and not lose the lead to Philippe Albuquerque. And that is exactly what they have done. But had the crash already happened? No. Well, that's my point. They were, they were really, in that case, they were really lucky. Well, that's what Mike said in the interview. Yeah, he said right. we were really, we, if we didn't, if we hadn't done it, we would have had the red, the yellow, and therefore then the they, red. They run the risk of a correct. They run the risk of a yellow. Correct. Yikes. So this is a minimum, a minimum of a 30-minute weather delay, uh, and then it will be a reassess. Uh, so we are off. The track and all the cars will line up in the. Has the clock stopped? It seems to. Have stopped. Uh, no, it's still running. Clock is still running. Mm, this clock isn't. So, uh, so if, in fact, we're not on the PA now. We've already been taken off the PA because they are already doing the. Um, uh, they wanted the to make the weather announcements. Unfortunately, we don't now have any pictures uh, because for some reason our feed is showing the severe uh, weather slate. So those of you uh, watching on the international feed, I'm not sure what you're seeing at the moment. If you're seeing the severe weather slate, then you're seeing the same as us. If you're seeing any pictures, uh, unfortunately, we aren't seeing those at the moment. And therefore, I can't tell you so we're going back to turning the clock back to Sebring WEC. Uh, I blame Joe Bradley for this. Uh, this that, was, that was your fault last time, Joe. Well, I, I think I've exited it because I was just about to speak to a mag whose father used to play for Newcastle in the 80s alongside Gascoigne. Everybody in the US has no idea what we're talking about. Newcastle so United at Rob, Sunderland. Rob, Robert McGuinness, is, uh, his heritage is northeast of England. And he's got black and white stripes on his helmet. So I expect you to give him as much grief as possible for the remainder of the IMSA season. Uh, yeah, he's not going to try get the drive in the Sunderland Porsche then, is he? Uh, for for uh, Porsche team Penske. So not much we can do about this at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, the uh, There are still people wandering around in the pit lane, but uh, the protocol... It is that our pit lane reporters have to leave and seek shelter, so we can't get any uh, interviews for you, and we're not seeing any pictures at the moment. So, not really sure what we do here, to be quite honest. Um, we've got a 30 minute, three zero minute delay. Uh, Jeremy, I'll let you take a quick drink, and we'll, we'll round up what we've got here. The situation is that the two Acuras are still first and second uh, at uh, the red flag, and that stopped by Oli Jarvis and the Meyer Shank Racing Team. They calculated they could get in and out and keep track position here, yeah. and that has absolutely paid off for them. In spades, the yellow flag would have been bad enough for the Lamborghini crash, but the red flag would have really been an absolute nightmare for them. Um, yellow or red would have had the same effect because uh, the pits would have been closed, so they, they, were due, they, they would have taken the opportunity to come in uh, under a caution, but by doing so, they would have fallen behind all the cars that had already pitted, which was all of the other cars in DPI, so they would have gone from first to last. So, uh, yeah, incredibly fortunate for them that they came in, they chose that lap to come in, which was just a lap after the Cadillac, so I'm sure they were covering off the Cadillacs there, uh, as well as number 10 car. Uh, uh, to, so great call by that team, and you know, luck, lucky and good, because uh, they, they made the call for the right reasons, and it's paid off for them. Uh, a minimum of half an hour before we reassess. We'll take this opportunity with nothing going on to take you back a couple of weekends ago when the president of IMSA, John Doonan, was with us at Haggerty Radio Le Mans, and we sat him down to talk him about the to talk to him about the uh, state of sports car racing internationally, and also try to get some information out of him about IMSA going forward for the rest of 22 and 2023.
uh, come certainly 2024 by the time that Lamborghini comes in. And I, th I was saying to somebody yesterday, now we've seen some pretty interesting designs as we've spoken about, but if we know anything about Lamborghini, oh. what are they going to come up with, John? <laughs> I said, that you, you read my mind. Yesterday I said to someone, you think this is good, wait till you see mm. what's, what else is, is coming along here, because you know uh, the styling cues of some of these brands that are committing uh, on the road car side are incredible, and then they're going to take it to the next level um, uh, and the prototype uh, uh, design cues and styling. So super excited about where we're headed uh, for those who have committed. Um, and then, of course, uh, more, more yet to come. Easy to look at this now and say, well, of course it was a good idea. And of course the manufacturers were going to jump in. But at that reveal, that announcement at Daytona, which it was, you know, just a couple of years ago, just before the big full course yellow, as <laughs> Eve always, always calls it, it seems even more prescient now than it was then. Uh, no question. Um, I said it a few times, um, what we're doing now is what the manufacturers have asked for, what uh, the, the tire partners have asked for, uh, you know, consistency, and ultimately what the fans uh, have asked for, I think, maybe not so vocally, but deserve. And uh, with, the, with the brands that have committed, um, with the teams they're aligned with, uh, we're in for an incredible Rolex 24. And of course, uh, fast forward a year from now here at Le Mans, and uh, you're gonna have in both places the best of the best. Let's pick up a little bit of housekeeping with IMSA. Uh, we've got the Sailens six out of the Glen coming up. Another marquee race right off the back of, of Le Mans. A lot of people, including us, heading back there and, and yourself. That'll be a big weekend. Looming on the horizon is Canadian Time Motorsport Park. We've yeah. not been there for a couple of years. You and the rest of IMSA have been absolutely clear that you wanted to get back to that great circuit and to the Canadian fans as quick as possible. The opportunity has presented itself. It seems that not all the teams will decide to go. Why is it important that that race happens? And that, I mean, in some ways, John, is that a stake in the, sta in the sand from IMSA to say, look, we have to do this now? Well, first, at Watkins Glen, uh, I think you probably ought to try to get a parking spot now because uh, <laughs> we're going to have 50 cars in the six hour. Uh, we're going to have over 40 in Pilot Challenge. And you combined in Carrera Cup and Super Trofeo and MX-5 Cup, there's going to be over 200 race cars at the Glen. Yes, and I'm chained to the box for all of that. I won't be moving. <laughs> OK, good. Um, but when it comes to Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, uh, you're right. Uh, in fact, the last time I was there, uh, I was wearing a different shirt and I was mm. standing in, in uh, the winter circle. But um, first of all, Miles Brandt, Ron Fellows, uh, Carlo Fadani, they have hung in there uh, when we couldn't race there for three years. Um, the momentum going into this race um, is is monumental. They're going to have a huge crowd, a lot of pent up energy. You know how passionate the Canadian fans are uh, for what we do and especially what we do at, at Canadian Tire. So um, we're going. We have an agreement to go. Uh, they can hold a race. Um, obviously, the, the vaccine mandate uh, have have uh, been a little bit of a challenge, but candidly, we're going to have a solid field in WeatherTech. We're going to have a solid field in, in Michelin Pilot, and we're going to put on an amazing show. I, I don't want to bring politics into this at all, but IMSA has, has continued to race in the U.S. over the last two years when, what, 40, 45 percent? Of, of the people who are in that paddock have had to come from out of out of the US? I mean, is that a f fair point to make to the people who say, why are we going? There's no question. Uh, you know, when the world stopped, as you said, or we put out the full course yellow, um, we immediately started working with customs. You know, you, Eve, and, and the team, uh, obviously, we, we wanted to get you guys back uh, in the States as well. But you're right, over 40% of our paddock comes from outside the U.S. They found a way uh, to get in. Uh, we found a way to get them in. Um, and we were able to keep the championship going in full in, in, in full schedule. So mm. um, we ought to go to Canada and do the same. And, and kudos to the Canadian team, some of which relocated, by the way, to make sure they could still compete uh, in IMSA, moved south of the border to make sure that they could still uh, make their ob obligations. Um, the rest of the season comes pretty thick and fast after that. It's tradition that you and I have a sit down 
and chat about the next season at Road America. And I'm looking forward to that. Come on, John, it's just me and you. Give us, <laughs> give us a little, give me a little hint. What are we, what are we going to see? The, the watchword over the last few years for IMSA and the schedule has been date equity. And building on that has been a real cornerstone. Yep. Uh, any, any likely surprises that we're going to see? Uh, there may be some. I like to, <laughs> I like to surprise you. I like to, to surprise our audience. Um, you're right. Uh, date and venue equity is critically important. Um, we're super proud of our NBC partnership, as you know. Um, you all and, and your team do an incredible job of, of telling our story around the world. Obviously, in the States, uh, we have NBC, we have mm -hmm. USA Network. So a lot of the schedule dates are driven by uh, television windows, uh, whether it's a network show or a cable show. Uh, so that plays into the dates. Uh, venues, you're right. Um, we're going to do the roar and the race back to back in January again. We're going to uh, go visit uh, Sebring and, and uh, bring uh, the Super Sebring back with WEC and, and those types of things but there are a few uh, slight adjustments we're going to make uh, more to come on that uh, but we're, we're super excited about what 23 is going to look like with the new content on track and then um, besides my day job um, I'm back in the race team business as you Ooh, know oh right uh, yeah uh, a year from now uh, we're going to be bringing a special entry here to Lamont I've got so many questions about that schedule that I know <laughs> I can't ask now but thank you for sharing that John that's a good point. Let's fast forward uh, a year. Uh, the What is termed Garage 56 here at uh, Le Mans, because for so long there were only 55 garages, one was laid out for uh, an innovative, innovative uh, car yeah. or something different. I've always said that Garage 56 isn't a place, it's a state of mind. And for Garage 56 in 2023, the 100th anniversary of the first running of Le Mans, we're going back in time because we're going back to the 1970s and bringing a cup car to race at Le Mans. Yeah, it, it, again, you, you see me giggling. This is the little boy on the other side, of the, <laughs> other side of the fence. Um, but this race, just like Rolex 24, just like Sebring, has been a place where automotive technology has made a breakthrough. Mm. We know that from the rearview mirror to uh, hybrid systems, if you fast forward, um, to uh, tire testing. Um, and what is gonna happen here next year, as you point out, is uh, absolutely a little bit of a throwback, um, but it's also uh, a little bit of back to the future. Um, you know, Bill France Sr. in 1976 had the idea that NASCAR ought to be on a global stage. And he brought a few teams uh, over to compete. Um, you know, Herschel McGriff, who is, is going in the Hall of Fame now, uh, and, and a team uh, about, led by Junie Dunlevy came over and competed. Those two cars are actually here in Europe. Uh, we hope to have them here with us next year as we celebrate what's going to be incredible, uh, an incredible opportunity to put the next gen NASCAR Cup car uh, through uh, probably the most punishing uh, test possible, uh, 24 hours um, with the winningest team in NASCAR history, Hendrick Motorsport, uh, the winningest manufacturer in NASCAR uh, history, Chevrolet, and of course, NASCAR's tire partner, Goodyear, who of course is now working so hard with, with the LMP2 uh, program. Uh, all of those all-stars came together uh, to make this a reality. Next gen NASCAR Cup car hybrid technology in that car i mean it it, it kind of ties in with what the aco and, and imsa are doing another smile on the face of mr Turner. well we're gonna uh, much like the schedule that you want you and the the listeners want to know about we're gonna come out with the car's final specs uh, here um, we've been doing some uh, simulator testing mm -hmm. um and you know the line at the door uh you and i have no chance uh, to be behind the <laughs> to be behind the wheel um it, you know, driver like Alex Bowman, current uh, driver, has been in the sim, uh, validating the, the tire grip. Uh, a a Lama regular, Mike Rockefeller, has come and, and after validating the grip uh, with Alex Bowman, um, has, has put the car through its paces here. And then, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Jeff Gordon himself, um, key part of the Hendrick family, he's been behind the wheel. And uh, Mr. Hendrick said a few weeks ago, he said, you know, John, I've got friends I don't, uh, didn't know I had. I got, everyone's calling me wanting to drive this thing. Yeah. 
and, and I bet that's not even the start of it, uh, to be honest. People will look at that, John, and say, OK, I, I understand it isn't... Obviously, it's a car that can't run in the categories that will be at Le Mans, so that's why it's outside of the competitive of categories. But why do this? And, and why... What is what is the raison d'etre, to use the French phrase, of, of bringing that car here when it, it it would never compete here in in the current class structure? Well, uh, it starts with a vision, and that's Jim France uh, replicating uh, and, and honoring what happened in 1976 uh, by by his father's uh, vision, um, and then it's a credit to. Um, Steve Phelps, um, Steve O'Donnell, John Probst, Brandon Thomas, who've taken the NASCAR Cup Series and brought uh, what I would characterize as a modular car. And there's a, there's a great video that shows how this car comes together with obviously in a similar manner that a tub on a, on a mm. prototype. There's a, there's a safety cell around the driver, the front clip, the rear clip all come together. Uh, a manufacturer has their engine package and then, much like GTP, they have an opportunity to express a road-going brother or sister. And, you know, Ford does it with the Mustang, Chevrolet does it with the Camaro, and Toyota does it with the Camry. And so um, th this is a, an opportunity with this new car that actually runs and, and feels, based on driver feedback, like a GT car. Yeah. Um, Chase Briscoe, you know, won his first race uh, this season um, for Ford, and Mark Rushbrook and I were talking about it, and Chase says, this thing drives like an IMSA car. He's driven in the Michelin <laughs> Pilot Challenge yes. in, a, in a Mustang. So um, this is a really, really uh, special opportunity to put the car in front of a passionate group of fans here, mm -hmm. uh, in front of uh, the automakers that, that now see the opportunity that's in NASCAR. And, you know, just yesterday I was reading some some clips on social media and some folks said, oh, you know, NASCAR's taking over and, uh, you know, but you know what? IMSA is part of the NASCAR family. Yeah. Um, an incredible uh, opportunity for us to uh, leverage a lot of great resources, broadcast, mm -hmm. which you, of course, um, voice uh, for us in, in so many uh, opportunities, um, the, the Technology Center uh, up in Concord. And mm -hmm. so there is so much collaboration. Um, you know, NASCAR has their schedule, IMSA has their schedule, but in the end, there's a ton of collaboration. I'm an endurance racing fan, but I'm a motorsport fan. If it's got wheels in the keep score, that's me. Two wheels, four wheels, on road, off road. You know, you know me, John. Petrol runs through my veins. And I, I look at particularly the longer NASCAR races, that's just a single driver endurance race. That, you know, that it is. And, and they get to make changes on the fly. And no better person than doing that in his in his eight cup wins with Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss, who was walking the track here uh, earlier this week. I saw him myself, legend of the sport as a crew chief, and working to, to get that car. Who was the king of the last 25, 30 miles in those long 500 mile races? Knauss and Jimmy Johnson, they were always there with the 48 car. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities there between that. And, and I, I think it's going to be a fun forever, straight away. It is, and it's going to sound the part, I can tell you that. So uh, anyone that wants to uh, camp along the side of the road uh, during the 24 next year, uh, the ground's going to shake. Uh, the, tent, the tent flaps will be in the breeze uh, with the, when, the, when the big NASCAR V8 goes by. Uh, but you mentioned Chad, and uh, what an honor for me. I, I teased him yesterday. I said, honestly, I still can't believe I'm in conversations with you know you uh, Chad Knaus who who has written you know so many records oh. with with Jimmy um, but he came here last year yes. in a little bit of yes. a, uh, a reconnaissance mission uh, in disguise if you will <laughs> and um, and then he said to me you know wow you walk into these garages and I'm not sure everyone in the states certainly on the NASCAR side realize what it takes to accomplish the 24 hours of Le Mans. And uh, so I think that's been great. This year, uh, he's got his game face on. Um, and he's brought other Hendrick uh, colleagues along. And we've brought IMSA colleagues along to help uh, navigate what is going to be a proper entry, you know, a proper hospitality, a proper uh, pit experience for our, our guests and our partners. So um, it's going to be a blast. I'm, I'm excited because in my new role, 
I don't have a horse in the race, right? Yeah. And just like you, calling yeah. call the races, you're calling uh, what you see. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a favorite. You, you call it as you see it. Um, now, um, I'm back in the race team business with some incredible partners, uh, my colleagues at NASCAR, and uh, everybody in the Hendrick family, Chevrolet, of course, and, and Goodyear. You've got some pretty cool shirts to wear. <laughs> You're president of IMSA at the moment. That's a very cool shirt to wear. Before that, you had... Uh, Mazda Yost Racing at one stage, and now you go, are you going to? Is it going to be NASCAR Hendrick Racing? Is it going to be Chevrolet NASCAR Hendrick? That's a cool shirt, Mister Day. <laughs> uh, it's funny you said that because, of course, uh, because of a lot of the meetings, I am in you know a, a suit coat here. But I was thinking about what what I would what I do next year is maybe underneath a, a team shirt, such yeah. that when the meetings end and I can go to the garage and and be part of the team, I'll just sort of pull off the uh, the sport coat and be a team member but you know Hendrick Motorsports as the winningest team was chosen to represent uh, NASCAR um, of course Mark Rushbrook from Ford David Wilson from Toyota they're engaged with this project to understand uh, the versatility of the car and there's a lot of road courses in fact NASCAR uh, is at Sonoma this weekend yes, um, and and so um, you know uh, everybody's aware of what's going on but it's about the sport you mentioned you're you're a racer um, it's this is about what's right for the sport and putting it on a global stage. A 10-year-old John Doonan would be very excited <laughs> about this. Is this going to be a one-off then for this NASCAR? Might we see it, this cup car, might we see it in IMSA later on? And obviously, you want to make the splash here, so it's not going to pop out and do an IMSA race earlier in the season as a bit of a test. It'll come here for test day. There'll be some private testing. But later on, is there the opportunity for a non-competition run, maybe in one of the IMSA races as well? Because... Having the car here that ran at Le Mans uh, in, you know, the sale in six hours of the Glen or Petit Le Mans, that, you know, that would be pretty cool in, a, in, a, in the race rather than just driving some laps. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, it's funny you bring that up because we've talked about that. And, and frankly, what Garage 56 stands for, um, I think over time, and I had the opportunity previously to do some things with alternative fuels mm. that were unique. And obviously we... Uh, we did a road car diesel engine mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So we've done a lot of that organically, but what Garage 56 stands for is absolutely that that opportunity for innovation. Uh, we've done it organically on the IMSA side and you never know, we, we've talked about it. Um, so maybe like the schedule and maybe like the specs of the car, we'll have to come back around to that one sometime. Right, okay, that's fine. I've got a list now that I'm <laughs> gonna keep coming back to you with every time I, I speak to you. Uh, let's finish off with talking about this phenomenal collaboration that's brought together the the regulations effectively for the top class here at Le Mans in IMSA which means the biggest sports car races in the world have a, a continuity and have this this uh, con uh, this basic set of regulations that means you can run two different classes of cars within the same class and the BOP will work things out we haven't seen yet, because we haven't seen any of the GTPs racing, that working. However, we've got the opportunity for some phenomenal battles on both sides of the sports car coin here. Mm. Um, what's the situation now with IMSA, with bringing in people like Peugeot, who we'll see here next year? They've clearly got, as part of the Stellantis group, they've got some American brands like Chrysler and Dodge, which it would be talking to a fan yesterday who used to work for Chrysler, who says, I'd love to see the Pentastar back. It's not the Pentastar anymore, but yeah. you and I know that. Uh, Chrysler, Dodge, the, the opportunity for Toyota with Lexus, maybe, uh, and all of the other brands that are coming in, and Ferrari. What's, what, is the, what is the situation there, and are there any talks ongoing for either one-off entries, and how would they be seen, John, by IMSA at the Blue Riband events, or even something more series-long based as far as these hypercars are concerned? Yeah, you know, uh, convergence in general um, starts with the technical teams at both ACO and IMSA. Uh, so massive credit to Simon Hodgson and Matt Kurdock from, from our team at IMSA uh, and Terry Bouvet uh, here at the ACO. Without those technical minds and their leadership, 
we wouldn't have gotten to convergence. You know, Pierre Fion, Richard Meal, obviously representing the Endurance Commission at the FIA, and myself, we're the we're the lucky ones that get to sit with you and and do the interviews and, and talk about convergence. But in the trenches um, have been Matt, Simon, and Terry. Um, they also, frankly, um, have brought us to a place. Uh, with the OEMs, with the tire partners, with fuel partners, um, and of course on the LMDH technical regulation side, the hybrid powertrain partners, um, to bring all this together um, such that we can put a stake in the ground and say we have convergence. Um, everybody's got to go to the wind tunnel. Everybody's got to go to the track and, and show demonstrated performance. But we would love to um, with validation of those elements, welcome uh, the Stellantis group, as you said, um, to the Rolex 24 or to the 12 hours of Sebring. Um, we would love to see uh, the, the Gazoo Racing Toyotas come and compete with us. Um, we would love to see, uh, as you said, incredible fights. Uh, these auto manufacturers have used this platform of endurance sports car racing uh, to tell their brand story. And uh, as I said many times, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the fans have come. Your listeners from, from Radio Le Mans and, and Radio Show Limited have come to see the best drivers, mm. the best teams in the best race cars. And that's what Convergence is all about. I'm going to ask you a question and feel free to say it. I'm not really going to comment about that at the moment. What about Glickenhaus? Glickenhaus is the American hypercar manufacturer, and they compete with honor with the American flag. Um, can they? Could they? Would they be welcomed into IMSA? So at the moment, and for years prior to my arrival, our sporting regulations are based um, on uh, a definition of an auto manufacturer being a uh, 2,500 unit road car volume manufacturer. Um, in the end, um, we also <laughs> um, haven't written the regulations for 2023 as of yet uh, for uh, the sporting side. We haven't opened up the entry process, um, but based on current regulations, uh, it's a 2,500 unit volume. Much That's like for anybody. Exactly. Th th this is not a specific regulation for current LMH manufacturers, Glickenhaus or anybody else. No, sir. In fact, uh, I think the FIA, when it comes to being a recognized GT3 manufacturer, there are some sporting regulations in there that, that mandate a, a, a road car volume. So um, more to come on that. Uh, I guess add that to your list um, um, relative to um, you know, the schedule and, and some of the other items we talked about. But, uh, you know, we're here to see, uh, hard to believe, the 99th uh, actual running, right? We're going to have a centenary next year, and yeah. uh, it's going to be incredible. What are you looking forward to most this weekend? Uh, sitting here talking to me is, you know, part of what you've got to do, but you are a race fan at heart. Will you get to see any of the race? And, I mean, obviously you get to do something that I never do because I'm here. You get to stand on the grid just beforehand, which I'm <laughs> tremendously envious about. And 10-year-old John Doonan would be also good. What, really? I can stand on the grid at Le Mans? <laughs> but, but what are you looking forward to most this weekend, John? Well, um, I'm not sure about you and, and your team, but uh, after, after night, practice last night. I left uh, after some meetings around uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock this morning. So I, I did get uh, the opportunity to go out uh, on the circuit last night and stand on the fence uh, like, like a little boy, which was, which was awesome. Uh, we've had a great opportunity to see a lot of our manufacturer partners, um, a lot of our teams and drivers. You know, after Detroit uh, and the Belle Isle event, as you know, uh, there was a, a plane loads of, of drivers and team members that, that had to come over uh, to come over and execute. So um, if I don't have a horse in the race at the IMSA events, I certainly uh, cheer for uh, our drivers, um, which there's at least a dozen uh, that are competing. That are 19 full-timers here. Yeah. Um, and, and probably about nearly three times that who've competed in IMSA. 100%. In fact, 69% of the drivers 
in the entry list have at least one IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship start. So that's incredible. Um, I also love seeing our partners at Michelin um, mm. and their uh, massive, um, you can call it a little city, a village that they've set up uh, to, to service all the teams. I love to see them um, compete here uh, and cheer them on as well. Uh, obviously, uh, Claremont is uh, the place where they produce the tires, uh, and so it's a special moment. I get to see Scott Clark, uh, a tremendous partner from Michelin, uh, here every year, and, and hopefully he'll come join us in the States. But uh, love seeing our, our, our teams and drivers compete. Obviously, Corvette Racing, uh, Hyperpole last night, uh, so super, super pleased for them. Nick Tandy's first pull here, believe it or not. I no, couldn't believe that. I had to look that one up. John, I know how busy you are. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, we'll see and sit down with you for a cup of tea or something at the sale in six hours of the Glen, which will follow rather too quickly uh, after Le Mans. And you can hear all of that, of course, in every session of the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship and the support uh, series at the weekend and all those IMSA developmental series over on our sister station, uh, IMSA Radio. And we've got most of that in sound and vision as well. President of IMSA, John Doonan at Le Mans. A real pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you and uh, all the best to your listeners and, and thanks for tuning in uh, around the world, whether it's uh, the Le Mans 24 or uh, all of the IMSA content that we're able to provide. This programme is a Radio Show Limited production. Tell your friends there's more at RadioLeMond.com. Well, it was John Doonan talking to us at Haggerty Radio Le Mans a couple of weekends ago. We are in a severe weather hold, red flag here at Watkins Glen International. I'm making sure I'm not touching anything metal uh, in our Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Jeremy Shaw has uh, braved the wind and the weather on top of the grandstand here uh, with me. It is clearing up, Jeremy, and it's, uh, it's, it's brighter, there's far less wind, and we've had a little bit of rain, but nothing too bad. And it is brightening up from the direction uh, of the, the, the bad weather was coming in from. I better turn your mic up, sorry, yeah, go well, ahead. We, that, I love the positive thinking. I mean, where we're looking is not really where it's coming from. That's, that's south, it's coming from the west, which is kind of behind us through a, through a, a solid wall. So mm. we can't really see that perhaps. But yeah, look, I, I love the fact that it, uh, I love the optimism and I hope that's the case because at least, yeah, the track is, is certainly not in bad condition. It's, it's probably, it's, it's certainly a bit uh, damp and slippery, but uh, uh, if the, as soon as that lightning goes away, and then um, and there's a, there's a window where in which it has gone away for for was it 20 minutes I think isn't it? Then uh, you know maybe we can get get going again. There's there's still what uh, 48 minutes on the clock. Clock is still running because it is a time certain race. Uh, hashtag uh, Michelin PRT Michelin Post Race Tech at IMSA Radio. Um, there's another update coming just after four o'clock local time. Uh, I'll remind you, if you are just joining us, we're on a weather hold, severe weather warning, lightning in the area. And uh, the reason that we have to stop for that is there have been fatalities at racetracks when lightning has been in the area. And that it's the top and bottom symbol of it. It's exactly what happened at Sebring for the WEC. It wasn't raining, but it was the lightning in the area. Also, you have to stand down. The support crew, the... Uh, flag marshals, etc., etc., uh, for their own safety as well as our camera operators and everybody else who's working here. The pit lane is pretty much empty at the moment. Everybody has uh, sought shelter elsewhere. That's the situation at the moment. Ollie Jarvis had just made a pit stop and stayed in the lead for Maya Shank Racing with Curb Agajanian for the Acura DPI. Uh, of course, we put the safety car out originally for the Lamborghini that was shunted off by the two LMP2 cars, the 39 Carbon uh, Autosport uh, car, uh, and that had bunched the field back up just before the severe weather warning went in to place. So leaders in class, Juan Pablo Montoya and LMP2. LMP1 is Oli Jarvis, so that is... Uh, uh, Dragon Speed, sorry, in LMP2 with one at the Marine. Doesn't have to restart the race. Mayashank uh, in DPI. LMP3, Riley Motorsports, 
GTD Pro is Risi Competizione on their return to the series and Winward Racing in GTD. That's how it stands at the moment. There's 47 minutes left on the clock with an update coming in about 10 minutes. So what we'll do now, we're not going anywhere. We're still in the Haggerty Global Broadcast booth. If anything happens, we'll break into whatever we're playing out. So stay tuned to us, whether you're on IMSA Radio or IMSA TV. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll take you back to a couple of interviews that we picked up on Friday. A big, momentous announcement from Porsche Motorsport and Porsche Motorsport North America. Uh, Porsche Team Penske back with a GTP effort in IMSA for next year and a WEC effort as well. Two of the drivers who will be racing here in IMSA in GTP here this weekend. Uh, Cher Adam and Joe Bradley spoke to them. We'll hear Joe with uh, Mathieu Jaminet in a moment. But first, here's Cher Adam with Matty Campbell. Big news coming out today from the Porsche camp about the future of Porsche prototype racing. Matt Campbell, factory driver in the top class. How good does it feel to finally acknowledge that? Yeah, look, lots of uh, relief, you know, very honoured and... Very uh, happy to be able to move up. Um, you know, it's been the dream of mine to be able to reach the top class in prototype racing, especially with Porsche. And now for them to come back in LMBH and be a part of that program with Penske is a, a surreal feeling and, uh, yeah, something I've dreamed about for many, many years and ever since I joined Porsche, you know. Now sort of reaching the top of the Porsche pyramid, which was always the goal, and uh, now to finally achieve that is, is quite surreal. So very, very happy, very excited for next year. For sure a big challenge, but uh, ready for it and... Uh, eager to get in, involved. How long has this been in the works, you stepping into this program? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously Porsche announced, I think it was in, what was that, late 2020, uh, but they were going with LMDH. And ever since then, you know, I was always interested and very uh, eager to be involved and, and trying to speak to people and get things started. Was it you calling them or was it them calling you? I mean, a bit of both, to be honest, okay. which was which was nice. <laughs> uh, but obviously everything started to really ramp up with discussions, I would say, around the middle of last year. So quite a long time ago already. And then uh, everything's been finalised for, for quite some time now. So it's been hard to be able to keep it a secret all this time. But now, you know, obviously after today with the announcement, a lot of relief to be able to announce and, and get the news out uh, and, and prepare next year. So uh, still a lot of work to do, obviously still six months away from, from the first race, but uh, I'm sure it will come around very quick. Have you driven the car? I have driven the car a couple of times now. Uh, obviously a lot different to what I'm used to coming from the GT, um, but nevertheless feeling very comfortable already uh, after not so much time in the car. Uh, and, you know, I'll still be able to do lots of miles uh, before next year as well. So still lots to learn for sure, especially on electronics and system sides. It's quite, quite advanced to uh, what I'm used to coming from GT. But, uh, yeah, just uh, quite surreal to be a part of the program and, and see it all happening and, and starting to really unfold now, especially in the last month or two with lots happening behind the scenes. So uh, it'll only continue ramping up in, in the same direction. What's been the biggest surprise for you in driving a prototype uh, as advanced as the GTP car is? Um, good question. I mean, I think the, the good thing is, even though obviously the systems are quite complex and, and advanced from, from what we're used to, um, a lot of the things are carrying across from the RSI, which is actually quite a nice, nice thing to have. Obviously, we have a lot more systems, but the general basics and, and the way we do things in the car are carrying across quite, quite well and very similar. So that has made the adaption of the ergonomics and, and the systems in the car a lot easier to be able to get used to. Um, but for sure, you know, I still need to get used to the car and, and how it works because, you know, I've spent my whole year or whole career so far in GTs and now to be in a prototype, it's a completely different beast, especially with this car and the systems that are involved. So uh, still a lot to learn, but, you know, so far I'm feeling comfortable in the car already and now uh, I suppose the real work begins and, and learning how to get most performance out of the car. Physically, has it changed the way that you train needing to drive this car because GT cars, prototypes, completely different G-forces? Yeah, very much so. I mean, definitely feel it the first time I drove it. <laughs> um, you know, for sure I have a lot of work to do, but in saying that as well, I think we're very fortunate and lucky with the mileage that we're able to spend in the car with endurance testing and things like this. We'll be able to adapt and, and get used to it pretty quickly as well and, and, you know, being comfortable in the car and trying to be relaxed as possible is a big thing. So uh, still got lots of time to be able to prepare for next year and, and get ready. But, uh, yeah, early days and, yeah, let's see how things develop. 
You've got a different shirt on for now, but ultimately this weekend you're back with FAF. That is your championship aspiration for this year is GTD Pro. But how much focus are you paying to this new program in between times? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, it's quite a unique situation with the announcement happening on a race weekend for, for me and my... Me and Mathieu, um, you know, obviously after today and after the media commitments are over, it's full focus back to, to FAF and, and our championship campaign because uh, this is our, our biggest focus for the year. It's quite a different program to what me and Mathieu have had in the past couple of years with, you know, one main championship and, and our ultimate goal is for the, for the championship. You know, me and Mathieu want it, FAF want it. Uh, so after today's over, it's back to business as usual. But uh, obviously soaking it all up and, and a lot of relief um, you know, in the last sort of hour or so after the announcement. So it's been really nice to get off the chest, enjoy the next couple of hours, but then uh, it's back to business as usual. Yeah, but how much of this year now is spent learning the tracks, perfecting being able to drive at these circuits that the two of you, as a, a Matthew duo, have split over the last year racing in the U.S.? Yeah, obviously like the last year or so has been uh, definitely... You know, getting the experience in the US and, and ticking a lot of boxes with tracks and, and everything like that. So, uh, you know, I think I'm quite fortunate I've been able to tick a lot of boxes in the last year or two. Uh, and even for the remainder of the year, you know, we've been to all the tracks uh, and uh, quite comfortable there as well. So it makes the, the step next year um, or, you know, in the future years, if, if we do do the IMSA Championship, a lot easier uh, because we already know the tracks, we know the championship. We just have to get used to the car on these tracks and, and circuits. So uh, it's one less thing to think about. All right, last question. Uh, thinking about the calendar going forward, having driven this car, having experienced it now, Le Mans aside, what is the one race that it could be here or in the WEC that you've got circled on your calendar because you can't wait to drive the new car at that track? Um, oh, good question. I mean, I think there's a couple uh, that it would suit really well. Um, but for me, I think it would be really enjoyable at somewhere like Road America. You know, fast, um, you know, technical track, really enjoyable track, you know, no margin for error. Uh, so I think somewhere like that is a good combination for the car for sure. You know, with the regen, the hybrid system, everything like that. And, uh, you know, one thing I can say is the car is very quick in a straight line. So <laughs> I think even around a track like that, uh, we'll be uh, having quite a lot of top speed. Can't wait to see it. Congrats, Matt. Very well deserved. Yeah, thank you so much. Matthew, fantastic announcement. I really love the colour but that's yeah. the, because it's the core of my football team. <laughs> that's another thing. Uh, what's your first impressions? I mean, uh, amazed. I mean, when I, when I look at it in the end, I'm like a little kid, little child, uh, having stars in the eyes, uh, looking at the car and thinking that finally now it's official and being part of the team. So uh, loving the colors. Uh, I think the car is, is looking amazing. It's looking fast. So... Uh, and personally, yeah, it's, it's more than a dream come true to be part of such a, such a project. So, yeah, Have you no, word, no, no words. It's just like yeah. astonishing, you know. It's, it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, have, you, have you driven the car yet? Yes, I have driven the car. Uh, I've, I've, I've took part in a couple of uh, rollout sessions and uh, a test in, in Spain. Um, so, uh, yeah, even more excited because uh, I experienced the car uh, it was great, uh, loved it, uh, so yeah, it, it just makes it more exciting uh, and in the end it just makes us look forward to next year because we already want to be uh, next season and, and, and race. <laughs> yeah. and, and you personally transitioning from GT to prototypes, I would imagine that's where your sights have been set for a long time now. Yes, yeah, so exactly. I mean, when uh, I dreamed and, and joined Porsche as a junior driver back at the end of 2015, uh, the goal was always, always been to be at the top of the pyramid uh, that Porsche has in place for the for the young drivers. I joined as a junior, came from from cop cars, then went to GT, uh, had some races in the factory racing GT, and then now making the step to prototype racing, top class endurance racing. So, I mean, uh, I think that it doesn't get much more much more better in the world, you know, to race, and especially now with what's coming with this new era of prototype with all these manufacturers and best drivers in the world. Uh, I think we can look in the eyes of F1 or any any other class of, of racing in the world and say I think we we are also part of the of the top show and to be part of this yes as I say it's a dream come true and I just can say thank you to 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 Penske and Porsche to for the trust they place in me for this program um, because yeah I don't come with a background of, of single seat or anything I never drove prototype before so it's a huge huge trust that they place into me. And uh, I can just be thankful for that and, uh, and now work hard to, to perform. And also, been, you've been a Porsche driver for some time. 
you understand the pressure, the responsibility you have for the heritage. The car's being named the 963. I think that is yeah. fantastic. But also the, the colour, the livery that the, the, on the, on the uh, launch, that's harking back to the early 1970s in the 917, the 917 and the Salzburg car. You, you realise that, yeah? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, as you say, it really looks like 917. I mean, the colours really really make us think and the name obviously uh, 963 is uh, it's just a legacy of a long history of Porsche and endurance racing so for sure it puts a lot of pressure on I guess on the team uh, not only on the drivers but everyone uh, because we also know when Porsche is going to to do something and to a program is to win so uh, yeah uh, at the moment for sure we have a lot of excitement uh, of all this announcement but we have to yeah be focused and, and for sure to, to race these colors and race this name with this brand and actually I think teaming, teaming up with Penske just put it even more special yeah. so um, yeah will be a lot of pressure but I think everybody's ready for the for the challenge yeah. I can see you're excited what's the what's the program exactly what's the test program ahead uh, I actually don't really know in details uh, the test program, but obviously yeah, the car will still run in Europe and uh, in US uh, for a test program till the end of the year, and then uh, then we start racing next year. At the moment, uh, uh, that's yeah the only thing I, I pretty much know, but I don't know in details the schedule or or what I'm planning to do as well as a, as a driver. Uh, so yeah, I just wait for the call and wherever they tell me to go and drive, I'll be ready and and make sure. I do the job. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks for your time. Everyone's so excited. <laughs> Joe Bradley there talking to Mathieu Jamini for uh, us on Friday at the launch, the US launch of the GTP. The car was revealed down, the 963 was revealed down at Goodwood. Uh, it has been testing. It's in a uh, red and white with a bit of black livery with stripes on the car. It reminds me of the Salzburg car, the 1970 Le Mans winner, the number 23. Uh, very evocative. Uh, it will be uh, Porsche team Penske, Porsche Penske team actually, to get it right. He'll be running the works cars, two in the uh, US in GTP and two in at uh, uh, two in the WEC in the LMDH category as part of the LMH uh, class that they'll be running against the, the hypercars of course. JDC Miller Motorsports uh, with the customer version over here Jeremy and Jota uh, for, with the customer car uh, for the WEC with a potential for two more cars, customer cars in 2024 is what uh, Volker Holtzmeier was telling us earlier on. First of all your thoughts about Penske coming back with Porsche and JDC being part of that with a customer racing car as well. Great that Penske is going to be back and that Porsche is going to be back with the GTDs. Uh, lots of lots of history there. Lots of uh, just and, and good vibes all the way around. Really uh, tremendous opportunity for JDC Miller Motorsports. They've they've worked really hard to establish their credentials over the last well a lot of years. I mean I remember John when he was racing himself yeah. in open wheel cars. Um, you yeah, know, way back in whenever it was. And, uh, you know, he's, whatever he's run cars in, he runs them successfully and professionally and properly. And uh, they, they might not have the best of uh, budgets all the time, but they all, they're always competitive, always, always knocking on the door. What we don't know is whether Mustang Sampling will go across to that programme. They, that, that sponsorship, that partnership has moved around a little bit between between teams. Um, we've seen the colours on a uh, on cars that look the same, but have been, as I say, run by different squads. But John's operation is pretty good. I, I had a rumour that Peugeot were were knocking on his door as well, and at least offering an, an opportunity um, if they could rebrand the cars to to have a couple of, of LMHs. Well, but, but, you know. I mean, like I say, he, he has earned it, hasn't he? Because you know, his cars are always, uh, they're always beautifully presented. Uh, the, the team is, is, is run very professionally, given that you know, they don't have the biggest of budgets out there. They, you know, they don't, they're not on the same scale as, as a Chip Ganassi racing or, or uh, even, Action Ex well, even Action Express, probably. So, mm. um, you know, they, uh, they, do, they do a really good job with what they have. They've... they've uh, that, you know, they're actually lead this this coming into this weekend. Uh, that that squad is leading the Michelin Endurance Cup. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know they are they are very very capable and i think it's you know it's uh, it's very prescient of porsche, porsche to realize that and to give them this opportunity because you know you know there's there's a lot of interest in porsche coming back so there's all sorts of people want to get involved with that and um, I'm, I'm delighted that it's GDC Miller Motorsports. Clock is on a 35-minute hold here now. So we will have a 35-minute race. Uh, so uh, 10 more minutes is what we are hearing. Uh, so we'll stay on the air here from the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Uh, and uh, Jeremy Shaw and John Hindorf, Shea Adam and Joe Bradley are... Uh, being told that they can, uh, they will be able to leave their shelter shortly. We have got uh, crew members on the pit lane now, and the cars have been uncovered. So that is the word from IMSA at the moment. So we should be able to get something from our pit reporters shortly. 35 minutes on the clock at the moment. Well, I'll tell you now, Ollie, Ollie Jarvis can go 35 minutes on the fuel he's got in the tank. Um, and probably another couple of cars can as well. I'm not Does sure that the 10 car no. can do 35 minutes, so they will have to splash, still have to splash it, the, the end of uh, the, the race. We'll run down the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, timing scoring for you in just a moment. I'm going to take a few Michelin PRT questions. It, it's not post-race tech, it's kind of pre-post-race tech <laughs> uh, at the moment. Um, uh, Ian McCarthy tweeted uh, using the hashtag Michelin PRT. Uh, difficult for LMP drivers, but shouldn't the absolute priority in a battle it, to be not to end a GT team's race over gaining or defending a position? No penalty is going to get the Lamborghini back into the race. Um, it's a fair point that Ian makes. We saw it at uh, Le Mans, uh, ending Alexander Sims' race for, for Corvette with uh, a little bit of over exuberant driving and the same sort of thing today with the top three in LMP2 um, battling the it was the Dragon Speed leading uh, then it was high class racing and uh, the racing for Netherlands cars all together going past that car on the run from from six down to seven uh, I'm pretty certain from what we've seen that the Dragon Speed car had cleared it it was the other two who were getting a bit feisty and basically barged him off the track. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was sort of. It was sort of the old uh, the cannon. It was that thing. snooker it was, it was, cannon, billiards yeah. cannon. Yes, absolutely. Or, you know, the, the, the 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 swingy ball thing. You know, with five balls in a row, swing one down, and it's the one and on the other end that goes off. Yeah, absolutely. Off the road. That's what uh, the, it was. Pinballs. You know, that's what uh, poor uh, West Jeff Westfall was there. Absolutely, totally, completely innocent victim. He was right over. You know, there was there was a half a car width between himself. And the two prototypes yeah, that right were on the white I mean, it's line not, it's on not the right side. Not a hugely wide, wide track no. down there. There is room for three cars, and there might be room for four. But uh, the problem was that the, the car on the left, uh, completely on the left, uh, and the car in the middle were banging, banging doors. And then there's one more bang to the right from the car on the left, which hit the car in the middle, which then hit Westfall and just sent him off uh, like a pinball into the barrier. So yeah, really irresponsible driving, and you know. Who's going to fit the, co the you know the uh, fit the bill for that? Because who do you blame on that? Which are the drivers or both of to them? To be honest, I, I I need to see it again. Yeah, uh, both of them for, to some degree, but um, it, the guy on the outside, the, the last move that caused the that caused the problem mm. was the guy on the outside hitting the guy in the middle. And honestly, I, th th so much happened during this race, I can't personally remember which one was which, um, and and because I can't remember, I'm not going to. Talk, Indeed. You know, not going to mention that, but but the, the, that's it was a guy on the outside for me that he hit the guy on the, on the in the middle of the track who then ran into Westfall. But who initiated that in the first place is is another is another factor which we which I, again I really didn't see because there was so much going on. 35 minutes on the clock that has been held. This is the situation here at Watkins Glen International. The teams are re-preparing their cars. We are getting ready to go back to a restart here at Watkins Glen International. The irony is that although we had some rain, that's dried out. Track temperature is still 95 Fahrenheit. Once the, the 
the clouds have cleared. Um, actually, that track temperature's gone up five Fahrenheit in the, the last few minutes whilst I've been talking. Uh, we'll give you a rundown once we get closer to knowing when the cars are going to roll of who is where and whether there will be any kind of reshuffling behind. It will be a safety car restart because it will be a rolling start to the line. But I can see from our lofty position on the top of the grandstand where we've been sheltering uh, in place, uh, that it is uh, that the cars are being uncovered down on the pit lane. There are two lines of cars, one in the absolute fast lane and one uh, one lane over from that. And all the cars are on the pit lane and uncovered at the moment. We've also got IMSA officials in the pit lane and we've got team personnel in the pit lane. And shortly we'll have Joe Bradley and Shea Adam in the pit lane. In fact, let's pick... Uh, uh, pick off Shea Adam in a, a moment or two's time. At, uh, at IMSA Radio, hashtag uh, uh, Michelin PRT for our post-race tech or uh, just uh, at IMSA Radio if you want to get in touch with us now. We'll go back to normal operation given that we think uh, that we are going to get some racing for you. Thanks for staying uh, with us. Hello to uh, sometimes grouchy guy, to Jerry uh, Sisk, to Andrew Pagan, to Miss and Henry. Uh, and to right turn lover, uh, the all staying with us, Nikolai B, uh, saying, are there any FIA guidelines that the ASNs could would follow on this? Seems that uh, safety standards in other parts of the world haven't evolved since the 90s. Uh, the, 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 the stark fact here, guys, for all of you listening further afield than here at Watkins Glen, and we appreciate that we've got an international audience, I don't think... Uh, People back in Europe realise the severity of lightning and electrical storms here in the States. Uh, and there have been deaths caused by lightning at sporting events down through the years. The simple rule is if there's a lightning strike within, I think it's 20 miles, uh, please don't quote me on that because I may be wrong, but with within a certain radius of the uh, sporting venue, then everything has to be suspended and everybody has to go back to shelter in place. The green flag has just been shown. It's not really a green flag, but it means that we are counting down. So the 35 minute clock has now started to the end of the race. We have a yellow flag over the start finish line and I hear the odd one or two engines have started. Yes, they've started. We've got cars rolling on the truck track at the moment. So, Jeremy Shaw, let's have a quick look. Uh, behind the safety car, we have got cars rolling with 34 and a half minutes to go. Let's have a quick look at how it stands. This is our VP Racing Fuel in race update as we're ready to go back racing on a dry track. With the cars coming out of Park Fermi, they will not have been allowed to change tyres. It is the number 60. Now, you can change the tyres. So, Tom Blonkfist has taken over the number 60. Philippe Albuquerque stays in the Conningham and Alton number 10. So, it's Acura's first and second. The number 60 can go to the end. I don't think the number 10 can go to the end on fuel. It will be borderline for the 0-1 Cadillac. No, no, no. The 0-1 and 0-2 should be fine. They should be fine? Yep, OK, yep. thank you very much. That's Alec Lynn and still waiting for Olivier Pla to leave the pit lane. They were in just one lap before the number 60 car, the two uh, so Jurassic Cadillacs. Olivier Pla is the last car on the line leaving the pit lane. He'll be in fifth. Right. Six will be Ally Cadillac's... Mike Rockenfeller in the 48. Which is a lap down. And then Juan Ma Pablo Montoya leads LMP2 from Fabian Scherer. That's Dragon Speed from High Class Racing, 81 from 20 from 29 Racing Team Netherlands. Maybe penalties coming for some of those cars. Let's see what happens uh, when that comes for the incident with the Lamborghini number 39. In LMP3, Philippe Mefraga for Riley Motorsports leads for the number 74. Uh, squad. Colin Brown in second is a lap off the lead there and Gabby Chavez is 12 seconds so he's in the line behind Colin in third position. In GTD Pro Daniel Serra for Reese Competition leads Matt Jaminet and Kyle Kirkwood for Faf and Vassar Sullivan and in GTD, Philip Ellis, who's the second GTD car in line, leads for Winwood Racing. Roman De Angelis is three cars further back. Check that, four cars further back. And Spencer Pumpelli has another car between himself and Roman De Angelis for Corvette 
racing. Shea Adam is down in the pit lane where we have cleared the pit lane, Shea. We did, thankfully. Uh, the race cars which were parked here for that red flag period have now all vacated the lane. And we have drivers up on the wall. We have some cars that need to come in and do some pit stops because they might not have been able to make it on fuel, as Jeremy and you were talking about a few minutes ago. But it was going to be Olivier Plot at the end. Now it's going to be Pippo Durrani. He's going to be installed for this last little shootout. Yeah, I think, I think they're always going to make that change, to be perfectly honest. Cross the line and down to... A and there's a wave around going uh, on now, John, because, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so the cars that were in between the safety car and each of the class leaders can now go past the safety car and run around to the back of the lap. So that's what uh, is happening. And that's all that rather around, suddenly, yeah. didn't it? Because we there wasn't really any warning that we were going to get cars on track it again. It went so. from 10 minutes to five minutes really rather quickly. Yeah, and brilliant. the teams were uh, running around down there. Uh, down in the pit lane, Joe Bradley is uh, with us. Well, uh, I'm still blaming you for this, Joe, because <laughs> you, you, st you stopped the WEC race twice at Sebring. Yeah, it seems to be my fault. Um, I need to stop coming then, don't I? Because um, it's it's really odd. It's totally blown, totally blown the weeds out of the GTD battle because now pretty much everybody can go the whole way, whereas the worst teams relying upon the cars ahead of them stopping and then they would be able to leapfrog them. That's not going to happen anymore. To be honest, I, 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 think, I, I think probably everybody did need to make one stop in GTD yeah. in any case. Pits are open for the prototypes. Pits are open for the prototypes. Now, are we going to see then a splash of fuel for the number 10? They've, I think they've gone round. Shea Adam, what's the thinking down at the Conning and Minolta Acura pit? The 20 high-class racing car did come in and do a little bit of service, but the 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac is the only of the DPIs to venture down the pit lane during this opportunity. Uh, we've also got racing for Netherlands. That was the car involved in that bump and grind. Uh, I suspect they did some damage to the back end of the car, and I think that's probably why they brought the high-class car in as well. Fabio Scherer is taking back out. He's now lost a position to PR1 Matheson Motorsport, and the 52, the wind car, has got Huffaker to take that car to the end. That was the pole sitting car. We know that is very quick indeed. Out goes the number 31. Still listed as Oliver Pla behind the wheel. No, now it flips over to Pipo Durrani. So Wheel and Engineering in fifth position. And we will now, we are counting down under 30 minutes now. Everybody is on dry tyres. Nobody's had to put wet tyres on because the, the track temperature is still up at 36 degrees. In fact, it's climbed back to 36 degrees. Track temperature dropped to around about 89, 90 Fahrenheit. It's climbed back up to 97 now. 77% in terms of humidity and a, a pleasant 25 degrees in the air, so long as you're not in a race car. 29 minutes to go. A sprint to the finish. And, well, a... a, a Joe Bradley has an update from Racing Team Netherlands. Yeah, it uh, came in the pits in third place. It's had a rear deck replacement and damage repaired. I'm not sure how much time that's going to cause them and whether they'll drop out of that third place. Yeah, that car's going to drop to fifth position as it leaves now. It won't go any further, I don't think. And where's Josh Pearson? Uh, I, I'm, I'll take that back when we come round. Pits are, have been open for the prototypes this time round. They'll open for GTs. They're, presumably they'll open for GTs this time around. So we're not going to get running for at least another uh, three and a half or four minutes. Another lap, there'll be one more, at least one more lap of yellow flag. And that's great news for Wayne Taylor and Conington and Minolta. I reckon, they were, 20, they were 20 minutes short of being able to do it on a pit on what on the, the same pit stops of everybody else. They would have needed an extra 20 minutes of fuel. Now they've been doing 40 minutes uh, in that car, sometimes stretching it to 42 or 43. So if they can get down to somewhere near 20 minutes, 
they might be able to get to the end, 23, 24 minutes. But it's, I still think it's going to be tight, and I don't think they can run full rich. And that's not a problem that Tom Blomqvist is going to have, Jeremy, because he's already been out. That car's only been out for a couple of laps before the red flag came out, and some of those were under yellow. So I think Blomqvist yeah. is full rich to the end from here. And basically, they've slapped around the young lad, called these family bad names, and uh, fed him raw meat before they put him into that one. He's just got to drive flat out. Yeah, he, yeah. Uh, you know, the um, he he came into the pits and pretty much moments later, uh, the, the yellow came out and then red very soon after that. So he hasn't he has not done a racing lap in that number 60 car. So he should be absolutely no problem at all for him. Uh, and uh, number 10 car, yeah, I'm not quite sure. It, it'll be that, that's one that's going to be tight. The 31 car, you know, elected to come in and change the driver in any case because they were out of they were out of contention totally. Uh, this has brought them back into contention, particularly if you put Pippo Durrani in the car, which is what they've done. They didn't have to come in to change the driver. They could have changed the driver at the restart. Um, oh, could they? Yeah, you don't okay. have to put the same driver in after the red flag. Joe Bradley's just been. Uh, Joe Bradley's just been. Oh, do, yes, you do. Sorry, I'm talking complete nonsense. Because uh, Blomqvist was already in the car, Correct. wasn't he? Um, he'd already made that change. Sorry, yeah. Jeremy. That was uh, that was that's my error. Um, Joe Bradley, you've been watching some GT pit stops. Yeah, the number one, the number one in particular, the Paul Miller BMW. That car has come in. Madison Snow has stepped out of the car and handed the car over. And I'm not uh, really sure why that has to be. Is that in the regs that you have to start with the driver that uh, you finished with when the stoppage came? Yeah. Yeah, you know... Madison was in at the stoppage. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, he they have to put that driver back in. That was what I was just getting myself all mixed up about. Um, uh, he did take it back out. He restarted. Basically, he, he's basically he's restarted behind the safety car, and and then they've come in and they put Brian Sellers, bad foot and all, right foot. Well, uh, all he's got to do is push that one all the way at the floor at this point, hasn't he, uh, for that car? And they'll be looking to get as far up the field as they can uh, to try. They're four. They were uh, went out in fourth position. Um, they'll be looking to get far up because they are looking for the Michelin Endurance Cup points as well. Um, although they missed Daytona, so they're, they're going to uh, be a bit further out. DPI yeah. class split is happening now, and then we will go to green. We're going to have about just over 20 minutes to run. This is going to be an absolute flat-out blast, and I'm going to predict that the number 10 car will run out of fuel with a lap and a half to go. There you go, if they've got a race. Or they'll, or they'll splash before the end. Uh, we won't. We are not going. We are not going green this time Correct. around. This helps the number ten car. Shea Adam. It was drive time. That's why Madison Snow had to get out and Brian Sellers had to get back in. It has been adjusted for the different classes. One hour and seventeen minute for the GT classes and LMP3 and LMP2. And for DPI, it's dropped down now. I think it was thirty nine minutes minimum time. Answering Carol Brink's question on at IMSA Radio, how about drive time? So there we are, you ha we have that answer. Still full course, yellow at the line, and I'm looking down there, Tani's still got the double yellows. So next time by, we should see the Cadillac safety car pull into the pit lane, giving everyone a chance to get their Michelin tyres up to pressure. Oh, into the pit lane for the number 81. This is the leader in LMP2. The leader in LMP2 is in the pit lane. Shea Adam. This is unexpected. Uh, the team is up on the wall for this stop. They are doing fuel and a drive change. It is Sebastian Montoya who's going to be taking this car to the end. I wonder if maybe he hadn't gotten a minimum time yet. Juan Pablo Montoya walking out, walking over to the wall and pointing to his crew guys to say, yeah, I need to be on the other side of the wall, guys. And Aero Motorsport came in as well. That was Ryan Del uh, DL who came in in the number 18, the very nice blue car. But this is huge for LMP2. And this means that the car that started on pole position, that dropped down as low as, I think, sixth place at one stage, 
But for the 52 PR1 Matheson, the wins car is back in the lead of the race, but has Louis Delatraz in the Tower Motorsport. They've been there or thereabouts, right up his tailpipes. And then Fabio Scherer for high class racing in the number 20, the red and white car, is right there as well. That's going to be a real dogfight in LMP2. It certainly is. I mean, some very talented drivers there as well. The young American, Scott Huffaker, he's going to have his work cut out here to maintain that lead. Uh, and I'm presuming that was a, a, a drive time thing also for that number 81 car, JPM getting out and, and uh, the kid Montoya, the, the, the youngster getting back in again. We've seen how aggressive he has been already today, uh, but uh, a nice chat with him this morning, really impressive young man actually. Yes, he is. And um, he's going to be charging from there. Uh, the, the, he, the, we've got five cars on the lead lap then in, in P2. We've got number eight, uh, 52, number eight, number 20 to 29, and the 81 at the tail of it. Uh, but uh, Montour, Sebastian's got to sort of hustle around now to uh, to take up his position. The lights are out on the uh, Cadillac safety car, so we should be going back to green this time around. It'll be about uh, just over 20 minutes remaining. It's Jeremy Shaw and John Heindorf in the booth. Another chance to get into the end of here without another caution. Sun's out, sort of. Sun is out, and the track has dried. The major part of the track has dried. It's going to be just on 20 minutes to go, and maybe then, yeah. just maybe, that is enough for the number 10, Connington Minolta Acura, to get a result, maybe not at full speed. Got to watch the Cadillacs here. They'll want to get a good start. The two Acuras have jumped away straight away through the final corner. We're green flag racing with 21 minutes on the nose to go from the sale and six hours at the Glen for 2022, live on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Thanks for staying with us through the weather hold. Down through turns one and two. All those curbs are going to be wet. That's where the slipperiness is going to be. This could be very interesting through the inner loop. First time around, top three are broken away. Sebastian Bourdais in the 0-1 is looking for a victory. Hasn't really been on it this weekend. Not as much as he should do. Round the outside to the lead. There goes the number 10 car. That's a fabulous move by Felipe. And he's gone to the lead. That's exactly what happened at the very beginning of the race. The Correct. number 10 car has better straight line speed, it would appear, than the number 60. Got the draft, took advantage of it, and a very forceful move around the outside into the inner loop. Tom Blancfist, though, maybe just a little more downforce on that car. So will he be able to use that to his advantage in the next 20 minutes and 10 seconds? Really was a huge top speed advantage for the Koninkham and Alta car. Oh, there was a little bit of a, a brush on the side of those two cars as he went through. I think Blomqvist pretty much held his line, but Albuquerque was not to be denied. Blomqvist, no, he slightly moved across to the left there. I'll take that back. And the curbs through there, and Ollie Jarvis, after two second places in a row, is disappointed up on the pit wall. 19 and a half minutes to go. Crossing the line now, and look at the gap as they go underneath us. That's going to be something close to three quarters of a second. Yes, it's seven tenths. Bordier can't live with this. And off for the Chetelar. Number 47, Ferrari, picked up one of the IMSA signs. Oh. And that's uh, great advertising for the series, but Antonio Fuoco will have to stop and get rid of that sign he has done at turn 10 and really, really thoughtful. That's absolutely ruined his uh, race, but he didn't leave it on the track. He just went wide, number of cars did at turn number eight. And uh, once again, the topsoil bags have been sacrificed uh, to the Shrine of Racing. Here comes the 81 car. This is a penalty for the Dragon Speed car, they're left on that pit stop to put Sebastian Montoya in the car with pit lane equipment. And the red light is on at the end of pit lane, so they can't go, now they can. Just more frustration for the team, but that was their own, that was of their own making. They had a penalty. 
pit lane light was red. Shea Adam, we also had the Corvette down at that end of pit lane. The number three car, that was looking like a good run for those guys. Yep, fuel and tires on that car. It goes back out. It'll pick up the number seven on the side of it next time around. Oh, dear. They had stealthed their way up, but they were on the wrong side of the fuel. So what was connected, still connected to the car. Pit equipment still connected. That was the call. Didn't see it from right rear puncture for the Corvette is what I'm hearing. So not the fuel that was the problem for the number three car in the rough and tumble of the restart, passively. Now that red, right, okay, that penalty, that penalty for the 81 Dragon Speed car was assessed from before the red flag went out. So that wasn't the pit stop that we just saw. That was one prior to the stoppage. And thank you to Alicia. Uh, Alicia up in uh, Charlotte for getting us that information. Thank you. And thanks to the whole team for excellent pictures again this weekend. 17 minutes on the nose. Albuquerque by eight tenths of a second for Konica Minolda Acura. Tom Blomqvist in second by six tenths to the first of the Cadillac. Sebastian Bourdais working his way back to the two Acuras. Then another second back to Alex Lynn. Half a second to Pipo Durrani, who's starting to pick up pace now in the Wheel of Engineering, number 31, the red and white car. Great battle at the head of LMP2. Scott Huffaker for PR1 Matheson, three quarters of a second ahead in the 52 wins car of Louis Delatraz for Tower Motorsport in the black and tangerine car. Then high class racing, the red and white car is another couple of seconds further back. Shera just trying to get back on terms in LMP3, Philippe Farage has laps in hand over Colin Brown, who's pulled out to one and a half seconds from Gabby Chavez. What a result for Andretti Autosport. They've been hit by everybody and hit everything, and they've had penalties. They've been in and out of the pit lane more times than enough, and they're still in a position to stand on the podium here. GDD Pro, Risi Competizione are back, and the Ferrari 488 is leading. Got Winwood Racing and Philip Ellis right on their tail, but that's not a class battle. Felipe Fraga resets the fastest lap of the race in LMP3. Marvellous stuff. Right, Felipe, he doesn't need to be driving that fast, but he is stamping authority on LMP3 at the moment. And at the front of the field, is there a second win for Tom Blomqvist? He's closed down again. The incident be between a couple of the cars in the GT battle, which... Uh, was uh, a little bit earlier on, which was Magnus Racing and Chetelar, 44-47, under review, but at the front of the field. Now, what are the fuel numbers seeing for Philippe Albuquerque? Tom Blomqvist goes to full rich. He's right there, coming out of turn number nine, and he's bringing Sebastian Bordier with him, and behind Bordier, Alex Lynn's not that far away either. The Cadillacs looking as good as they have done all weekend onto the start finish straight down the faster parts of the circuit. There is no doubt that Jeremy Shaw has picked up on something here because that Conning and Minolta Acura is quicker in a straight line, but he does have to break just a little bit earlier. Little bit of water being thrown up from the curbs by Sebastian Bordet as he's in pursuit of the two Acuras. Black and blue over the top. That's the leader. Pink and white, second position. Clear track ahead of them at the moment. Looking good. And this battle absolutely enthralling at the front of the field. Long delay, but it has been worth it. We've had just over 20 minutes as a sprint. That's what we were left with. No traffic for the leaders until the Chetilar Ferrari. That's the next car in line. He's just coming out of the into turn eight, rather, as the leaders are heading down to the braking area for turn seven. So they'll catch him in about half to three quarters of a lap. 14 minutes exactly on the clock. Uh, well, whatever happens with the contact for the number 44, they're going to have to come down the pit lane anyway because they didn't stop properly in their pit box. So that's Magnus Racing going to be dropping out of any fight that they're in at the moment. Last 13 and a half minutes. Down on the pit lane, Shea Adam and Joe Bradley. I know exactly what they're doing. They're looking at people very, very carefully to see who looks worried, who looks happy. Here's another lap completed. Another quick lap as well, 132.3. That's a 
couple of seconds away from what Philippe Albuquerque's car can do. 32-4 for Tom Blomqvist. The gap, four tenths of a second. Oli Jarvis cannot watch on the pit lane, neither can Wayne Taylor. I still think this is tight on fuel for that 10 car. Through the inner loop. Top three. Now, I'll make that the top five together now, because people, Durrani in the red and white, number 31, Cadillac, they're all pretty much extra, uh, pretty equidistant. Shea Adam, who's going to blink first at the run oh, of the flag? All Faffer up on the wall with the fuel hose in hand. They're not coming in this time, but they are prepared to see the car before the end of this race. That's the oh. second place GTD Pro Car of Mathieu Jaminet. In the number nine, that would promote Mauro Engel up to second, and Carl Kirkwood up to third for WeatherTech and Vasa Sullivan. That WeatherTech car's been there or thereabouts all the way through this race, and now the leaders are in traffic. Here's the opportunity, maybe, with a little more fuel. The leaders are almost together, there's almost a touch, and here comes Bordé. Bordé knows he's in the fight here. Philippe Albuquerque in the leading car. Oh, big cutoff for second place as the Aston Martin chopped across the nose of the number 60. Nothing they could do. Round the outside of the Turner Motorsport BMW. This is a very good run indeed for the second place car. Tom Blomqvist may have a chance into the first corner. And the leader knew that and cut across to block. Bordier's come through as well. Fourth place, Alex Lynn didn't quite clear all the traffic, and now there's a big line of GT cars. Here's the NTE Lamborghini. A lot of talk going on down in the pits for Wayne Taylor Racing for the Conic and Minolta team. They need every ounce of fuel that's still on board that car. Park Fermi conditions meant they couldn't add any, and they didn't want to lose their track position. Remember, the 60 made its stop to try and get out back in front of this car. Oh, a little break. Test for the leader there as he had to go down the inside. This is the battle for the lead in GTD that they're coming through at the moment. Down the inside into turn seven. That's a brave manoeuvre from Philippe Albuquerque. He's driving out of his skin at the moment, and so is Tom Blomqvist. It looks like a police chase through heavy morning traffic. And into the pit lane for Riley Motorsport. This is the GT, the LMP3 leader, Felipe Fraga in for a splash of fuel. He has a lap in hand, so he should be fine. He does have a lap in hand. Well remembered, Jeremy. Dial back the excitement a little bit. Side by side, is it for the lead? Not quite, into turn number 10. We've still got 10 and a half minutes to go. That's about eight laps, depending when they come to the line. And they come to the line right now. Risi Ferrari leading GT D Pro is the next car to go a lap down and Bordier's right there. All of a sudden the Cadillacs come to life and Bordier's come to play. It takes a really wide turn and goes the other side of the Risi Ferrari. Maybe trying to catch the guys ahead of them out and sneak up on them. Top three together again, separated by two or three seconds. This is quality stuff. Debris at the track on, turn, on the track at turn seven. That's the tour of the boot. Jeremy. Yeah, in GTD, the battle is just going on there, isn't it? The number 79, Carmaro Engel, that WeatherTech Mercedes, he made up a position, got past the number 14 Lexus of Carl Kirkwood at the restart, but he's now lost out both to Kirkwood and to John Edwards behind him. So uh, the Ferrari still leads in GTD Pro. Jaminet is still in second place. Kirkwood now third. Uh, Edwards fourth and Engel fifth, all in a, in a train, and in between them all is Philip Ellis in the leading GTD car. Nine minutes to go, top three together. But there just seems to be a tiny advantage on the faster parts of the circuit to the leading car, Philippe Albuquerque. What's the fuel situation? He's not been saving any fuel, has he? Slow lap last time around through traffic, but that still uses fuel. Here comes Bordet. He's got the drag down the front straight this time. And Alex Lynn is catching the leading trio as well. It will be four cars. People, durrani has got nothing for these cars ahead of them. He's not been able to close. In fact, he's dropped back two and a half seconds. But the top four are coming together now. And they should have clear traffic, clear 
clear running now for at least two or three laps. Might even, no, not quite enough, I think, to take to the end. I think they'll catch the other uh, GTD cars again before the end. The next car that they are going to catch is the number 81 LMP2 car, the Dragon Speed car. I think he's going fast enough to stay ahead of them, actually. Well, in which case, it will be the number 40 Fast MD LMP3 car that's next in line. So there aren't... There shouldn't be another knot of traffic, I don't think. I think they might uh, be able to get... It's all the, it's all the LMP3s yeah. if they're going to hit anything, yeah, Jeremy. And, and not a big knot of them, I just the odd one here and there. Yeah. That LMP3 battle, Felipe Fraga's back out and he's got a 47 second lead, so they were making sure there was no issue there. Seven and a half minutes to go, and the pressure is on at the front of the field, and it's Tom Blomqvist who's feeling it at the moment from Sebastian Baudet. Alex Lynn just not able to tag onto the back of the Cadillac ahead of him. That's the two Cadillacs run by Chip Ganassi, who are third and fourth at the minute. And with just seven minutes to go, the laps are running out for these guys. Kudos to everybody who stayed and indeed come back to the grandstands, by the way. Must have been very tempting to pack your gear and head home. Thank you for not doing that, and I bet you're pleased you have it now. This is quality stuff with the top four going through the first quarter. Leader in GTD Pro is the Ferrari, the Risi Ferrari, Daniel Serra. He with, strips uh, it out, doesn't he? Yeah, he's, he's taken about two seconds out of Phil Ellis in the Windward Racing Mercedes, but he's not fighting that car. It's two seconds further back to Mathieu Jaminet for Faf, and they're worried about fuel. That number nine car, Carl Kirkwood's another two seconds further back for Vassa Sullivan, and then six tenths back, it's John Edwards in GT, fourth in GTD Pro. And Faf desperately trying to chase these guys down. What a run it's been for Winwood Racing, by the way. They've played the strategy perfectly. We will. We will do a quick Michelin PRT, Porsche Race Tech, hashtag Michelin PRT to at IMSA Radio. Stay on the air a little bit after the checkered flag to try and wind all this up. Hearing from Shea Adam of some cars that are lifting and coasting, she's a pit out so perfectly, Shea. But, uh, position to hear the guys who were lifting off. Exactly, that was no lift whatsoever from two of our LMP3 runners. But when the GT cars come by, you hear a real difference, particularly with the Risi Ferrari leading the way. The 57 Windward Mercedes lifts well before the breaking point. And then I think I've noticed it, well, I definitely noticed it from Faf, but I think I noticed it as well from the Lexus, the 14 of Kyle Kirkwood. Doesn't seem as if the 23 Heart of Racing Aston Martin is lifting at all though. Couple of laps to go after the end of this one. And Felipe, Albuquerque, Alba Quick. Seemingly holding on to it. He's so committed into the bus stop. Loses a bit in the middle to Tom Blancfist. Now has the Corvette to negotiate. That car lifts out of it. Nice driving there. Reese is in from the lead of GT Tortona. Four and three quarter minutes to go. And the 62 car, Daniel Surrey, is in the pit lane. And he's already dropped off the podium. And Joe Bradley is there. Yeah, I'm just wondering how long this fuel holds. It can only be fuel. Let's go. Fuel holds is on now. Three, four, five. Oh, six seconds, seven seconds. And a very more. Six seconds it said on the car there. That's how long it took. Oh, they've dropped out of contention. That leaves Matthew Jaminet for Faf Motorsports in the lead, but they're on the wall with the horse as well. And Mauro Engel struggling as well. He's uh, lost several positions in the last couple of laps in column 79. Colin Brown has just set the fastest lap of the LMP3 race. He's still trying to close down the 40 seconds on Philippe Fraga, who leads it in the 74 Riley Motorsports LMP3. That's the leading car. Still cars that are on the ragged edge here. And Tom Blomqvist gets held up at the top of the S's, and here comes Borde. Blomqvist, how confident is he? Does he move across to the right? Yes, he does. That's a quick car into here, and he holds on to it, but that's allowed the lead, and all oh, the lead has been held up. This is the problem. They're catching the GT3 and the, G uh, the LMP3 and the LMP2 cars. 
And that was the Andretti car that was passed by the leader. That car in with a shout in LMP3 in a podium position at the moment for Gabby Chavez. But the top four have gone by. And again, Blomqvist is right on the rear wing with three minutes exactly to go. Watkins Glen sailing six hours from the Hagney Global Broadcast Centre around the US on Sirius 207. And Fafin from the lead, from the lead of GTT Pro and also Vasa Sullivan in. BMW back to the front. The pole sitting 25. BMW M Team RLL are back at the front of GTT Pro as they are falling. The fuel numbers don't lie. Now, what about the front of the field? This one and one more. There will be, in fact, this one and two more. It'll be white flag next time around. Five seconds for the Faf Porsche. Seven for the Porsche. There was a Mercedes in there as well. That got about seven seconds. White flag next time around. So this is real danger time for Felipe Albuquerque, but he's dealt with that little knot of traffic really well. Bordet doesn't get through. Driving penalty, aggressive driving for car 59. That's the uh, McLaren. Oh, they hit the Paul Miller racing car, I'm hearing, uh, and caused them a puncture. Crucial Motorsports then will have to go through. It's a DNF for Paul Miller Racing. 90 seconds on the clock. One more lap after this one. Through the toe of the boot. Well, Tom Blomqvist and Ollie Jarvis have been second a couple of times in a row. It's an unwanted three times in a row. Thank you, Jeremy. It's an unwanted hat trick that they've got there. They had this race really well covered before the safety car and then the subsequent red flag but Philippe Albuquerque has been unstoppable white flag is in hand and waves at the start finish line just down to our left more traffic more GT traffic Chetila Ferrari right in front oh really bad block by the Mercedes the court of Mercedes on the second place car, and that's it. Albuquerque is gone. Pulled out 20 cars lengths, and in fact, Bordet is there now. Bordet is dragging up behind the second place car, goes to the right hand side. Blomqvist trying to, to, to defend. Nose in front from the Cadillac, but can't get through because there was GT cars ahead. And that slowed the leader up again. So there's still maybe one chance for Tom Blomqvist. He's got to go all the way around the outside of the outer loop. He does so. And still the leader can't pull away. I thought that was done and done for Philippe Albuquerque. He's cleared another car. That's the Dragon Speed car. Really needs to get out the way. Does do. Well done, Sebastian Montoya. One more chance, maybe. Down at turn eight. I don't think Blanc is going to be close enough unless there's a stumble from Wayne Taylor Racing. And indeed, it's Blanc that gets held up by the McLaren. Wayne Taylor Racing rolled the dice. They must have been tight on fuel. They must have been so tight on fuel. And they've gambled. We had the Tioga Downs Casino 120 yesterday, but this was putting it all on black and blue. And they have come up trumps in the sail in six hours of the Glen for 2022. The checkered flag, the VP Racing Fuels checkered flag is waved. And they go wild down at WTR. Shea Adam is joining the party. <laughs> you know it, John. This is a happy group of people. They've won three races so far this year. LMP2 coming to the line. It's very close indeed. Here comes the dash to the line. First and second, the wins cars takes it by a car's length. Absolutely extraordinary. Shea Adam with the overall winners. Going to jump in here with Wayne Taylor because this is victory for his team once again. Wayne, congratulations. How close on fuel? Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get back to the pits. <laughs> Someone might need to go rescue Philippe. Yeah, maybe. But we, we knew we had enough just to get to the end. Everybody was thinking that we didn't, but we were playing. Congratulations, Wayne. Augusta Farfus and Conor de Philippi. Guys, when did you actually start believing this was possible? 
actually a leopard. You've not crossed the line. Oh, right, we'll just pause. Talk amongst yourselves, everybody. Whereabouts are you on track? Uh, I think sector two. Ten eight, yeah. It's oh, we're almost there. They have Hold not on. crossed the line yet. That's right, gonna we're not be... gonna hex this, are we? That's uh, another uh, another great fuel run from them to the line. The winners in LMP3 is the 74. That is the Riley car. Philippe Fraga has held off a charging Colin Brown. He's just under 40 seconds behind. And now the BMW, Phil Ellis, coming to the line. And right behind him, the GT. Uh, in fact, the, Phil Ellis, Ellis was leading John Edwards last time around. And Philip Ellis has backed off. So it is BMW in GTD Pro. And it will be Winwood in GTD. Fantastic stuff. Now you can congratulate them, Joe Bradley. Now I can. They're congratulating you. You know what? They're congratulating the, the pit wall. That's where these races are won. Guys, congratulations. Connor de Philippe and Augusta Farmers. I just want to ask the question, how close on fuel were you boys? I think we were safe. I mean, the way the race involved was not looking so, so good for us. And then, and then we didn't expect everybody to be so short. So at the end it turned good for us. Uh, we had a great car, so we led a lot, big part of the race. So congrats to the team, let's celebrate. Connor de Philippe, you guys were really strong in qualifying and obviously it proves first across the, the line, check and flag. You were very strong in the race also. Yeah, the car was great in the race. Uh, really, really happy for the RLL and BMW Motorsport crew. We did a fantastic effort today. Uh, had a couple of hiccups here and there, but in the end it all worked out in the right way. And uh, just really happy for the team that we finally got a result for them this year. Nickel Jensen winner at Watkins Glen. This is a familiar place for you to be, but LMP2, that was a close one. You had to be sweating a bit. Yeah, I was sweating the last 20 minutes. We didn't know if we could make it on fuel. Some of the cars pitted, it, uh, but we just thought we could make it. Scott did an awesome job. I mean, we didn't really have the car today, but as it cooled down, we got even faster. And uh, yeah, he did a flawless job in the traffic. And uh, it's uh, such a relief getting this one because we didn't lead at all this race. Congratulations, even better for the Michelin Endurance Cup. Thank you. Oh, what a finish, what a finish. And the championship lead, Jeremy Shaw, for the Conning and Minolta, Kadza, uh, Conning and Minolta Acura uh, with the VP racing fuel flag, the checkered flag into the, uh, into the victory circle. And that takes him to the lead in the overall championship. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah because uh, it, it, that, that, uh, that was the difference between the two of them. Uh, there's uh, now a 17-point uh, edge, it will be, in favour of number 10 over the number 60 with that win and see in second place again. Shea on her way to the LMP2 winners. Joe Bradley trying to get LMP3. We've still got to pick up uh, Winwood as well. For uh, uh, sorry, uh, LMP3 and uh, Winwood, excuse me. We've just heard from LMP2. And Philippe Albuquerque, well, he's been in a good mood all weekend. His interviews have been superb. There's bits of the car that are hanging off. He doesn't care. It's the best looking car he's seen. And they won it in the last 20 minutes. And he's got it back. And the emotion, and I'm sure the exhaustion, has taken over as well. He was in good form this morning when I talked to him at breakfast and he's continued. He's brought the bacon home, certainly as far as the result is concerned. Joe Bradley is with the GTD winners. Winwood Racing with the AMG Mercedes 57. Well, that was tense. Um, I suppose you really couldn't stop believing that until the uh, till the checkered flag. It's been a bit of a quiet one. You've kind of snuck up on everyone. Yeah, I mean, we've had the pace. I mean, you know, we... we we, we knew we, it was going to be tight and, you know, we just kind of figure how many laps are going to be remaining and, you know, the leader, the overall leader was about five seconds behind us and if he had overtaken us, we would have had that lap and we would have had the overall win in GT easy, but, um, you know, awesome to bring it home in P1. We've had such a difficult season so far and we've always had the pace, but we've never had the luck, so it, we got the luck back and, and, you know, hats off to all the guys. We got Mike, Mike, Mark. Joe, Maddie, all these, all these beautiful people came together and, and built us a new car after after we crashed at Laguna, and and you know now we're back on uh, on the top step. So it just feels amazing. It's a Winwood family, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a big family. Thanks, man. Congratulations uh, to the Ward family. I'm sure Bryce 
Uh, that's the senior member of the family, the father of the family. He will be smiling somewhere. Well done. Uh, Shea, Adam, where are you now? I'm with the LMP3 winner, well Gar done. Robinson, two years in a row. What is it about this track that just seems to work well for you guys and Riley? <laughs> Man, I just don't know. I mean, it's to be able to go, uh, I think, with this team, we are officially undefeated at uh, Watson's Glen, so we're super excited. And I think, uh, I mean, we were just hungry for it. I mean, it's been the, pa the past two races have been just grueling for us, and especially with the Le Mans, uh, the Le Mans stuff. Uh, we were all just super hungry today, and uh, I think it uh, just transferred into uh, into a result today. So we're we're super excited, and uh, it's it's good to be back on track. I think that last pit stop was that just a bit of security for you guys, since you had such a buffer. We uh, we needed to know. Or, I mean, we didn't want to have to end up in emergency service, and. Uh, we 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 knew we had the uh, had the distance to to be able to do it. So uh, sometimes it's best to stay safe and uh, and uh, finish first. So I mean it's uh, uh, yeah. So we just uh, took the safe route and I think it uh, paid off. Congrats, Gar. And I just want to dive in really quick with Kai Van Brillo because Kai, this is a new experience for you, winning here at Watkins Glen. What does it feel like? Yeah, we've had a couple of tough races. Sebring wasn't an easy one, uh, especially coming from Daytona where everything went so well. But now coming here to Watkins Glen, we uh, we had the pace from the beginning onwards and we were able to, you know, maintain the lead, have a bit of a gap and uh, work from there. It's just uh, awesome to be part of such a great yeah. team and come away with a win here in Watkins Glen. Congratulations. Thank you. This guy's unbelievable. You're unbelievable. Nah, 2022 guy. keeps on going for Ben Keating. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, yeah, I, I think we were fourth or uh, I think we were fourth going into the sixth flag. You would doubt you dropped down to sixth at we, one point. Yeah. For sure we dropped down to sixth uh, with the pit strategy that we were on. We ran for the three hour points which really got us all messed up mm -hmm. uh, and then you know hey, everybody was on a little bit different fuel strategy for the, how long they had to go to the pits uh, before they needed to come in for a splash of fuel and we weren't quite sure that we were going to make it with 35 minutes left. And every time they kept coming by saying, we're not going to go green yet. We celebrated in the pits because it meant we might be able to make it. And uh, man, Scott Huffaker just did an unbelievable job uh, uh, to stay in the front and lead. That last lap had traffic everywhere. Uh, 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 for sure, uh, I feel like we're blessed right now. Scott Huffaker is a superstar. Mikkel Jensen's a superstar, but this guy's a superstar, guys, isn't he? It's a good team. It is. <laughs> well done to those. All right, started on pole position and won the race. If you just look at the grid in the final uh, results, uh, nothing happened to lights to flag victory. Far from it there. And how close were things at the end? Roman De Angelis did not get the second place GTD car home. That stopped on the slowing down lap. So they're not even back uh, into the paddock yet. Uh, let's round up the results and then Jeremy can give us uh, some of the points. At the front of the field in DPI, Conington and Alta Acura win by eight tenths of a second from Maya Shank Racing's number 60 uh, and take the championship lead, uh, uh, continue to lead the championship uh, lead, uh, take the championship lead rather, uh, away from Watkins Glen. Best of the Cadillacs was Sebastian Bourdais in the end there with Cadillac Racing number 01. That's the... the uh, car that's run by Chip Ganassi. Scott Hofeger and the rest of the team, including Ben Keating, won for PR1 Matheson Motorsport in LMP2, ahead of the number eight Tower Motorsport uh, Orica and third racing team Netherlands, even with that tail change at the end, and despite that bumping and boring that was going on between them and High Class Racing, who were fourth and took out the number 39 uh, Lamborghini, still in uh, third position. Philippe Fraga, uh, and Riley Motorsport ahead of Core Autosport and Andretti Autosport. What a different Andretti up, down, shake and about. They did the hokey cokey and came in third position in LMP3. In GTD Pro, BMW M Team RLL uh, win it for uh, the uh, 25 team there, single car ahead of Ross Gunn in second place for Heart of Racing Team. And Daniel Surrey, even after that uh, late pit stop, because of the pit stops from Faf and Vasa Sullivan,
uh, still got back to third position after leading on the red flag restart. Philip Ellis and Winwood Racing win GTD ahead of Heart of Racing in second, so two Heart of Racing cars uh, on the respective podiums in class, and Ollie Mil Mil Milroy and the rest of Inception Racing get a podium for McLaren, which I, be I believe, Jeremy, that's the first time we've had a McLaren uh, on the GTD uh, podium, is it? Uh, yeah. Certainly a 720. We've not seen the 720 on the podium before. Park that one for the moment and give me some points, please. Where do you want to start? Uh, let's start at the top of the shop. Right, in uh, DPI, with that win, 23.99 points for number, car number 10 uh, to the 23.82 for Oliver Jarvis and Tom Blumkis in car number 60. In third position uh, on 22.39, so 160 points behind is Earl Bamber and Alex Lynn. Uh, in anything else? Nick, Nick, carry on. Just, yep. Just pause for a second because we've got a chance, I think, to speak to Ollie Jarvis. Uh, fourth, second place in a row for those guys, and it was even closer today, but still second place, Joe. Yeah, but he's not happy. You'll never be happy with second, will you, Ollie? No, not when we dominated the race like that. Um, you know, we, we were in such a commanding position before the red. Um, you know, the 10 was off strategy, but they were sort of 10 laps short on fuel, so. You know, at the race, I know if some bats been five minutes longer, they'd have had the box. Um, this one hurts. You know, we, we've topped every session and, you know, just to miss out on the win. We're going to have to regroup. We've got one next week to put it right. But, yeah, not a, not a, I don't, I'm not happy and I haven't seen Tom. I, I can't imagine he's particularly happy either. Yeah, I mean, great. From, we're in the entertainment business and that was a fantastic race. But, you know what, there's nothing else you guys could have done. You did everything right. From qualifying all week, you've been on the, on the button. Yeah, and you have to give credit to the 10, you know, don't want to take anything away from the job they did. Um, you know, Felipe got the better of us on the restart, so congrats to them. It's a one-two for Acura, but um, definitely feel like, you know, this was our one to lose, um, the way the race was going up until the red. Were you running with a little bit less downforce to give you the pace on the straight? Uh, I don't know about downforce levels, but they looked like they were definitely quicker in the straight line, so... Sorry, I mean more downforce for you guys. So whether they're trimmed out, I'm not sure, because for sure they seem to be able to get a run on us and pass us. Whereas, you know, even when they got held up in traffic, we, we didn't have the straight line speed to, to pass them. So, you know, we need to analyze that. We had the, the quicker car, um, but, you know, it's not always about the quicker car, especially in IMSA. Maybe, maybe you need one that, you know, you can overtake with. Uh, let's... Uh grab some more points from Jeremy before we go to Michelin Post Race Tech. We'll hand the PA over, PA over as well for the formalities in just a second. Jeremy? Yeah, in uh, LMP2, the number uh, eight team, I think, uh, John Ferrano will take the lead in the Drivers' uh, Season Long Championship uh, and in the uh, in the Teams' Championship, actually, no, in the Teams' Championship, number 52 will lead it. So John Ferrano leads the driver points. Number 52 team leads the team points in LMP2. Over in second place will be the number eight team. In LMP3, you stop me when uh, when you want to. In, in LMP3, the new points leader will be the number 54 team, which is uh, John Bennett and, uh, well, yeah, number 54 team, the core auto sport team will take over the lead in, in the team's championship in LMP2. 1,011 to the 959 of Riley Motorsports, the winners today that were fifth in the points, now second. Sebastian Bordier with Joe Bradley, third for the Cadillac driver today. Seb, you could see them ahead of you. They were coming towards you all that time going to the flag. Yeah, I've seen the back of that 60 car a lot today, uh, but unfortunately, nowhere past. You know, I, I got alongside a couple times, but he protected the inside, and we never really had the speed of the 10 in the straights. Uh, to clear him like like he did so from there it's kind of game over you know it's uh yeah it, it's been a frustrating day for sure at the same time we're we're quite happy to be you know having done our job uh best of the Cadillacs but you know we we keep losing points in the championship and that championship hope is kind of getting away uh, more and more so it's a shame but uh we, we're not going to give up we're just going to keep doing our thing and uh, hope for better days have you identified where the deficit is to the Acura well, there's 15 kilos in the BOP to begin with, and then, uh, and then for sure there's top speed. Like, 
even in the tour, we're really struggling to to pop out. And you you look at the ten on the sixty, you know, all of a sudden, when they get a tour, they get by. So yeah, there's and we're trimmed today. So there's not really much we can do, unfortunately. Thanks, Ed. Well, we're going to wrap up our race coverage, but stay tuned for Post Race Tech. The checkered flag was a few minutes ago. We'll restart the chat with Michelin Post Race Tech. Thank you to everybody who stayed. Thank you to everybody who made the TV so that we could see around the track, and particularly to Jeremy Shaw, Shea Adam, Joe Bradley, and our responsible adult, Eve Hewitt, as well as Tim, Will, and Curry over in London. And a big thanks to our colleagues in Charlotte, uh, led by Keith D'Alessandro and Alyssa this weekend, uh, as well as our production staff there. Stay tuned to RS2 IMSA Radio. Michelin Post Race Tech comes next.